Hello everyone and welcome to today's session on computer vision course by IntelliPad. Computer vision is the field of computer science that focuses on replicating parts of the complexity of the human vision system and enabling computers to identify and process objects in images and videos in the same way that humans do. The importance of computer vision is in the problems it can solve. It is one of the main technologies that enables the digital world to interact with the physical world. Computer vision enables self-driving cars to make sense of their surroundings. Computer vision also plays an important role in facial recognition application. In this session, you will learn all about computer vision. So let's check the agenda for the session. But before we begin with the session, please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for more updates from IntelliPath. Now let's check the agenda. So first we'll be learning about what is computer vision. Then we'll be checking out some of the applications of computer vision. Followed by we'll learn what is artificial intelligence and machine learning. After that we'll be doing a project on artificial intelligence face recognition. And at last we'll be covering artificial intelligence interview questions and answer which will help you to ace your interviews. So that's all with the agenda. Now let's start the session. So what is computer vision? The question is quite natural to appear in our mind and we have to understand what computer vision actually entails. Let's take a look at that. Computer vision is a field of computer science that deals with gaining understanding about the contents of a visual data. This visual data includes things such as images, videos, GIFs, and many more. The reason why it's called computer vision is because before computer vision, we had access to images. Our computers can understand and process the image, but the processing essentially just meant uh, converting some data into other formats. So for instance, if we had a colored image, we can convert it to a black and white image. The computer had no idea about the contents of the image, whether it contains the face of a person, a person you know, a famous personality, whether it is uh, the image of a tree, a mountain, uh, some kind of an animal, so on and so forth. So that was not very useful, mainly because this allowed us to manipulate the data that lies beneath the images, but it does not allow us to provide any contextual information about the images. So for instance, if I wanted to search for an image out of the images that I have on my phone, give me an image where there is a photo of me inside it. It could be a selfie, it could be any kind of image, but I should be present inside that image. Before computer vision, our computers, our applications were just not able to do that because they had no idea what an image contains. The part of the problem was that image data is very complicated. It may look simple on the outside, but because images are made up of several colors, several variations of colors, gradients, and they can be, um, uh, they can be manipulated in several ways, it can be really difficult to understand well what computer vision actually is. So in cases like this, when we're trying to understand what computer vision is, an important idea to understand is that our brains are much better and much more capable of understanding visual data. We do it all the time. We take a look at a mobile phone, we understand what the phone is, we can understand contextual information about the phone, that is how, how large the screen is, what's the weight, how does it look, what color of the mobile phone is there, what company, brand, so on and so forth. But uh, computers were not able to do so. With the advent of machine learning and data science, now this is very much possible. Now we can teach computers what a mobile phone looks like. And then when the mobile phone is seen in any of the images or videos, we can very easily understand what it actually means. Now that is a very narrow understanding of what computer vision is because in computer vision you might want to not just be able to do it with a mobile phone but there are several fields such as if you are trying to analyze the video of a traffic you might want to know which of the images or which of the people in the traffic or vehicles in the traffic are moving at a pace that is not suitable for them and so on and so forth. So that's what computer vision is. Basically it allows computers to understand visual data such as data contained inside an image, a video, so on and so forth. Let's take a look at why computer vision is useful. We have understood what computer vision is and what it is useful for, but let's understand why is it useful? What benefits are there? Computer vision is useful for several reasons. Let's uh, understand these reasons. I've mentioned only a few, but let's understand them one by one. First one is contextual understanding. This is by far the greatest achievement of computer vision, which is contextual understanding of images and visual data. Give you an example. If an image contains a person, 
that is or inside a vehicle uh, that is uh, in an image that a computer vision can understand and depending on how the computer vision algorithm is set up it could even understand whether the person is driving or is just a passenger that's the contextual understanding that we're talking about before this all we had to do we had to process the image on our own and then we could label it on our own but there was no way of it being understood by the computers automatically computers had no idea because they could not see the images they had no vision per se so that's why computer vision was helpful in providing contextual understanding another good information would be uh, another good use case for this would be or uh, good benefit of this would be that since contextual understanding is built using computer vision we can even use it in different areas such as security where one person might be allowed to do some things but not the other things and so on and so forth so that's what we mean by contextual understanding then comes accurate predictions before computer vision predicting which data in visual data was very tiresome very cumbersome and was not very accurate as well we got around the accuracy of 60 percent but uh, that was not really desirable so to get over that hurdle computer vision makes processing videos live streaming data images gifs so on and so forth and segregating them classifying them or making some prediction based on that data very easy and understanding the images as well becomes very easy and very very accurate so accurate that it's now feasible to be used in the real world applications which we'll see in a few minutes there's reduced costs Computer vision has significantly reduced the cost of understanding the images and its contents. That has mainly happened because computer vision applications are now viable. We can deploy these applications on several uh, several platforms, be it a low powered mobile phone, be it a high powered mainframe. Computer vision applications can run on several applications or several platforms. So the cost that we um, sort of invest in creating computer vision system uh gets paid over time because of the wide variety of platforms and the wide number of users that it can be accessed by then comes user experience there are several things that a computer vision system you can do to enhance user experiences uh, for instance a very useful uh, use case of computer vision is you have an image or you have some product in front of you that you want to get some information about now before this what you would have to do is you would have to use a, a textual interface in which you would have to type in the text depending on the image that you have now on the other hand you could, what you could do is now use your camera to point at the product that you want to buy and the computer vision system will take it over from there and will give you all the information that it can find on the internet based on the product that it has that's the real advantage of using computer vision it enhances the user experience to a level that was not possible before computer vision was a thing so computer vision can be really useful for other aspects as well but these are the four major uh, advantages of using computer vision now let's take a look at some of the use cases of computer vision uh, these use cases are just a mere list of things that can tell you what other kinds of things where you can use uh, computer vision uh, obviously you can use computer vision for other things as well more things than I have mentioned here But uh, let's take a look at the things that we have mentioned So there are several use cases for computer vision first one is image classification Image classification is by far the most primitive way or, or the most primitive um, Use case of computer vision the first thing that comes to mind when we're talking about computer vision is this primitive understanding which is where you get an image and you try to basically after getting the understanding of what it actually is what you do is you classify that image provide a label on it so for instance it could be a label based on some binary classification whether the image contains something or not or it could be a more broader aspect of classification in which we are trying to label the image with all the things that it contains for instance if it's an image of a person driving on a mountain then the labels could be person car road mountains driving vacation so on and so forth all of this is now useful and feasible using computer vision uh, then comes security systems computer visions play a major role in security systems as you can for instance put in the faces of the employees that you want uh, want to have access to a particular resource and then when the computer vision system activates any person that is not inside the database of the persons who should have access to the images 
or to the resources is not going to gain access because computer vision is able to classify the person as being authorized or not. Uh, computer vision systems also allow you to basically just log the information about who came in and who went out so the security systems can be really sophisticated as well. Video segmentation is also a really huge use case for uh, computer vision. Since we are able to derive contextual understanding of images, we can segment videos into several portions. We can uh, pick out portions. We can pick out people that are present inside the video and we can separate the videos based on what data it contains. Google uses video, video segmentation using computer vision quite a lot. So you can take a look at that as well. And then there's live streaming. Uh, computer vision systems are also now capable of uh, processing live streaming data. So for instance, if you have um, certain certain use cases in which you don't want certain images, copyrighted contacts, anything to be shown on the screen, even when you're live streaming and you don't want to do it even by mistake, there are computer vision systems that can allow you to do so. So basically your data, instead of going directly from the from your computer to the streaming service and from the streaming service to the person who should get the data. What happens is the streaming service firstly processes the data. Maybe it offloads it to some other computer vision system and that will analyze each frame of the video. See if there is anything that is worth clipping out or pixelating and that will be done automatically. It does take a lot of processing power to do so. So this could be a little costly, but that really is a use case, a valid use case for computer vision. Now, Let's take a look at some applications that use computer vision. Uh, these applications are applications that are very famous and use computer vision quite often and quite a lot. So let's take a look at these one by one and understand where they, where they use them. You may be familiar with some of those, so let's dive in. There are several applications nowadays that use uh, the um, computer vision system. Some of these are Snapchat, Amazon Go, Pinterest Lens, and Google Lens. Let's take a look at them one by one. So for Snapchat, if you have ever seen the filters that are provided by Snapchat and now uh, is a feature that is available in several applications such as uh, Facebook and Instagram as well. Well, these features are implemented using uh, computer vision. All uh, you might consider it to be an augmented reality feature. Well, that does come under computer vision. So if you are trying to understand augmented reality, uh, where you are able to put some things on inside a video that they are not there then Snapchat is a good example filters are a good example of that and computer vision is useful in that regard Then comes Amazon go Amazon go uh, is a Amazon store in which you can walk in buy something and just leave and the amount of the products that you have bought will be deducted from your payment system uh, this is a convenience store. It is uh, very popular. It's no, not a lot of branches are available there, but it makes heavy use of computer vision systems along with other systems such as cryptographically secured sensors uh, and many other kinds of things. But at the end of the day, it makes the shopping experience much easier and Amazon Go is uh, a very heavy user of computer vision systems. Then comes Pinterest Lens. Pinterest Lens is actually a very uh, important tool if you use Pinterest in which basically you can point it to any of the things that you want to be searched on Pinterest. So for instance, if I want to take a look at a recipe of a dish, what I can do is point it towards a dish. The Pinterest Lens will find all the images that look similar and then you can choose one and look at the recipe of that, uh, that image. Similarly, there are many other things that Pinterest Lens could do and that's why it's so useful and it makes heavy use of computer vision as well. Finally, there's Google Lens. Google Lens allows us to basically perform a whole variety of tasks ranging from scanning barcode, identifying products, identifying images, identifying things inside images, people inside images, make Google search, image search, all of that. And that is uh, one of the most popular use cases for computer vision. This application is by far the most popular one among the bunch that we are discussing that uses uh, Google that uses computer vision heavily. So today we are going to let's say start very slowly towards our journey of deep learning, right? This is very important for you to understand that through this batch you are going to learn deep learning and you can apply this deep learning on almost every image problem, right? Your course is focused very much on computer vision. Now, computer vision 
uh, there are let's say uh, multiple things that we are, going, we are going to learn but before learning those things we need to learn something theoretical also right now see uh, the point is that machine learning was happening in the world and everybody was very happy uh, so i'm talking about let's say some uh, 2000s right okay let me take you more back in 1980s 1980s you know this computer was very much accessible to research labs only right research labs and the big corporations they were only having these computers normal people like you and me they never had computers at their home and 1980s but there was this guy one guy in uh, canada uh, there was this one guy in canada and he was saying that uh, uh, he was saying that why cannot computers think like human why cannot computers think like human beings and why cannot they be trained to be like human so if i take a step back again right and how does a human learn so a human is born as a very small kid right and then that kid is being fed multiple things right the kid is kid goes to school uh the kid uh attends let's say multiple uh you know educational programs he uh, he or she also learns from day-to-day -day activities also right so this canadian guy right this this uh very uh intelligent and very wisdom guy he thought that why cannot i do this thing for uh, computers why cannot computers also learn if i show them multiple things again and again again and again again and again right and if i teach them like a kid why cannot they also learn so he proposed something called as uh, uh, a learning a uh, 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 let's say a human based learning he proposed something and he said that i am going to let's say uh, specifically focus on a human brain and we'll talk about what his theory was in a little bit but he proposed this theory and everybody said that you are a mad guy you are very 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 mad and this all cannot happen close this thing and the world demotivated this guy uh the world demotivated this guy this guy went back and he could not have let's say focused on these things because he was demotivated so what he could do he kept on doing his research in the background he came back in 2000s after exactly 18 19 years back he came back to the world and he proved them that see my theories are better than you and how did he prove this thing so every year there is a competition which happens every year there is a competition which happens and it is called as imagenet it is called as imagenet so what is imagenet my friends imagenet is a competition that happens every year and they have 10000 let's say uh, uh, you know uh, 10 sorry 10 sorry 10 million images for you just one second okay this explore button has gone somewhere off okay, somehow this is not showing up here okay they have updated the website but let's go let's go and check this the late the oldest one and if we can see uh the explorer here so i just wanted to show you the images they've changed this website now okay but i'll tell you what this thing is so imagenet was a competition which used to happen and they had some 10 million images that they have collected over the time and they would ask you to make a computer program make a computer program to distinguish between these images now what were these images these images were of let's say of multiple let's say uh you know multiple categories like animals birds uh like this kind of a structure was there i don't know if you can see this thing or not yeah so this kind of let's say you know categories were there and there were thousand categories thousand categories so just imagine they almost covered every animal uh, uh, mammal uh, and it is aquatic animal everything plants um, humans cars they had multiple categories over there and slowly this image net database was let's say increasing 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 today they have almost around 1400 14 million images but at that time when i'm telling you about 2000 uh 2008 and 2007 right they had some 1 million images and uh, this mad canadian guy he came so everybody was still making hand handwritten rules they were still making those handwritten rules like that if they should have two ears two nose and this then it is a cat it is a dog it is this right if they're straight and this there are tree so they were all of them were writing let's say handwritten rules right they were writing handwritten rules for these things uh, this Canadian guy, he said that, okay, I am not going to do this thing. I am going to, let's say, make a computer vision system based on deep learning. And I will show it all the images. The model will learn on itself. And then I will, let's say, show them. And that Canadian guy, he won that competition that year. And he didn't just won it 
just by a margin right humans who were making let's say uh, normal people who were making hand written let's say codes they were at almost 40 45 50 percent accuracy whereas this guy he just defeated everybody his first score if i'm not wrong was around 72 somewhere and i might be wrong with the numbers right sorry don't quote me exactly but it was somewhere there only it was somewhere there only around 70 uh, 70 72 this number was there and everybody was shocked they saw what it is so what was that this guy he used something called as deep learning into his systems and who was he he was none other than joffrey hilton our ai godfather now things started to ramp up joffrey when he presented the first thing right then uh, another canadian guy joined him and his name was Yan Lee Kun. He solved that time's greatest problem. Now, US postal code here, you know, was facing a biggest issue. What was the problem? That uh, they had to manually read every, let's say, envelope for the pin codes. And they were manually distributing this thing. So they came to these guys and they said that, see, we have a biggest problem here. And the problem is that, uh, we have to manually read these things. Can you make a computer system which can read those images and can detect what is the pin code written over these uh, envelopes? And then we can just let them move them to bucket A, B, C, D, and that. that's so we don't have to read it, right? Read it and then apply the mind and do this thing. Yan Lee Kun and his team, let's say, made that system in that year and they showed it to the world that yes, it was possible and they solved the first real world problem using deep learning. So he is known as the second godfather and then there was another canadian guy another canadian guy after joffrey uh yan it was he was called as joshua benjio here it is and he's the third person joshua joshua uh so all of them were let's say in montreal in uh, uh, university of montreal in, and they were all in this artificial intelligence lab all three of them together they started the new wave of deep learning into the market Right. So this is the origin of deep learning. Now, I told you that deep learning, the idea was earlier 1980s, right? The idea was still very 1980s. But why did things started flying up in 2000, let's say five, six or seven? Why, why, why all this thing happens so lately, right? Because to process deep learning, we require a lot of data and a lot of computation. And before let's say 2000 right we were not so capable of you know doing a lot of let's say data handling data manipulation and the data all these things so that is why in 2005 and 2006 when you know when 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 we started let's say uh, ramping up in this era of data capturing and data manipulation things started going up today you can see your normal mobile phones they have cell phones they have almost let's say uh, 16 or 32 gigabytes of ram and just imagine in 2005, um, you can hardly even imagine that phones were having, let's say, RAM, right? Forget about, let's say, oh, forget about phone also, right? Let's focus on, let's say, just laptops. I remember my, I had a, I had a Pentium, uh, Pentium one, which had what, what, 256 megabytes of RAM there at that time. So just imagine it was 19, uh, 1998 Commodore. I also had a Commodore before that. So just imagine that things were not so uh, interesting like today they are, right? Today, Google Collab is giving you a free 13 gigabytes of RAM. That time, 13 gigabyte was a dream. So yes, so all these things started happening because of this. Thing. Now let's talk about, okay. So, okay, let's now talk about what is this deep learning then Shivam. Okay, you have made a very good hype about this, all these things. We have talked about uh, Godfathers, everybody, right? But what is this deep learning and how is it associated to humans, right? For machine learning, what is machine learning? Machine learning is just a mathematical equation which is running your, uh, let's say, logics, right? Learning from the previous pattern. But what? how is deep learning different? How is deep learning different? So, see, first of all, um in our batch we are going to focus on images which i've already told you now let's talk about what is how they derived as a human part of it right so so you might have seen this kind of a structure somewhere somewhere remember this thing i'll just open up very quickly a simple diagram very good there it is 
so my friends this looks like to you what a scary animal is not uh, right don't worry it is nothing it is a part which is present in your body only right don't worry about this thing okay so i'll give you an example let's say let's say you have accidentally let's say um let's say picked up a hot water glass right and it's very hot uh it is very hot so what will happen uh the moment you'll pick up your brain will suddenly ask you to uh, throw it or let's say leave it right and you would shake your hand then and then you will curse yourself that why did you pick up right this thing all, all will happen but i'll tell you what is the behind the stories right uh behind the stories the moment you try to pick up that glass right the moment you try to pick up that glass hot glass right the receptors on your finger the receptor on your finger they have this kind of a structure which is called as a neuron and multiple neurons attached one after another multiple neurons attached one after another make a nervous system yes exactly i know some of you are very uh, like what is this uh, in my uh, uh, in my body yes yes it is inside your body and this is a, let's say one of the smallest part of your nervous system right so you might be thinking the nervous system uh, yeah exactly exactly so this is let's say what is going to happen if you let's say concatenate one neuron after another right and then after another and then after another and if you make a very long chain right this long chain is going to connect from your fingers receptor and it goes back into your mind your head right and i'm again pretty much not sure that what is this cerebellum or medulla which connects to this thing and then it connects to so i don't know which one comes first medulla or cerebellum i think cerebellum comes second so it connects to medulla and you don't need to remember all these things right i'm just telling you uh just to set the context right so this thing happens now what is happening the moment you pick up that hot glass the receptors on your finger this dendrites these dendrites they sense something they sense that mm, it's, it's very hot and they ask nucleus that nucleus should we do something the nucleus says yes, the intensity is very high please send this signal to forward right send this signal to forward now this dendrites they took one signal gave it to nucleus nucleus decides whether to send it forward or not so let's say they say yes the this is these are called as exons exons are again connected to the dendrites of another let's say uh, neuron right another neuron again this let's say the pain is going to go from let's say one uh, neuron to another and then second to third fourth fifth sixth and it goes till your brain now brain thinks there that okay yes this is very hot temperature for us and it might let's say uh, destroy the finger receptor right it might it might burn the finger also so let's uh, ask them to um, you know leave that glass leave that glass so what's going to happen now the signal is going to come back now that signal is going to come back from let's say exon to let's say dendrite of the last one then second last third last and then it's going to come to the first one this exon is going to say it, a message to the dendrite and dendrite will let's say leave that glass the finger receptors will leave that glass now i told you this thing into 2 minutes right i took this journey starting and but this really does not happen in 2 minutes it happens in less than a blink of an eye right you pick it up you throw it so that is the intensity of a basic human neuron like it looks right those of you are from biology if i have done something wrong like do let me know uh, this is what i know about the structure and this is how it is let's say framed in your neural networks also now you saw this thing what is the what is the main advantage of the system is that everything is paired one after another everything is paired one after another let me do one thing let me just copy this image into your sheets so that you will remember this thing okay so this is the neuron right and similar to this neuron structure only right uh, uh yashua uh, yan and let's say jafri and his team i'll say etl uh, all these people right they sat down and they said that we are also going to make a similar kind of a structure like this now i am pretty sure whenever you not whenever let's say you might have seen this kind of a let's say thing already correct me if you have seen this thing somewhere and then everything is again connected back to the next one this is exactly how our dendrites are also connected right every dendrite needs to connect to the next one correct 
and my friend this is nothing but this is the actual neural network also so this was the neuron that a human has and this is what is a neural network see if i show you the image this is the first one which would come obviously if i write the correct spelling so you can see here this is what a simple neural network looks like i'm going to copy this also into this uh, sheet so that we can refer it to like this is the very good advantage of using um, google collab so that you can push your images inside it also so okay this is how it looks like now does it matches with this thing with the above image i'll tell you the answer is no probably but if you think of this let's say neuron after one after another one after another one after another this is exactly what you have done here also now don't worry what is this right i'm going to tell you everything but just see there is one pattern here see one pattern here that the green is connected to every uh, what is this blue color every blue so let's name them rather than let's say calling with color let's call them 1 2 and 3 so see here my friends every circle in this column 1 is connected to every circle in column 2 and every circle in column 2 is connected to every column in circle every uh, uh, every circle in column 3 do you agree or not just a quick info guys test your knowledge of computer vision by answering this question computers process data into information by working exclusively with which of the following a multimedia b words c characters d numbers comment your answer in the comment section below subscribe to intellipad to know the right answer now let's continue with the session yes there is one missing connection it is not connected to this one and this one is not connected to this but yes very good very good <laughs> let me try to bring a newer image which one has this head have this one just one second very good so okay here you can see right here you can clearly see this is uh, every every input cell is connected to every cell in the hidden layer and every cell in the hidden layer is is connected into the output layer right i will give it a heading called as a n n artificial neural network so neural network is something that is let's say can be of a human also but when i attach a word called as artificial artificial human artificial neural network it means it is somebody which is made by a human artificial correct this is called as artificial neural network which is made by this now again i know that you are thinking what it is how is going going to solve the problems don't worry about it right don't worry about it just be with me let's talk about what does it say i'll try to replicate this thing here and then four here and then to it now the first thing that you all have to understand is that these are called as input now what was the input in your case when you picked up that hot glass of water your finger receptors right similarly for every neural network there will be a input there will be a input and obviously for every let's say input right you had a output also that you have to drop that glass similarly the decision the decision that the brain makes that whether to keep it picking it up or let's say drop it that is the output do you agree or not my friends very good and between your fingertips till your brain that made the decision there were multiple other neuron systems also right very good that is called as these are called as hidden layers now i know this terminology is going to be a little difficult for you input output i know you will understand but this hidden layer what it is right and please forgive my handwriting today because uh, i don't have my pen i just broke it <laughs> and my new is coming there uh, but yes uh, bear with my handwriting today so this is input this is output and this one is called as hidden layer right this one is called as hidden layer now we understood these are the finger receptors this output can be understood as a brain and 
the signal is going to come from input to this hidden layer and hidden layer will transfer it to the output correct so let's make a connection now now one thing to remember for everybody is that we are right now making the most basic neural network and every neuron input neuron will be connected to every cell in the hidden layer right you can call one circle as a neuron or a cell whatever you like right you can call it as a neuron also and you can call it as a cell also so okay what we have done is my friends that we have connected every input to every neuron we have uh, connected every input to every neuron in hidden layer so it means what is what what is happening when i'm connecting all the inputs to the hidden layer it means that every neuron in this hidden layer is listening to the input they are not biased right they are not biased they are listening to everybody right can i say this thing that this particular the first neuron that you have taken this first neuron that you have taken this neuron is not biased because it is not just listening to let's say just let's say one the first input it is listening to all the three inputs right or wrong right exactly that is what is happening here that it is not getting biased that is the first advantage that if somebody asks you that what is the advantage that you're connecting to everybody the advantage is that we want our neurons to be biasless they should not be biased and we want to listen everybody's let's say uh, uh, you know everybody's report right we want to listen to everybody's aspect right everybody's opinion matter to us in similar way the inputs have let's say transferred their let's say knowledge to the hidden layer now hidden layer will transfer the knowledge to the output now hidden layers are also connected to the output so now what is happening outputs are also connected to every hidden uh, to every neuron in the hidden layer so it means they are also not getting biased because they are listening to everybody right and they will make a decision right do you understand this thing or not a very simple structure that i have explained to you don't think that the deep learning uh, that i have taught the whole deep learning no just a very simple structure that i have explained it to you that how we are trying to mimic a human brain right how we are trying to mimic a human brain very good now life cycle of a machine learning or any deep learning let's say to be very specific let's say life cycle of deep learning for a second let's forget about all these let's say neuron input output and in let's forget about all these things let's just let's keep them out right let's just talk about what uh, you know how will you perform deep learning let's say deep learning is a black box magic what actually happens let's understand that magic right so my friends the first phase is called as training phase right the first phase is called as training phase what happens in training whenever you want to learn about deep learning right whenever you want to learn about deep learning just think about a small kid think about a small kid now my friends let's say that today somebody says to you that this kid knows any kind of a addition problem if you give them a additional problem like 2 plus 2 or 3 plus 3 right if they are able to answer that question how they are able to answer that question and i think everybody is focusing on one thing that they have learned this thing prior to answering something so if means if the kid is saying 2 plus 2 equal to 4 it means the kid was taught this thing before hand right he might have learned either from somewhere right from mother teacher or from the surrounding somewhere he might have learned this thing but the common thing that all of you are conveying is that that you that the kid has learned that thing right the kid has learned that thing and exactly that's true right the kid does not let's say was sleeping one night and then suddenly in the morning he might say 2 plus 2 equal to 4 no the kid has spent a lot of time in the school and that is why uh, he is saying this thing he or she is saying this thing now what do they do in the school can somebody tell me in the school i'll tell you what happened in the school what happens is uh, you know uh, there's a teacher right there's a teacher who teaches them and she the teacher right uh, she or he the teacher right they give them they show them how to solve this problem right 2 plus 2 how to do this thing right 
they'll do this um, you know if i remember like take a finger right they, they count on fingers one two three four one two three four they'll do this thing right so what is happening there are two important people in this uh, role one is the teacher who's teaching them and then second is the data right the training data that they are being used to train so they are being trained two then count two again after two so they'll say one two and then three four right so they are doing this practice right they're doing this practice or if i make let the things much more easier let's say if i if we, if we go to your uh, uh english classes right in your english classes let's say you're reading some very high um aesthetic let's say some poem there, right and or let's say you're solving a little uh, reading comprehension let's say very simple right so when you're solving it for the first time the teacher does not ask you the question no the teacher first teaches you that this is the paragraph this is uh, this is how a question can be framed from this paragraph and this is how you find the answers also right so while the teacher trains you she never or she she or he never asks you the question directly they first of all teach you with both question and answer they say see this is the question this is the answer this is the question this is the answer that is exactly what is going to happen in deep learning my friends so let's take in a very small example that example that you have to uh you know make a model uh, make a model to classify cats and dogs very let's say nature loving model that you have to make that if you give a image of a cat the model should say cat and if a, if you give a image of dog the model should say dog right this is exactly what you do while you let's say, ask your kids right you at the training uh, at, the, at the exam day you give them some questions and you ask them to tell you the answer but they don't give you the answers on the very first day no first of all you train them so that is what is that is what is going to happen exactly in the training phase also you will provide you will provide both the images and the labels image is what is the input and label is what output now i know most of you are like what i have to give input and output both to the model then what is the model doing exactly that's the question you have to give both the input and output to the model in the training phase so that the model can learn right through a dl algo i'm going to write this thing right now the model will learn the relationship between input and output do you all agree with this statement or not see i know this statement is going to be a little bit tricky for some of you who come from let's say traditional background those of written code in java or let's say in c++ they'll say that no we make a function we only give a input we never give a output but deep learning is not your traditional coding right deep learning is a learning that is being done for the computer the 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 system has to learn this relationship right it is not you and me who have to learn this relationship is the system who has to learn this relationship right so in the training phase my friends what is going to happen you have to give the images of cats and dogs and also their labels that what are they is this image a cat is this image a dog is this image a cat is this image a dog you have to give both the things of the image and the label to the model and then sorry to the algorithm and then the algorithm will train a model which will learn the relationship between input and output the next phase is called as my friends testing phase mm -hmm. the next phase is called as testing phase testing phase means see when you teach a kid right and the kid starts giving correct answer you say oh yes very good my kid has started learning this thing but you don't believe the kid right because it might happen that you might have taught him uh, him or her that let's say 2 plus 2 equal to 4 and they might have memorized this thing right they might have memorized this thing that 2 plus 2 4 now every time you ask them 2 plus 2 4 2 plus 2 4 they'll say 4 4 4 4 4, 4. so it might happen that they might have not understood the underlying concept but they might have memorized it and do you want them to memorize 2 plus 2 equal to 4 no right you want them to understand the concept of addition right 
you want them to understand the concept of addition and that is exactly what you want from your deep learning also you do not want your model just to learn these four or five let's say cat images or dog images because in the next time when it is going to be deployed at a very big website right people might give it any cat any dog so the model needs to be very generic right the model needs to be generic it cannot be just let's say saying that okay i have learned and that is why there are exams for kids also right that is why there are there are there are, there are exams for kids that's why they exist because they want to test that whether whatever we have taught you did you understand that understood that thing or not and that is what is going to happen exactly here my friends in the first phase you gave the input and output to something called as deep learning algorithm and the algorithm returned you something called as model right very good now what you are going to do in the testing phase is that you will take the same you will take some input right some input that you have and you will give it to the model now what will the model do model has learned a relationship between input and output in the first stage it has learned that if you will give me input this is the output this is for this input this is the output this is the input this is the output so when next time when you give it an input right to the model the model will return you something called as output predictive correct this is exactly what happens in exams also this is what exactly happens in exams in exams the kid is sitting there and the kid has the question paper on the question paper there is just question this time there is no answer on the question paper this time it is just question there now the kid goes back into the memory of his brain and he thinks that for this question what is the answer for this question what is the answer and then the kid writes down an answer now we don't know whether this answer is going to be correct or wrong right the kid just writes it down if you want to make a career in data science then intellipat has iit madras advanced data science and ai certification program This course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts and that is what the model has done the model does not you know think it is right or wrong the model based on its old memories based on the relationship that it has made for input and output the model thinks that for this particular input this is the output which is called as output predicted and that's it model's job is over and the kids job is also over in the examination center they go there they give right they write the answers whatever they remember and they come out kids job is done that's it now whose job is next with the answer sheet in the hand whose job is next exactly very good it's a teacher's job now to evaluate so in testing phase we evaluate now how does the teacher evaluate the teacher evaluates because the teacher knows that what is the correct answer to this input right they know what is the actual output of this thing and they will compare this actual output to the output predicted right so can we say compare output predicted versus output actual right same thing happens the teacher takes all the answer sheets and uh, the teacher would go home and they would take the copies and they would compare that yes for this que uh, this question this was the expected answer but what have you given oh that's wrong zero oh it's very good 10 right they would evaluate you on each question and that's what is going to happen in the testing phase in the testing phase we will evaluate the model on some images and for those images we already know the correct answer we on the very first hand we know what are the correct answers we're just going to ask it to the model and the model will tell us something 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 about it right now there can be two answers to this evaluation either the model has let's say given all the answers correct so you will say very good now what do you do when the kid gives all the correct answers in the examination center you promote that kid you promote that kid to the next class right and you say very good job good job done and this is exactly what we will do also we will promote the model to the next phase which is called as prediction phase right or it might also happen that the kid performs not so well 
right unfortunately the kid does not perform so well so what do we do we call the kid and we say that um, sorry kid you could not do good so this time we have to repeat this class again right you have to repeat this course again and that's what happens with the model also if in the mod in the testing phase the model appears to be very bad then we send this model back to the training phase and we say go back and learn more come back when you have learned more right in the prediction phase what happens in the prediction phase this is what is going to happen that your model is very good it has performed already very well right and now what you just do is you have to let's say deploy it to deploy it to deploy it right and what is going to happen next time you know on websites when people would come they would give it input and the model will return the output that's it so, okay you are talking about this thing right input uh, uh sorry training phase then testing phase and then prediction phase right prediction phase means that next time you can give input the model will very happily give you an output right you go on netflix and netflix uh shows you that this is the recommendations right so it is the prediction phase when you go on amazon and you buy a new phone and when the amazon says that yes it's time to buy a new let's say a uh, screen cover or let's say the cover for a phone like this uh, very fantastic avengers uh, printed let's say cover that is the prediction because the model in the background was trained some day back right some time back it was trained and now it is doing its real job to do the predictions does everybody understand my friend this is very important to understand training phase you require both input and output so it means if you are training a cat dog example you have to tell them let's see this is the cat this is the image of a cat and this is this is a cat right this is a dog you have to teach them right this is the, i think the most tricky things which people feel very uh, uncomfortable to digest that you have to give output also to the model yes to give the output to the model now let's go into real deep of one neuron now let's talk about this very interesting thing that i have for you and this is this thing. what is a one neuron architecture let's say one neuron architecture it means i am going to focus on let's say forget about everything right let's let's start from the very basic example like how things work in neurons right how do they flow right so let's try to understand this thing first of all there is a input layer and we have one neuron in this thing second we have the output layer right which will give us the output it has one let's say neuron in it and in between you have something called as hidden layer you have something called as hidden layer very simple to understand now what actually happens inside this whole you know hidden layer that is very important because how it is trying to tell that this is the output how can somebody say with just making three circles how can someone say that this is the output as cat right right hidden layer does something called as a operation right a operation and we need to understand what this operation is so first of all my friends understand that for each hidden neuron when there is a input coming the input comes with a weightage towards it comes with a weightage towards it so let's say there is a input coming called i there is a input coming called i so you will attach a weight to it you will attach a weight to it now you will say who is going to give you this weight i'll tell you and then you will attach a bias also to it who will give it to you i'll tell it to you wait don't worry so let's say when this input comes into this hidden layer hidden layer has to do two operations first of all it multiply this weight to the input and add a bias to it right remember these two terms weights and bias what is weight weight means that you have multiplied some number to the input and bias is that you have added to it i'll tell you uh, uh why they are important right but just for the time just focus on this thing that this is a and this is a multiplication my friend this is not x this is multiplication right very good and then this particular let's say Uh, processing which is happening inside this let's say which is happening inside this neuron it has to pass through something called as activation function 
very good and then it goes it becomes the output of this thing and it again goes to output right again at output there will be one weight which will be applied and there will be a bias which will be applied so can i say that w2 and let's call it as w2 and this as b2 w2 multiplied by what what is the input to to output what is the input to this uh, output neuron that is the which is coming from this hidden layer right and what is it coming from hidden layer hidden layer coming is this thing activation of w1 into i plus b1 whole bracket close two times plus b2 do you get what i am trying to do here i told you that every neuron except input every neuron except input will do one operation whenever it will receive a input whenever it will receive a input it will multiply that input by a weightage it would multiply that input by a weightage and add a extra number to it called as biased called as bias right so this is what happens this is exactly what happened here my friends what happened here the input had a input called as i i very good it went to h right h said that see i will do operation on you i said okay what is the operation multiply by weight and see this happened here multiply by weights and then addition with bias addition with bias and then it has to pass through something called as activation function which is totally fine we understand this now it says okay i have to leave you it leaves the hidden layer and it goes it starts going towards output layer output says i will do the same thing i will multiply you with the weightage and i will add a bias to you and see the same thing happens here whatever came out of the hidden layer whatever came out of the hidden layer becomes the input for output neuron multiplied by the let's say the weight 2 and the bias 2 right there are there are three terms which you will not understand right now weight bias and activation give me 5 more minutes i'll explain you but for the time mean focus here what i'm trying to say that how is the journey which looks like right and what they're trying to do it is very important important thing is that every cell needs to perform three operations first multiply the input by the weightage add a bias to it and then send it to activation function flow from input to output operation at every cell except input right what is the operation first of all multiply input by weight correct multiply input by weight second thing is what add a bias and then apply activation now i know that you don't know all the three things that's totally fine that is totally fine for now just understand that what is the journey right basically for every neuron input multiply by weight plus bias is the operation formula correct yes you are exactly correct exactly correct very good right so if i say if i say let's write down input is let's say i so what will be at the hidden layer hidden hidden neuron hidden neuron will say w1 w1 multiplied by i plus b1 bias 1 correct and then send this whole let's say thing to some thing called as activation function correct now the hidden layer will go to whom output layer output neuron output layer or neuron whatever you want to call it as because it has only one what will happen w2 multiplied by the input now what is the input for output neuron and then b2 and then activation correct okay so this is the operation which happens there right we need to check out what artificial intelligence actually is so let me give you the uh, break up of the textbook definition guys well the definition goes like this it's the theory and the development of computer systems basically uh, you know which are able to perform tasks normally which actually requires a human to do the task 
uh, it might be something as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making and translation between multiple languages as well. Well, that definition will make sense if you actually go through it twice. I mean, this is the textbook term, right? So I usually keep all the sessions very simple for all of yours from the beginners to the advanced uh, level, guys. So, you know, you can have a lot of takeaway from it if we actually, you know, go about simpli simplifying certain uh, things for you. So uh, the current goal of artificial intelligence, if I have to put it in one picture, is basically to tell you that it is just mathematics on steroids, guys. Because when you think about it, all artificial intelligence is trying to achieve is better ways and faster ways to do something that a human can do. Uh, a lot of uh, terms like machine learning, deep learning and come into the picture when we talk about mathematics as well. Because at the end of the day, to achieve artificial intelligence, we use so many concepts which involves a lot of mathematics and implementing this mathematics. Uh, using code guys and at the end of the day it's mathematics plus programming which will actually lead uh, to us achieving cognition guys so what about the future well again uh, achieving cognition has always been uh, you know the goal even of the you know even it's been the goal of the person who actually coined the term as well and pretty much every one of his followers and everyone who wants uh, to do something with artificial intelligence pretty much can tell you about how important and how amazing it would be to actually achieve cognition. Well, by cognition, I actually mean that getting a machine to replicate what a human can do exactly the way the human does or even do it better as well, guys. So uh, what do you guys think about it? What do you think, uh, you know, in the future? Uh, I mean, what do you think artificial intelligence has a grip in the future? So head to the comment section and do let me know there. So uh, then you might have uh, heard of these terms, as I mentioned, right? Machine learning, deep learning, and so much more. Well, guys, I would love to explain all of these to you guys, but we've already put out a lot of videos on our YouTube channel and we have amazing subject matter experts writing out blogs for us as well. So if you want to know more about these terms, machine learning, deep learning, or how they are used to achieve artificial intelligence in general, I suggest you head to our YouTube channel after this video and then you can go about checking our blogs as well. But hey guys, make sure you stick till the end of the video because I'll help you fast track your career. Just a quick info guys. Test your knowledge of computer vision by answering this question. A string of 8 zeros and 1s is called what? A. Megabyte B. Byte C. Kilobyte D. Gigabyte Comment your answer in the comment section below. Subscribe to IntelliPad to know the right answer. Now, let's continue with the session. To become an artificial intelligence engineer and i'll be and i'll be giving you a special coupon just for the viewers of this video guys so on that note let us quickly uh, check out the timeline of what artificial intelligence was what it is now guys let us head back to 1943 well world it was the time of world war ii guys uh, it was almost ending and pretty much this person is the reason in my opinion why world war ii ended i am a major history buff uh, uh, and, and, and I believe personally and many people agree with me, thousands of people agree with me when I say this, Mr. Alan Turing, who was a British mathematician, was the person who ended the world wars because uh, the Germans used a very nice coding system which was called as the Enigma. And, you know, they used to use that to send messages. And, well, the Allied forces never got to know what these messages were because they were all encoded and they just looked like rubbish. But Mr. Alan Turing developed the first artificial intelligence machine. He went about using a lot of mathematics, a lot of formulas. You know, it took, it took a lot of uh, days, months and years to go about cracking this amazing encoding system, which was uh, basically generated by the Germans uh, to go about sending their messages, guys. Uh, you know, there, there's also a movie on that. So if you could uh, watch that, it would be pretty nice as well. So this person alongside breaking the enigma, also uh, it was called the Turing machine basically. And then he invented something called as a Turing test. Well, what does the Turing test do? Well, I just told you three slides back that I'm gonna explain it, right? So here it comes. So basically consider this scenario that uh, you are a human and you, you obviously are humans, right? <laughs> so basically you're just sitting in front of your computer and you're asking a couple of questions to random people around you. And instead of saying it as random, let us consider two situations. One, uh, your questions are being seen by a computer and the other, your questions are seen by another human. So whenever you ask these questions, uh, if you cannot figure out the difference between the answers that the computer can give and the human can give, I mean, if the answers are equally good where you cannot, uh, you know, tell apart between the computer answer and the human answer, 
the that particular computer which answered for you has passed the Turing test, guys. So that computer is intelligent enough to uh, you know pretty much give you answers just like a human, and it can do a damn good job at it, guys. So this particular test, this sets the bar for, you know, an intelligent machine, let's say, because if a computer can fool someone into thinking that they're actually talking to another person, then we can say, uh, you know, to a certain extent that pretty much that computer has achieved enough cognition, because it is pretty much going about, you know, let's not say pretend, but it's trying really hard uh, to replicate a human and it's doing a good job at it as well, guys. So fast track to 1956, again, the term was coined there and scientists start, uh, scientists, you know, begin to tackle the concept they were like okay now the term is set let's work on it and one of the top scientists his name is mr marvin minsky uh, so basically his view along with uh, mccarthy's view got him a very good funding from the uh, then uh, american government united states government who basically hoped that you know with the help of artificial intelligence it will actually give them uh, an upper hand in the cold war which was ongoing back then guys so pretty much mr marvin minsky along with mccarthy actually got good funding from the government and they went about doing that as well guys so this uh, another important thing happened in 1956 was they basically mr uh, marvin went about starting the artificial intelligence laboratory at mit guys and this lab right from 1956 all the way till 2019 and 10 years from now has been punching out uh, amazing solutions to the world's problems and it has been the most efficient uh, laboratory in terms of artificial intelligence that the world has ever seen and uh, uh, there are very uh, you know intelligent people and uh, very much uh, uh, you know, a force uh, in, the, in these people which drive them towards achieving artificial intelligence is what I can tell you guys. And then again, a quick fast track to 1981. Well, 1981, artificial intelligence actually got commercialized. So this person called Mr. Ken Olson, uh, he's the founder of Digital Equipment Corporation, guys. So basically here, he realized that, you know what, as a business leader, we can actually, uh, you know, start making use of artificial intelligence and start selling artificial intelligence to the common folk as well. And then uh, fast track to 1997, this was one of the most important key moment in my opinion back in the 90s regarding artificial intelligence because uh, this was the first time uh, uh, there was a chess uh, tournament conducted between the grandmaster Gary Kasparov. He was a world champion multiple times in chess. Uh, he actually uh, played against IBM's Deep Blue. Deep Blue is basically their uh, then supercomputer. And then uh, it uh, Deep Blue actually defeated the world's best chess player at that point of time, guys. And uh, people were saying that, you know, IBM's Deep Blue could actually think like God because it was evaluating over 200 million moves uh, in the game of chess at once. So for every move, it could bring up 200 million combinations of how you could go about playing. How amazing is this, guys? This is still 1997. And then, uh, you know, artificial intelligence was already on the roll and people could say it could think like God. I mean, that is a huge statement. And every time I go about reading about uh, Kasparov or Deep Blue, I am amazed by the fact that this actually happened. Uh, in fact, multiple tournaments happened. You can probably read about it uh, after the video, guys. And then fast track to the 21st century. We are finally at 2002, guys. Uh, I'm sure uh, most of you might have heard of uh, Roomba. Well, Roomba is a company, uh, pretty much, you know, it's it's from iRobot. Uh, it's basically a carpet cleaner and it's, it's a vacuum cleaner, guys. So it's a robot uh, vacuum cleaner. So, you know, uh, in my opinion, again, this was another big achievement because all it took was just few layers of behavior generating systems, which basically guided this machine around your house, uh, around your living space, and it could efficiently clean carpets and floors autonomously without your help and this has been sold across the world as well it has there is 15 million units sold and i use i use pretty much roomba every day so it basically has a docking station where it comes out of its docking sta uh, station it cleans our living room it goes into the bedrooms it cleans the bedrooms and pretty much it just comes back knows where its docking station is and just goes back charges you know comes back again two times a day you can program all of these and it is an amazing thing guys it doesn't even uh, you know, sometimes it starts doing it at the middle of the night and I'm taken aback. Basically, you can set all of that. You can set the timings of which uh, your robot actually starts cleaning and all of that. But it's actually amazing to know uh, there is an autonomous system that I personally use uh, to get my uh, housekeeping uh, 
uh, stuff done, guys. So they have sold about 15 million units of these across the world, and that number is rising as well. And then coming to the maybe not so nice part of it, in a couple of people's opinion, but in my opinion, again, another amazing use of this is in war machines, guys. So many autonomous war robots were pretty much uh, deployed uh, to Iraq and Afghanistan. In fact, 2,000 uh, plus robots which are capable of war, everything from helping our soldiers carry heavy loads, diffusing bombs, which would be a threat to the life of the soldiers, patrolling enemy area, you know, till all the way till uh, they could make a stable war robot which is capable of inflicting heavy damage uh, on the on the opposition forces, guys. Well, this is good in terms where, you know, uh, our forces or any country's armies, navy or military forces are not put into immediate danger. Well, if the robot pretty much, you know, is shot dead or uh, whatever, if it's uh, malfunctioned or something, or if it's taken a lot of damage during the war, there is no human lo uh, life lost there. And that is the important thing. That is the good thing. Well, the bad part of it is if this pretty much keeps on going, then every superpower, uh, you know, every nation who's a superpower will want to go about holding these. And then, uh, uh, you know, I, I pray to God there isn't another big war coming. But if there is, then you, we will, you know, see a lot of these uh, war robots, guys. That's the uh, sad part of it. And uh, I'm sort of confident it really won't come to that. But if it does, then you can see a lot of robots there, guys. Let's just pray it doesn't come to that. Well, uh, the next important thing uh in between the robots and uh, uh, the Tesla Autopilot actually came about Google's self-driving car, guys. So I'm not sure if you guys know about Google's self-driving car. But uh, instead of just telling you what the self-driving car is, I, I just thought of telling you the Tesla Autopilot directly, guys. Here, basically, this was the biggest breakthrough in terms of artificial intelligence technologies because Tesla, as a company in the United States, uh, uh, co-founded by Mr. Elon Musk, uh, started providing cars to the public where, you know, the car could drive itself throughout. It could park itself. And all you had to do is basically sit in the car and every uh, 15 minutes or so you had to, you know, hold the steering to make sure that you're not sleeping or something. So how amazing this uh, is this. There is a there is a photo on your screen right now on the top right. If you can check it out, that is an act. That is an actual photo from the car's dashboard, guys. So it basically uh, instead of having a huge speedometer or something, it has this amazing uh, display where it shows you it detects all the cars around it. It detects rain. It detects the shortest distance. Guys, uh, you have to read about Tesla's autopilot and I'm sure many of you guys will find it fancy guys in my personal opinion if this is brought throughout the world the capabilities of uh self-driving that would be an amazing thing guys we've already seen a lot of companies actually bring out parking uh, aids and autonomous parking and it's basically called as parking help or whatever it is a lot of companies like bmw uh skoda and uh you know mercedes and all these big guys have already had autonomous parking capabilities but uh when you think about uh, you know, uh, why? when you think about uh, how it goes about in every country, I'm sure it's very different. But then when you uh, when you again contemplate about it, if this was brought to every country, it would be amazing, right? And then coming to 2019, guys, I mean, it's one more month to the end of 2019. And one amazing thing happened this year is pretty much in the field of medicine uh, with respect to artificial intelligence, guys. Well, because artificial intelligence, as we all know it, uh, has been helping the world in many different ways and it has done so in the in the in the field of medicine as well well it can be used to ameliorate uh, you know reading time for digital breast uh, tomosynthesis while maintaining or improving the accuracy of the reading well what it's basically trying to tell us uh, is that uh, you know, uh, it, artificial intelligence is basically helping us uh, to accurately uh, uh, make sure we detect uh, uh, cancer cells early on, guys. So this, again, we already know uh, the victims of cancer and we already know that it is an uncurable disease and it takes a lot of uh, time, endurance, patience and so much more to uh, go, go through with this, guys. But then if artificial intelligence can help us to check out, you know, what cells are harmful, what cells are harmless, basically, uh, you know, what cells are benign and so much more, then definitely this would help, right? Well, it has actually, the research has already been done. It has been in, implemented in many countries and, uh, you know, as a part of an artificial intelligence researcher, I am extremely proud of the fact that we've brought artificial intelligence down to the field of medicine, guys. So... On that note, uh, we need to check out what's next. We've seen all these different fields and I'm sure there are, you know, hundreds of fields that I could have put in here uh, due to the shortage of time and pretty much, uh, uh, you know, to keep it to the scope of this tutorial for all of our viewers, I had to cut it down, guys. But take a second, head to the comment section and uh, let me know what you think about the views of artificial intelligences and what are the other applications that you find amazing, guys. So on that note, we need to quickly check out what are the types of artificial intelligence, guys. If we keep diving into the depth of these, then it might actually 
big or the scope of this video. So let me quickly tell you what are the types of artificial intelligence. Well, we have three different types of artificial intelligence, guys. One is narrow AI, next is general AI, and then super AI, guys. With narrow AI, it's basically, uh, you know, it is the concept which is meant to, uh, you know, assist or take over specific tasks and do it better uh, than a human would do. Basically, an example of a narrow AI would be pretty much your uh, your mobile uh, phone assistants, right? It can be Siri, Alexa, Cortana, and so much more. So you just make your work easier instead of opening the calendar app, setting your calendar. All you do is say, hey, Siri, uh, you know, set my calendar for so and so. So that, again, is a very good example of narrow AI, guys. Coming to general AI, it's basically taking knowledge from one domain and transferring this exact knowledge into another domain. Well, general AI will... Uh, uh, you know, almost require the intelligence of a human. If it will not require more intelligence, but it'll, it, you have to match the intelligence of the machine with a human or something very, I'm sorry about that, or uh, very close to that. Well, a good example to give you about this is when you think about it, it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's usually a very advanced level of uh, Chatbots, I mean, sure, Siri, Alexa, all these are amazing chatbots. And then general AI is, again, uh, a lot of mathematics involved here as well. A very good example would be AlphaGo and so much more, guys. So AlphaGo is basically, again, another uh, computer which uh, beat uh, the world champion at this game called Go. Uh, I wouldn't say it has the uh, cognition level of a human, but uh, pretty much, even though it sounds simple on the, on the outside, it is actually very complex. And uh, even the world champion said that this is the most intelligent Go player that I've ever met in my life. So that brings us to Super AI, guys. Super AI is on another level, guys. This is, uh, I would say, artificial intelligence, mathematics, programming, all on steroids at once. Because when you think about it, uh, super AI consists of machines that are extremely smart compared to humans. They can outrun a human, outthink a human, outgun a human, and so much more. Uh, for either good or bad reasons, super uh, art, um, you know, super AI is pretty much either in good terms or in bad terms, guys. I've never seen neutral sentiment about super AI. But uh, for the scope of this video, all you need to know is that super AI is pretty, uh, pretty much the domain which consists of machines that are extremely smart uh, when you compare it to humans, guys. So, on that note, we need to quickly uh, talk about what uh, what is the cause for all of these in intelligence, guys. Okay? So, what makes artificial intelligence intelligent? Well, uh, in my personal opinion, the art of training a machine is amazing, guys. When you think about it, you can go about uh, you know, showing uh, your computer images of cats and dogs and asking it to classify it for you. I mean... Uh, from our childhood, uh, we have been practiced, we have been trained by either school or by family members or friends to know what a cat looks like and what a dog looks like, but your computer does not. It might have taken you three years to figure out the differences or one year to, let's say one year, you took one year to figure out the differences. Your computer will probably take five seconds or 10 seconds to figure out this entire thing what took you one year, guys. So when you think about it, everything from a very simple cat dog classifier all the way till achieving cognition, in my personal opinion, is just art, guys. Because at the end of the day, taking a concept which does not exist and bringing it right up to the level of a human being. And in, in, a, in a lot of people's personal opinion, human beings are the most intelligent species out there right now. Well, unless there are aliens and, you know, all the conspiracy theories. <laughs> well, uh, jokes apart, well, coming back. Uh, so, uh, you know, bringing, bringing a machine up to the level of a human is definitely achieving cognition and it's being done right, guys. So, we need to think about the challenges we face uh, when we go about making artificial intelligence intelligent, guys. Uh, there are four important points which uh, pose as challenges. One is knowledge, guys. Because again, when you think about it, when you have to train a machine to uh, figure out stuff on its own and hold these and implement it later is very difficult. This brings us to the second point. Well, holding it, if you think holding, getting your machine to hold information and to make sense of it is difficult, then think about learning because you can learn at a rapid pace, at a slow pace or whatever it is. But getting your machine to learn, getting your machine to understand about a new concept, contemplate about it, work with it, analyze it, store it and use it later is something very difficult. And this brings us to the next thing, which is problem solving. Even though you got your machine to have all the knowledge and learn very easily, it needs to go about implementing all of these uh you know in, in a perfect way guys well it can know it can have the knowledge of all the worldly things which goes by but what is the use if it cannot uh you know solve a problem because again 
all the artificial intelligence terms or whatever points towards artificial intelligence mostly is a problem right anything in the field of uh, military medicine or so much more we give uh, uh, the developers the researchers the scientists uh, a problem so that they can solve it for us easily using artificial intelligence right so if your machine cannot solve a problem then it is pretty much no good guys and this is actually very tough to achieve as well and next comes obviously cognition as i've been telling you for so many times right now because again bringing your machine up to the human level is again a very daunting task guys and in the middle of this let me give you a very quick uh, fun fact uh, i'm sure most of you guys might have heard of it already uh, artificial intelligence has been used in terms of litigation uh, 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 you know litigation and law and court and so much more as well how well i'm sure you guys have heard of jp morgan right they are the banking giants of the world and they ca they came up with an artificial intelligence model which basically uh, you know uh, was used to go through and analyze some legal documents you wouldn't believe the numbers and the first time i read this a couple of months ago i was taken aback guys because when you think about it it reduced the workload from 360000 man hours to a matter of seconds think about it 360000 hours of job what uh, you know this is what it takes a human to do it but as soon as they implemented that model it just took the model a couple of seconds to do it and uh, i have read that the model is very accurate as well so when you think about it think about the odds 360000 hours and a couple of seconds so uh, 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 you know if you didn't know this fact then i hope you find this very entertaining and i hope you guys uh, feel very interested about this fact at the same time because we already know artificial intelligence is being used in every field but not many of us know how it was actually used in litigation right so i just uh, found it very interesting to tell you guys about that and this brings us to the dark side of artificial intelligence well is there a dark side well uh, you remember elon musk right the founder of tesla the founder of spacex the founder of solar city and so much more he's basically a billionaire entrepreneur guys well he says that Uh, you know at least when there's an evil dictator uh, uh, that human is going to die but for an artificial intelligence being there will be no death it will live forever and you will have an immortal dictator from uh, which you know you can never escape so i am sure our views on this particular topic uh, you know we can debate about it all day all night and we're going to have very different opinions about this and we need to respect uh uh people with very different opinions about this because at the end of the day all of these uh what we look at as different opinions actually come under one umbrella and it helps develop artificial intelligence in the right way guys so uh i hope there is a good uh you know i am in, in fact i am sure that there is a good way and a good path for the development of artificial intelligence but you can you can never know at any point of time well according to a lot of experts that it might take a turn for the bad as well again let's hope uh, uh that it doesn't go there and on that note we'll quickly bust a couple of uh, myths and facts guys so the myth is that uh, super intelligence by the year 2100 will be inevitable well when you think about it it might happen right now it might happen in a decade in a couple of years from now or it might never happen at all to achieve super intelligence again as we've been talking is a very 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 challenging task guys and the myth is that you know only uh, people who do not know about luddites are basically people who are not very well informed uh, that only these people are worried about worried about artificial intelligence and all of its bad things for the future well not exactly because even many top artificial intelligence researchers are concerned about how it's going to go about in a good way or in a bad way as well guys another myth is that artificial intelligence is turning evil it is turning conscious and so much more well the actual worry that we need to go about doing is you know artificial intelligence actually turning to be very competent with a goal that would be misaligned with our particular goal so it might take a very staunch deviation from what we set it out to be and it could do something on its own so that is the actual worry when you compare to the myth and then to bust another couple of uh, myths uh, people say that robots are being the main concern you know like those terminator movies and what not well again here as well miss uh, misaligned intelligence is again the main concern because uh, Uh, we live in a world of technology in every device every home i'm sure most of the world is connected through an internet connection right so you will not need an actual robot in case if something goes wrong as well so that is something to think about and then artificial intelligence cannot control humans is a myth well intelligence actually enables control so you know uh, we do this very sad thing where we trap animals in cages and uh, create zoos around them i mean i am not much of a zoo fan i uh, 
i hope i do not offend anyone regarding that so you know we are smarter than tigers and all of these pla- uh, other uh, uh, animals so we can go about controlling them because we are smarter now think about a machine which is smarter than humans it can go about controlling us as well right so that is a fact to think about again so a uh, machine cannot have goals well 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 this is wrong because again let us say uh, two planes are fighting uh, uh, in the air it's called as a dog fight so two planes are fighting and one the the plane behind just launched a missile if you have seen in a lot of movies that i'm sure you would have this missile exactly knows where the plane is and to go hit it this basically works on the concept of heat seeking well uh, it has detectors in the front of the missile which will find the hottest thing it can see and then just go hit it so the hottest thing in a plane is uh, uh, you know in the plane which is in front is its engines so this will basically chase the plane's engines and hit the engines so that is a heat seeking missile for you and then uh, the next mythical worry is that super intelligence is just yours away well not really it is a couple of decades away as i pretty much told you but again it might take way longer than two decades three decades four decades and so much more to uh, you know just to make it safe for us to use as well guys so that is all uh, with the dark side concepts that i had to just inform you guys in case you weren't knowing so this brings us to the next concept which is basically the domains in which artificial intelligence has its hold guys again number 1 as i've been saying for a long time is healthcare guys that is the best thing that i've seen artificial intelligence being put to and there are so many things live as well so it has been so subtly integrated into your lives that you would not even know it is there when you think about it uh you know uh probably you just open a health app uh, health app installed on your mobile phones or your computers you'll be talking to a chatbot instead of a human and you wouldn't know it most of the time you can just set an appointment with your doctor and ask more information about your appointments and so much more by just talking to a machine instead of talking to a human on the other side guys and from that till helping detection and curing of uh, cancer is again an amazing thing in my opinion and the second thing is stock trading guys as an investor personally i could sort of relate on this as well because if you know stock trading again is an again a very tipsy turvy world right so sometimes you lose money sometimes you make a lot of money but if you had a, a way if you had a different approach if you had a more intelligent being to look at graphs to look at data and to make better sense of it than an expert trader then that would be an amazing thing because you could end up making more money and losing less money at the same time right so this brings us to another next thing is sales guys well this is uh this is a personal recommendation from me because here at intellipath let me tell you how we implement machine learning and artificial intelligence for our sales team guys so we get about 10000 or 15000 leads sales leads every single day imagine calling those 10 15000 people guys so it would be a daunting task to go about doing it but we have a machine learning model which is in place which basically helps filter out these people uh, you know categorize them and uh, uh, make them make sure it, it basically makes sure that uh, they get in touch with our course advisors and then later our course advisors basically help them get the course that they were actually looking for guys so this makes the entire process of going uh, through the uh, part of sales a uh, very interesting a uh, very simple and we get lot of analytics from that as well guys so this is us at intelli path using artificial intelligence to help out you learners as well guys just a quick info guys test your knowledge of ai by answering this question what is artificial intelligence a putting your intelligence into computer b programming with your own intelligence c making a machine intelligent d putting more memory into computer Comment down your answers in the comment section below. Whoever gets the correct answers will win 5000 points in Intellipad wallet. Subscribe to Intellipad to know the winners. Now, let's continue with the session. Now, let's actually get a bit deeper and understand what is intelligence. So, intelligence can be defined as one's capacity for understanding, one's capacity for self-awareness, one's capacity for learning, and one's capacity for problem solving. That is how well is something or someone able to understand how well is someone able to learn new things and how well is someone able to solve problems by themselves so now that we know what is intelligence let's understand what is artificial intelligence so when you apply the same intelligence to machines this is known as artificial intelligence let us imagine there's a machine 
which can understand things which are normally understood by human. There is a machine which is self-aware and there is a machine which can solve problems by itself. Now that's just amazing, isn't it? Right. So this is the artificial intelligence which I'm talking about. So now, so now that we also know what is intelligence, I'll ask another question. So tell me what is it that makes humans intelligent? Well, we as humans can reason, we as humans can learn, we can perceive, we can solve problems and we also have linguistic intelligence. That is, we can figure out what is someone else saying. And we can also understand the grammatical intricacies of different languages. So again, my question would be, what if a machine could exhibit all of these factors normally shown by a human? Again, that's just amazing, isn't it? So this is what is known as artificial intelligence. So a machine which can show traits normally shown by a human, that is known as artificial intelligence. So now that we've also understood the difference between artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning, let's see different examples of machine learning around us. So most of you would have shopped on Amazon. Now, when you go into Amazon, you see that there are some products recommended to you. Now, how do you think that would happen? So this is something known as recommendation engine. And recommendation engine is nothing but a component of machine learning. So let's say you and your friend buy similar products. So your friend buys five products and you buy three products. Now, out of those, whatever three products you buy are same as what your friend buys. So let's say the common products are an iPhone, a back cover for the iPhone and a Bluetooth headset. Now let's say the other two products bought by your friend would be a MacBook and a mouse. Now since there are three products which are same between you two, this is why the products which your friend has also bought, those are the products which will be recommended to you. So on the basis of the commonality between you and your friend, you will be recommended a MacBook and a mouse as well. So this is nothing but a concept of machine learning. And then we have Amazon Alexa. So Amazon Alexa is so Amazon Alexa is a really good example of speech recognition. You know, when you say Alexa, turn on the lights, it'll turn on the lights. When you say Alexa, book a ride for me, it'll do exactly that. When you say Alexa, order a cheese pizza, and that is exactly what Amazon Alexa will do. Now Alexa is just a machine, right? But when you say do something, order a pizza, book a cab for me, turn on the lights, you know, how is the machine able to understand all of this? So the idea behind this is speech recognition and that is again a component of machine learning. And then we have Netflix's movie recommendation. So let's say you watch two TV series. First TV series is Friends and the next TV series is Big Bang Theory. And if you want to make a career in data science, then IntelliPath has IIT Madras Advanced Data Science and AI Certification Program. This course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts. Since you watch these two TV series which belong to the genre comedy, that is why maybe you will be recommended How I Met Your Mother or you can be recommended Silicon Valley or some other TV series belonging to the comedy genre. So this again is machine learning. And then we also have Google traffic prediction. Let's just say you're traveling in your car and there is huge traffic there. You op and you desperately want to get out of the traffic. So you turn on Google Maps and Google Maps tells you the best direction from where the traffic would be the least. Just a quick info guys. Test your knowledge of computer vision by answering this question. Computers process data into information by working exclusively with which of the following? A. Multimedia B. Words C. Characters D. Numbers Comment your answer in the comment section below. Subscribe to IntelliPad to know the right answer. Now, let's continue with the session. Now, how does Google Maps do this? 
This again is machine learning. Now let's look at the subcategories of machine learning. So we have supervised learning, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. So in supervised learning, you can consider that the learning is guided by a teacher. So we have a data set which actually acts as a teacher and its role is to train the model or the machine. So once the model gets trained, it can start making a prediction or decision when new data is given to it. So let's take this example. So over here, we are training this machine by giving it samples of data. So over here, the data is nothing but different images of Apple. And along with each image of Apple, we are also giving it the label of the image, right? So this image goes with its label, which is Apple. Again, this image goes with its label, which is Apple. Again, the same with these two, right? So we are teaching this machine that whenever it sees an image, something like this, it is nothing but an Apple. And after time, when we give it a new data from whatever learning it has done, it will predict whether it's an Apple or not. So on the basis of its learning, this machine predicts that there is a good possibility. There is actually 97% possibility that the image which has been fed to the machine is nothing but an apple. So a use case of a supervised learning could be spam classifier. So spam classifier basically means that whether the email which we get, it's a spam or not. And that is done on the basis of different textual parameters. So let's say a genuine email wouldn't contain too many exclamation marks. It wouldn't contain a catchy headline and so on. But on the other hand, if it's a spam email, maybe it will contain a lot of exclamation marks with maybe a lot of numbers and it'll have statements like, hey, congrats, you've won a lottery or hey, could you help me out? So this spam classification is basically an example of supervised learning. Then we have unsupervised learning. So in unsupervised learning, the model learns through observation and finds structures in the data. So once the model is given a data set, it automatically finds patterns and relationships in the data set by creating clusters in it. So what it cannot do is add labels to the cluster. Like it cannot say this is a group of apples or mangoes, but it will separate all the apples from mangoes. So over here, we have this set of images. Now, this unsupervised learning model, which is applied on this, it will segregate these fruits on the basis of similar characteristics. So over here, we have segregated these four into one cluster, these three into second cluster, and these three into the third cluster. Now, even though the unsupervised learning does not have any labels, it has still segregated these three into three clusters, right? So the machine over here does not know that these are apples or these are oranges or these are bananas. Yet it has segregated these three on the basis of similarity of characteristics. So it found out that these four objects are similar to each other. And there is quite a bit of variability when it comes to these four objects and these three objects. Similarly, this machine was able to figure out that these three objects, they are quite similar to each other. But when compared with these three objects, they are very dissimilar. So this is the underlying concept of unsupervised learning. And a good example of unsupervised learning would be again Netflix movie recommendation. So over here, the movies are segregated on the basis of different genres. So over here, TV series like Friends, How I Met Your Mother and Silicon Valley are clustered into one group because those come into the same category. Similarly, movies such as Secret Superstar and Dangal could come under the same category because they have the same lead actors. So over here, we are segregating the movies on the basis of similar characteristics even though there are no labels in it. And it's finally time for the third machine learning type, which is reinforcement learning. So over here, there is an agent and there is an environment. And the agent interacts with the environment 
and finds out what is the best outcome for it. So it basically follows the concept of hit and trial method. The agent is rewarded or penalized with a point for a correct or a wrong answer. And on the basis of positive reward points gained, the model trains itself. So let's take this example. So over here, this self-driving car would be our agent and the road is the environment. And this car is interacting with this environment. So it will observe the environment and it has two choices over here. So either to go straight or turn right. Now, let's say this agent or the self-driving car decides to go straight. Then what happens is it goes and bangs straight into this barricade. So then it realizes that the action taken by it was not in its best interest. And that is why it is penalized. So since it is penalized, it realizes that the action taken by it was wrong. And that is why from the next time onwards, it will do the opposite action. So instead of going straight, it will take the right turn. And when it takes the right turn, it realizes that the road is correct and the agent is rewarded. So this is how reinforcement learning basically works. So the agent interacts with the environment, it takes an action and if the action turns out to be incorrect, it is penalized and if the action turns out to be correct, it is rewarded. So this cycle goes on and on till it completely learns its environment properly. And the best use case of reinforcement learning is again self-driving car. So companies such as Tesla and Google are working on these self-driving cars. So just to sum it off, these are the three different types of machine learning algorithms. So we have supervised, unsupervised and reinforcement machine learning. So under supervised, we have regression and classification. And in unsupervised, we have clustering techniques, association analysis and hidden Marco model. And then the third is obviously reinforcement learning, which works on trial and error method. And if you want to do some really cool machine learning projects, you can check the sites out. Now let's look at some limitations of machine learning. So when it comes to machine learning algorithms, they would require massive stores of training data. So again, as I've told you, machine learning is totally based on the data which it has. So if you have more amount of data only then it will be able to give correct accuracy. So let's say you take in very small amount of data and there's a good possibility that the results which you're getting are very biased or very incorrect. And also error diagnosis is quite difficult when it comes to machine learning because again the amount of data is very huge and wherever there's a mistake you'd have to go through the entire algorithm which you've written and then find out that particular mistake by yourself, which is very difficult. And also when it comes to machine learning algorithms, they're not really that creative. So these ML algorithms are built only for one specific purpose. So let's say I'll build a machine learning model which will predict whether it will drain or not today. Now, if I want to use the same model to predict the stock prices, that will not work, right? So basically one model is built only for one particular task. So this is the lack of creativity that I'm talking about when it comes to machine learning. And also there are a lot of time constraints as the model has to learn through a lot of historical data. So that was everything about machine learning. Now let's start off with deep learning. So Deep learning is a subset of machine learning where it learns through data representations as opposed to task specific algorithms. So we saw that the drawback in machine learning models was that the models are specific to only one particular task. But this is not the case with deep learning models as these deep learning models are based on the data representations. And these deep learning models are mostly built with something known as deep neural networks. So this is how a deep neural network looks like. So these deep neural networks completely learn the data which is fed to it. So this is the data. So let's say if this image of woman is fed as the data to the deep learning model, then 
it will completely extract all the features of this data by itself. Again, the difference between ML and deep learning over here is that the extraction, the feature extraction in machine learning is manual. But when it comes to deep learning, the feature extraction is automatic. So the deep learning model automatically extracts all of the features associated with that image. And when new images are fed to it, it automatically is able to tell whether the image is same to this or not. So this over here, we have a graph which tells us how does performance vary with respect to the amount of data. So what happens in machine learning is that as we keep on increasing the data, the performance increases only up to a particular threshold. After that, if we increase any more data, there is no increase in performance. So this is another problem when it comes to machine learning. But on the other hand, when it comes to deep learning, the more amount of data you give it, the better will be its performance. And that again is because deep learning is based on learning data interpretation. So the more data you give it, it will automatically learn all those features of the data by itself and it will be keep on increasing its performance gradually. Now let's look at some applications of deep learning. So speech recognition is one application of deep learning. Now you need to understand that you cannot build speech recognition applications with machine learning. So this is where machine learning fails and deep learning comes in and helps you to build speech recognition applications. Also another application of deep learning is self-driving cars. So we see over here that the person is just sitting. He is not even touching the steering wheel and the car is driving by itself. So just an amazing application of deep learning. And then we have language translation over here. So this again is a part of deep learning. So over here we are typing something in Spanish and it is being automatically converted into English. So we also have visual translation over here. So over here this text or this board is in some random language and this app over here which uses deep learning automatically converts this visual into English. So those were some applications of deep learning. Now let's actually understand how does deep learning work. So most deep learning methods use neural network architectures and that is why deep learning models are often referred to as deep neural networks. So a deep neural network basically has these three models, an input layer, the hidden layers and the output layer. And the term deep usually refers to the number of hidden layers in the neural network. So traditionally neural networks only contain two to three hidden layers while deep networks can have as many as 150 hidden layers. Now that's a very huge amount, isn't it? So deep learning models are trained by using large sets of label data and neural network architectures that learn features directly from the data without the need for manual feature extraction. So all of the input data is given to this input layer and this input layer automatically extracts the features by itself. Now that data is sent to this hidden layer which performs all sorts of processing tasks and then the final result is given out through the output layer. So now let's also understand what exactly is a neural network. So a neural network is a computing model whose layered structure resembles the network structure of neurons in the brain with layers of connected nodes. So it can learn from data, which can be trained to recognize patterns, classify data and forecast future events. So the neural network is based on the biological neural network of our brain. So that is why it is given the name neural network. So the layers are interconnected where nodes or neurons with each layer using the output of the previous layer as its input. So its main function is to receive a set of inputs, perform calculations, and then use the output to solve the problem. Now, as I've already said, these artificial neural networks are based on something known as a biological neural network. So our biological neural network has dendrites, cell body, 
and axon. So dendrites are where the input is taken, cell body is where the processing is done and axon is where the message is transferred to other neurons. And the same thing happens in artificial neural network as well. So first we give in the data, that data is processed and then the final processed result is given out as the output. So over here, let's say we train the data with images of cat and the labels would be either cat or not cat. After that, we give in a new image of a cat and then we basically try to predict whether the model correctly classifies this as cat or not cat. And since the model has learned the data properly, it correctly classifies this image as cat. Now there are many ways of knitting the nodes of a neural network together. And each way results in a more or less complex behavior. Possibly the simplest of all topologies is the feedforward network. So when feedforward neural network signals flow in one direction without any loop in the signal paths. And typically artificial neural networks have a layered structure. The input layer picks up the input signals and passes them on to the next layer known as the hidden layer. And there can be more than one hidden layer in a neural network. And at last comes the output layer that delivers the result. Now, the first question to pop into your head would be, what is the inspiration behind these artificial neural networks? Well, the answer to that is the biological neural network of our brain. So let us first understand the architecture of our biological neuron. So as you can see in the slide, our biological neuron has these three main components. So we have the dendrite, the cell body and the axon. These dendrites receive the signals and the cell body processes these signals at the weights and the bias that are randomly selected. So here we have W1, W2, W3 going on till WN as weights. So we multiply these weights with the corresponding inputs and add all the values together. And finally, we add bias to that sum. So this final sum is passed through an activation function, which finally gives us the output. So let us see this in detail. So here we have our three arrows, which correspond to the three inputs coming into the network. Now for these three inputs, we have corresponding weights associated with them. So input one is associated with a weight of 0 0.7, input two is associated with a weight of 0 0.6, and input three is associated with a weight of 1.4. Now, these inputs are multiplied with their respective weights and their sum is taken. So if the three inputs are x1, x2 and x3, the sum would be x1 into 0 0.7 plus x2 into 0 0.6 plus x3 into 1.4. And to the sum, we add an offset which is called as bias. So this bias is just a constant which is used for scaling purpose. Now let us understand the concept behind these weights. So these weights basically determine the relative importance of the inputs. So let's say we have two inputs, humidity and wearing a blue shirt. So here we can see that wearing a blue shirt has almost no correlation with the possibility of rainfall. So that is why the weight assigned to input x2 would be low in order to bring down its importance. Now let us see why do we need activation functions. So consider this scenario where you have two different classes. One class is represented with triangles and the other class is represented with circles. Now let's say I ask you guys to draw a linear decision boundary which can separate these two classes. So is that really possible? Can we draw a linear line which can segregate these two classes? Well the answer is obviously no, isn't it? So let me tell you guys how can we do this. So we'll have to add a third dimension to create a linearly separable model which is easy to deal with. So the logic is when you're going from 2D to 3D, you're making your equation non-linear. So with the third dimension, I have introduced non-linearity in our data, which helps in creating a linearly separable model. And in real world situations, you don't always get linear problems. So you should know how to deal with non-linear problems as well. And this is where activation functions help us to convert the linear equation to non-linear form. 
So these activation functions bring in non-linear functional mappings between the input and the response variable. Their main purpose is to convert an input signal of a node in an artificial neural network to an output signal. And if we do not apply an activation function, then the output signal would just be a simple linear function. Then we have the leaky ReLU, which is just a modified version of ReLU. So the leaky ReLU, instead of just completely removing the negative part, it just lowers the magnitude. And finally, we have the softmax function, which is ideally used in the output layer for classification problems. So the softmax function basically gives a set of probability values for each class of the output. And that particular class, which would have the maximum probability, will be our output class. So uh, that was all about activation functions. Now let us learn more about perceptrons. So like we were taught how to behave in certain conditions, perceptrons also require training. So they have a learning algorithm through which they produce the output. By training a perceptron, we try to find a line, plane or some hyperplane which can accurately separate these two classes by adjusting the weights and biases. So uh, consider this image where we give the dogs and horses as input. So here after the first iteration, error value is 2 since the horse has been classified as dog and there is one dog which is placed in the horse's class. And in the second iteration, the error value is reduced to 1 as it is just the dog which is classified as a horse. And finally in the third iteration, we get the correct output as the perceptron has been trained well with no error. So all the dogs have been placed in one class and all the horses have been placed in one class. Now let's understand the perceptron training algorithm. So this perceptron over here receives multiple inputs and each input is initialized with a random weight. So after these we multiply these weights with their corresponding inputs and then we get the sum. Now this input is passed through the activation function which would give us a non-linear output. So this process until here is known as feed forwarding. Now if the output which we get is not optimum, we calculate the error in prediction and then go back and then update the weights and bias. So this process where we go from output to the input layer is known as backpropagation. And we keep on backpropagating until we get the desired output. So uh, that was the perceptron training algorithm. Now let's have a look at the benefits of using artificial neural networks. So the artificial neural networks can learn organically. This means an artificial neural network's outputs aren't limited entirely by inputs and results given to them initially by an expert system. So artificial neural networks have the ability to generalize their inputs. This ability is valuable for robotics and pattern recognition systems. Artificial neural networks also help in non-linear data processing. So non-linear systems have the capability of finding shortcuts to reach computationally expensive solutions. These systems can also infer connections between data points rather than waiting for records in a data source to be explicitly linked. This non-linear shortcut mechanism is fed into artificial neural networking which makes it valuable in commercial big data analysis. Artificial neural networks also have high potential for fault tolerance. When these networks are scaled across multiple machines and multiple servers, they are able to route around missing data or servers and nodes that can't communicate. And these artificial neural networks can also self-repair themselves. So if they are asked to find out specific data that is no longer communicating, these artificial neural networks can regenerate large amounts of data by inference and help in determining the node that is not working. This trait is useful for networks that require informing their users about the current state of the network and effectively results in a self-debugging and diagnosing network. Now to implement these artificial neural networks, you would need the help of a deep learning framework. So the first question to pop into your head would be, what are the different deep learning frameworks available? So today we'll cover just that. So let's start with TensorFlow. 
So TensorFlow is arguably one of the best deep learning frameworks that we have today. It is an open source software library developed by the researchers and engineers from the Google Brain team for high performance numerical computation. One well known use case of TensorFlow is Google Translate. So Google Translate is coupled with capabilities such as natural language processing, text classification, forecasting and tagging. So TensorFlow basically comes with two tools, TensorBoard and TensorFlow Serving. So building massive deep neural networks could be complex and confusing. This is where we can use TensorBoard to visualize our TensorFlow graph and plot quantitative metrics. And then we have TensorFlow Serving, which is a flexible, high performance serving system and can be used for rapid deployment of new algorithms while retaining the same server architecture and APIs. So now let's look at the next deep learning framework, which is Keras. So Keras is actually a high level API, which can run on top of other deep learning libraries such as TensorFlow, Theano or CNTK. And with the help of Keras, we can implement both convolutional neural networks as well as recurrent neural networks. And the best thing about Keras is model building is extremely easy. It's like stacking layers on top of each other. So next we have PyTorch which is a scientific computing framework developed by Facebook. So we can get from the name itself that PyTorch is Pythonic in nature. That is, it can leverage all the services and functionalities offered by the Python environment and also smoothly integrates with the Python data science stack. Another great feature of PyTorch is that it offers dynamic computational graphs which can be changed during runtime. This is highly useful when we have no idea how much memory will be required for creating a neural network model. And the next deep learning framework is DL4j. So unlike deep learning frameworks which we saw till now, which were all based on Python, Deep Learning 4j is a deep learning programming library which is written for Java and the Java virtual machine. And the biggest advantage of DL4j is, it includes inbuilt integration with Apache Hadoop and Spark. Just a quick info guys. Test your knowledge of computer vision by answering this question. A string of 8 zeros and 1s is called what? A. Megabyte B. Byte C. Kilobyte D. Gigabyte Comment your answer in the comment section below. Subscribe to IntelliPad to know the right answer. Now, let's continue with the session. So it helps in getting state-of-the-art results on image recognition tasks. So it shows matchless potential for image recognition, fraud detection, text mining, parts of speech tagging and also natural language processing. And finally, we have MXNet. So MXNet is a deep learning framework developed by Apache Software Foundation specifically for the purpose of high efficiency, productivity and flexibility. And the beauty of MXNet is that it gives users the ability to code in a variety of programming languages such as Python, R, Julia, and Scala. This means that you can train your deep learning models with whichever language you're comfortable in without having to learn something new from scratch. And this deep learning framework is known for its capabilities in imaging, speech recognition, forecasting, and NLP. So when you hear the term TensorFlow, the first question to pop into your head would be, what exactly is a tensor? So in TensorFlow, data is represented in the form of tensors. Simply put, a tensor is a multi-dimensional array in which data is stored. So you can consider these tensors to be the building blocks in TensorFlow. Now, these very tensors are given as the input to the neural network. So as I've said, a tensor is nothing but an n-dimensional array. So the number of dimensions used to represent the data is known as its rank. So if a tensor has just one element, in other words, if it has just magnitude and no direction, then its rank will be zero. If a tensor has magnitude and direction in one plane, then its rank will be one. Similarly, if a tensor has magnitude and direction in two planes, then its rank will be two. And this goes on higher up the order. Now, TensorFlow as the name states is a combination of two words, tensor and flow. Here, the data is stored in tensors, but the execution is done in the form of a graph. So this is not like your traditional programming where you just write a bunch of lines and everything gets executed in sequence. So first, 
you'd have to prepare this computational graph and then this computational graph is executed inside something known as a session. Now in this computational graph, all the mathematical operations are depicted inside the nodes and all the tensors are represented on the edges. So the entire computation process is done in two stages. In the first step, the code is depicted onto the computational graph and in the second step, a new session environment is started and the graph is executed inside this session. So uh, that was all about the computational graph. Now let's look at the program elements in TensorFlow. So we have three program elements, constant, placeholder and variable. So uh, let's start with constants. So constants are program elements whose value does not change or in other words, the value is fixed. So uh, let's head on to Jupyter Notebook and work with these constants. Right, so my first task would be to import the TensorFlow framework. So I'll type import TensorFlow as TF. I'll click run. So let me just wait till uh, the import is done. Right, so we have successfully imported the TensorFlow framework. Now, uh, as I've said, let's go ahead and start working with the constants. So let me just type in constants over here. So I'll create the first constant and uh, name this constant as con1. Now this is how we can create constants in TensorFlow. So I will use this TF and then put in a dot and then type in constant. Now inside this, I will give the value of the constant. So let's say the value is 10. So this is an integer type constant. Now similarly, I'll also create a floating type constant and I'll uh, store this in con2. So I'll type tf dot constant and uh, the floating value would be 3.14. Now after this, I'll uh, create a string type constant. So again, this would be tf dot constant and the string which I'd be giving would be this is Spara. And finally, we have a Boolean type constant. And I'll store this in con4. So this will be tf dot constant. And uh, let's say the value is false. Now I'll uh, run. Now let me print all of these values. So I'll use the print function. And then I'll go ahead and print all of these values con3, con4. Right. So we see that this first constant is a tensor of type integer. The second constant is a tensor of type float. This third constant is a tensor of type string. And this fourth constant is a tensor of type boolean. Now we see that we only have the data types of all of these tensors, but we don't have their values. This is because as I've already told you guys, we have to create a computational graph and then execute that computational graph inside a session. But till now we have not started our session. So let's go ahead and start a session first. So uh, I'll type ses equals tf dot session and I'll hit run. Now I will run all of these inside this session. So I will type ses dot run and let me go ahead and run all of these con1, con2, con3 and con4. So this time we have the values of all of these tensors. So the value of constant 1 is 10, the value of constant 2 is 3.14, the value of constant 3 is this is part of, and finally the value of constant 4 is false, right? So first we'd have to create all of the constants, then we'd have to create a session and inside the session, we'd have to run all of these constants. Now, let me go ahead and perform some simple operations on all of these constants. So let me just type in operations over here. So I'll do a simple addition operation. So I'll type addition over here. And uh, let's say the value of the first constant is 20. I'll put a plus symbol. And then I'll take in the next constant and the value of the second constant would be 30. So I am basically adding two TensorFlow constants. The value of the first constant is 20. The value of the second constant is 30. And I'm storing that result in addition. Similarly, I will multiply these two constant now. So multiplication tf dot 
constant. So I'll give the value of 20. Now I'll put the asterisk symbol and then this would be tf dot constant of 30. So this time I'm multiplying these two values, right? So I'll hit on run. So now again, if I'd have to see the resultant addition and multiplication values, I'd have to run these two inside a session. So I'll type sys dot run and then put in these two values over here, addition and multiplication, right? So we see that 20 plus 30 gives us an addition value of 50. And similarly, when we multiply 20 with 30, we get a result of 600, All right? Now, so this was basic operation with scalars. And we already know that tensors can have higher dimensions. So let's go ahead and perform addition and multiplication with these higher dimension tensors, right? So again, I'll just put in addition over here. And I will take in the first constant and inside this, I will give in a list of values. So let's say I will take in 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 and I will add this list with the next constant. And this time, the second constant has the values of 5, 4, 3, 2 and 1. Similarly, I'll also multiply. So multiplication equals tf dot constant and this will have values, let's say the same values 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Let me put a comma over here. Right. Now I'll put the asterisk symbol. Again, I'll type tf dot constant and I will give in the list of the values 5, 4, 3, 2 and 1. Now I'll hit run. Again, I need to run these two inside a session. So says dot run. Let me put in addition over here. After that, I would also need the multiplication value. Right, so this is our result. So when we add 1 plus 5, we get 6. When we add 2 plus 4, we get 6. Similarly, when we add each of the corresponding elements with these elements inside the list, we get all of the 6s over here. Now let's take this multiplication result. So over here, when we multiply 1 with 5, we get 5. When we multiply 2 with 4, we get 8. 3 cross 3 gives us 9. 4 cross 2 gives us 8. And again, 5 cross 1 gives us a 5. So this was addition and multiplication with respect to lists. Now let me also do a simple operation on strings. So let me take in the first string and name it as str1. So this is a constant, so tf dot constant. And let's say I type over here, I love, and then I give a space. Now I will take in the second string, which would be str2. And inside this, and again, this would be a constant. So tf dot constant, and the value of this constant would be tensorflow, right? Now I will run this and let me execute this inside a session. So says dot run of str1 plus str2. So the result which you get is I love tensorflow, right? So the first string is I love and then there's a space and the second string is tensorflow. So when I add these two strings, the resultant is I love tensorflow, right? So that was all about constants. And then we have placeholders. So when it comes to placeholders, we don't have to provide an initial value and can specify it during the runtime. So uh, this allows us to build our computational graph without needing the data. And this is how we can uh, create placeholders. So tf.placeholder is the syntax and inside that we just give the data type of the variable which we will substitute later on during execution. So let's go to so let's head back to Jupyter and work with these placeholders. So let me just type in placeholder over here. So let me create my first placeholder. So I'll name that as a and tf dot placeholder. And uh, this would be of integer type. So tf dot int 32. Now I will create another variable which would be b. And the value of b would be actually a cross 2. So let me run this. Now 
I will run these two inside a session. So says dot run and I want to see the result of B. So I'll put in B over here. Now, since we know that a placeholder takes in a value during runtime. So this is when I'll feed the value to this placeholder A over here. Now to do that, I would have to create something known as a feed dictionary. So feed dict equals, let me create a dictionary over here. So it would be A and the value which I'll be giving to A would be let's say 5. Now let me run this and let's see what do we get, right? So during the execution time, I have assigned a value of 5 to A. And when we multiply this 5 with 2 over here, we get the value of B which is 10, right? So all of this is happening during runtime because with the help of a placeholder, we can assign it a value during execution. Now similarly, let me go ahead and give a list of values over here. So instead of 5, let me give the list of values 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Now I'll run this. So over here, 1 cross 2 gives us 2, 2 cross 2 gives us 4, 3 cross 2 is 6, 4 cross 2 is 8 and 5 cross 2 is 10. So you get an array of values during runtime. Now similarly, let me also create a placeholder for strings. So I'll type string placeholder over here. So now let me create this variable and name this as string name. And this would be your placeholder. So tf dot placeholder and I am taking in a string. So tf dot string. Right. If you want to make a career in data science, then IntelliPath has IIT Madras Advanced Data Science and AI Certification Program. This course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts. Now let me create another string over here. So the name of this string would be my name. And let's say the value of the string is I am. All right. Now let me run this and I'll execute this inside a session. Says dot run. And I want the result of my name when I add it with respect to string name. Now let me also create a placeholder for strings. So I'll just type string placeholder and uh, let me create the first placeholder. So I'll name that as a str1 name. And since there's a placeholder, tf dot placeholder and I will be giving in a string during execution time. Now I'll also create another string value over here and name that to be my name and the value of the string is I am and then I'll give a space. Right, so now I'll hit run and let me execute this inside a session. Now let me also create a placeholder for strings. So this will be string placeholder, right. So let me create this placeholder. I'll name this as str name. And since there's a placeholder, I need to use tf dot placeholder and I will be assigning a string to this during execution time. Now I will also create another string which would be my name and this would be equal to I am and there's a space and I will be adding this with str name. So let me hit run. Right now I'll execute this inside a session. So for that, I'll type sys dot run and uh, I want the result of my name. So I'll just put in my name over here and then I'll provide the feed dictionary. Feed dict equal to, let me put in the dictionary over here and I will assign the values of str name over here. Right. So the values of str name would be Sam, Bob, and Charlie. Now let me hit run and let's see what do we get. Right. So what we are basically doing is we are adding this with the placeholder value over here and we are giving the values during the execution time. So I am Sam, I am Bob and I am Charlie. Now these three values are coming from this feed dictionary during the runtime. Right. So this is all about placeholders.
And finally, we have variables. So a variable is just a program element which allows us to add new trainable parameters to the graph. And this is the syntax to create a variable tf.variable and then we give the value or we initialize the value and then we specify the data type of that variable. Right, so let's head back to Jupyter now. I'll just type in variables over here. Right, so let me create my first variable and the name of that variable would be var1 and we can create a variable like this tf.variable. So guys, you need to keep in mind that this v over here is actually capital. Right. So now after this, I would have to assign a value to it. So let's say I assign this variable a value of 20. And this is of integer type. So tf dot int 32. I'll run this. Now another thing to be kept in mind is whenever we are declaring values in TensorFlow, they have to be initialized. So this is how we can initialize all of the variables. So we have something known as global variable initializer. And when we invoke this function, all of the variables which we have declared would be initialized. I'll hit run. So now let me execute this inside a session. So says dot run of init. And I have initialized this variable over here. Now let me also go ahead and run that variable. Says dot run var1. Right. So we have the result of var1 which is 20. Now since this is a variable, the value of a variable can be actually updated. So let me go ahead and update the value of this. So I will uh, name this as updated var1 and the function would be tf.assign. And inside this, the first parameter would be the variable which I'd want to update. And after that, I need to give the value to which I'd want to update this. So I want to make this value of 20 to 25. Right, now I will run this. So now this is actually a variable. We can actually update the values. So let me go ahead and do that. So the name of the updated variable would be, let's say, updated var1. And the function for that would be tf.assign. And this takes in two parameters. The first parameter would be the variable which we are supposed to update. And the second parameter would be the value to which we are updating it. So I want to make this 20 to 25. I'll hit run right now. Let me run this inside a session. Says dot run. And I need to pass in the variable which would be updated var1. Let me make it small v over here. I'll run this, right. So initially the value of var1 was 20, but we have updated it and made its value to be 25. Now let's also go ahead and uh, create a small linear model. So let me just type in linear model over here. And this is how our linear model would look like. W, X plus B, where uh, W and B would be variables and X would be a placeholder, right. Right, so let me start off by creating w. So w is a variable. So w would be equal to tf dot variable. And I am initializing it with a value of let's say 10 and this is of integer type. So this would be tf dot int 32. Now, similarly, I will also assign the value for b. So b is also a variable and its initial value would be phi and this is also of integer type. And finally, we have x, which is a placeholder. So x is equal to tf dot placeholder. And since placeholder does not actually take an initial value, it just takes a data type. So the data type is again tf dot int 32. So I'll run this. And now what I'll do is I will multiply w with x and add b to it. So the equation would be w cross x plus b. And I will store it in a variable and name that variable to be linear model. Right, so this is w cross x plus b. I'll run this. Now again, if I have to execute this, I have to run this inside a session. And since also I have created two new variables, I'd have to initialize them first. So init1 equals tf dot 
global variables initializer i'll hit run so now i will create a session so says dot run and i will execute in it one first so i have successfully initialized these two variables w and x now i can go ahead and run this linear model says dot run now i would want the result of linear model so linear model and then i will use the feed dictionary now inside this feed dictionary i would have to assign a value to this placeholder x so x equal to let's say i give a list of values over here and the list of values would be 1 2 3 4 and 5 now i'll run this and let's see what do we get right so if the value of x is 1 we get 15 so this basically means that 10 into 1 plus 5 which is 15 now after that if the value of x is 2 so this would mean 10 into 2 plus 5 which is 25 similarly if x is 3 that would mean 10 into 3 which is 30 plus 5 is 35 right and same is the case for 4 and 5 so let's go back in 1980s there was this crazy guy called dr hilden he proposed that you know ki we could mimic uh, somehow the mind how a human mind works and we, we can mimic the way it works so that we can also try to make a make a thing out of it so that uh, whatever our mind is doing artificially we can also do that thing so he proposed a paper and everybody said that Hilton, listen, you are doing something wrong. This is not what is right. And everybody, you know, didn't like the uh, the way things were going on. But after 20 years, almost in like uh, late 90s, around 1999, uh, he again came up with this paper. Uh, he brought in his paper, but this time with a proof. And uh, he won a contest that is called ImageNet in 2004. This time he came back and everybody had to listen. So we were at 2004 when he won the image net. I have two people who I have like I have already told that you know, image net is image net is actually in a competition. It is held by a joint uh, joint vision of Stanford plus Princeton University. Uh, they these guys come up and they they did they, they downloaded a corpus of images now they have a very col large collection of images around 1 million images around covering thousand categories uh, they have you can just click on explore and you can see this tree around here so what you have to do is that you have to make a model out of it so that you can classify the images so people used to make you know hand coded classifiers and they were working they were working but but at some stage, you know, they had to fail because like uh, now uh, let's say that fish, you are trying to uh, detect a fish, but fish cannot every way be in the same manner in which you are building the hard coded thing, right? Or let's say that you are trying to detect a cat and then you say, okay, top right, if it is an eye, top left is an eye and then it's a squishing uh, mouth, then it's a cat, right? But now the cat face will not always be available to you in that particular fashion, right? It might be a top view, a side view, a bottom view any view might come up and at that time people used to fail but in 2014 uh, 2004 when you know uh, Geoffrey Hilton came with a, with his paper his paper the competition he won was with 94 percent accuracy and that was never achieved never achieved and it surpassed the human accuracy also so that was the that was where you know when people started listening to him and he came out then he proposed slowly that okay that this is what I think that you know artificial neural network is nothing but it's that we are trying to mimic what is happening in, in our own mind right so if i say that what is the theory uh what is uh what joffrey said about uh, um neural network is that he said that a, that an artificial neural network is a computational model that is inspired by the by the way biological neural networks in our brain human information possesses right so um i mean most of you know this thing that you know that our nervous system is is made up of exams and uh, okay i'll show you the photo that you know it is made up of exams and strobe veins a human nervous system is basic most basic uh, diagram and everybody of you might have seen this so how this works is that there is a re exact replicate copy of this if i copy this you know and you can attach it back here again 
so these are the exon terminals that are connected to dendrites again and this is how it flows so let's imagine that your finger tips pay you can have your uh, dendrites and these are like small small particles again of your pure neuron 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 connected to your brain so this is how there are like millions of these connected when they are connected if i take this art okay one more feature of uh, jupyter notebook that you already know that you can add a markdown language so what i do is i do escape m and then i'll write html inside it so i write ing src is equal to this is how you can write your in this you can add that this is right let's now look at it one by one slowly slowly okay so these are called dendrites these dendrites are the one who are like septicles these are the one who are responsible for catching all the information and sending it forward to the nucleus now nucleus processes this thing and it sends to this exons and again throws it out to the exon terminals now imagine again that this is this copy this is again replicated here back here so you can imagine that these dendrites are connected to these exons right and then they are flowing 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 now imagine let's say that you touched a very small a very hot uh, glass right the moment you touch the hot glass the dendrites at your uh, fingertips they sense that something is very hot there so they they send this information to your brain okay that this is hot now imagine this dendrite is processing the information sending it to terminal terminal to dendrite and turn dendrite to terminal it goes on goes on goes on until it goes to your brain now brain now the brain says that this is this is very hot you should remove your hand okay now this process is again flowing back to the back to the dendrite the original dendrite here let's say that this is the original dendrite here okay and the brain will say that this is really hot you should remove your uh, uh, remove the fingertips from the glass and now when i'm saying that th this information is going on believe me from your fingertip to your brain there are like millions of these dendrites who are connecting and flowing this information now again a process of reversal information flow is going on and this time your brain is sending a signal that remove your hand from the glass and this is again going back to the fingertip and then you release your, your hand from the glass but in real life when you touch the glass and when you remove it how much time do you take to remove this it's just some nanosecond right i mean less than your reflexes are very strong you just remove the hand out but imagine what is happening when you do this your brain is not your 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 hand is not taking the decision of removing that you might think that okay my hand is taking the decision to remove that no the the hand is like a slave of brain so every body part of ours is like a slave of a brain right whatever we are doing it is sent by the brain the information is sent by the brain and then it's doing this is how a uh, your your body works right so it's a slave of your brain and the brain sends the information remove or attack whatever it is then it reacts but it's really fast right similarly to this way only uh, joffrey said that okay this neural network this is how even uh, i will also build a neural net now i'll show you how a basic neuron looks like here it is this is the image you write it basic neural it's not a network it's just a neuron but this is a artificial neuron so joffrey said it okay this is how also this is how i propose let's do the following just a quick info guys test your knowledge of computer vision by answering this question computers process data into information by working exclusively with which of the following a multimedia b words c characters d numbers comment your answer in the comment section below subscribe to intellipad to know the right answer now let's continue with the session let's say that your hand is not doing anything your your dendrites or your nervous system is not this basic neuron is not doing anything imagine that it's doing nothing but you know it is reciprocating the information but how it is re reciprocating the information by activating itself so when you touch a hot glass or something it activates itself and then only it's transmitting the, the the thing right now imagine if if this would have not activated it would have sent nothing right so this is also playing a very crucial role see brain is sitting somewhere like th a million nerve neurons far right he doesn't know what is happening to your hand until and unless this neuron is sending the information so what information will the brain process if it doesn't has the information so these guys are very much responsible 
for sending the information and they send the information only when they are activated so this dendroid will become this this nucleus will become activated then only it will send the further information and see there is also a basic kind of a uh, uh, information processing is going on it doesn't uh, mean that these dendrites are just sending blank signals see i'll tell you more depth inside see these dendrites they collect the information these dendrites they collect the information and they send it to the nucleus now nucleus think that should i process this and send it forward yes or no depending on that nucleus send it further right now how is nucleus and nucleus sending is nucleus has a particular uh, threshold value after processing it it says okay if i am activated by the processed value it will send it further if not it will keep it to itself so this is also how a basic artificial neuron and when i say artificial it means that the one that we are building right now in deep learning right this is also built now what is happening is that imagine this uh, round thing that you are seeing is the nucleus this thing is a nucleus but this is a nucleus right and these are the dendrites to it this one this x1 and x2 this is the way of thinking how we are intimating and this is the tail x and tail and it is again connected to again a neural network so it's a chain of uh, multiple neurons going on now if we go mathematically what is happening inside this it is nothing but a linear combination of all the inputs with a bias i just uh, like went to the very human biological way and i just send a sentence it's doing nothing what it's doing is that it collects the, the input let's say that you have two input let's say that you have two input x1 and x2 these are your two inputs now to every input you will give some weightage to it let's say our weightage is here this weightage is called w1 for x1 and w2 for x2 correct now what i said it is trying to build a linear regression right so what it does it multiplies the weight of the corresponding input to itself so w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus it adds a bias to it now you will ask what is a bias i'll say imagine that there is another input called x0 there is a another input called x0 and the value of x0 is equal to 1 the value of x0 is equal to 1 and there is this weight associated to it that is called w0 right so this bias is added to it and then you add this that's it you plus all these values multiply plus all these values and you give this output to something called y this is all a neuron does make sense any questions please ask it's very important that you build the intuition that what is happening here so this is the most basic it's the smallest part of a neural network that you can pick and the smallest part of a neural network is doing this that it takes all the inputs that are coming to itself give them some weightage multiply the weightage to the corresponding input and then sum all these and then add a small bias to it also that's it over how is this weightage and bias being introduced that to who is okay x1 and x0 x2 and x1 i can say okay someone is giving to us the input that what is the temperature of the glass let's say it is coming from the outside environment x1 and x2 is coming outside but who is giving this w1 and w2 so okay so the answer is that in a in a artificial neural network environment at the very first instance at the very first instance they are randomly allocated to it so see you all guys have learned ml right so how does ml work ml says that i know the output and depending on the output i have to give some weightage to these input so that they can give me the output now you know that the output will be y you know that the output is going to be y right now you want to make some equation where y is equal to x1 plus x2 okay and now this is not the correct answer right x1 and x2 will never give you y y1 so what you do you add some w1 here some random w1 and then here random w2 what it will do it will not give you the answer w1 and w2 will not give you the answer you will do some corrections again in w1 w2 and ultimately it will give you y so this is what is happening at the very first instance you will take w1 and w2 as as random first is that does does the process is reverse yes it also reverses itself the the model uh, will not only go from x1 to, from x1 x2 to y but it can also come back from y to x1 x2 and second let's say that he is asking uh, shivam does it process recursively recursively just imagine that there are like thousands of now i'll draw it again to show you this is just a very basic one right now imagine what is going on here is that this is the small 
that you saw, right? X1, X2, and it is giving some Y. Now here it is again, there is a X1, X2, and then this is giving me Y. Now this Y and Y, Y1 will become an input for some other cell. And then it is giving here. So are you imagining how the, how will it look like? This become this, and this will become again an input for some other. So these are like corrected. These are like throwing information from one to another, one to another, one to another, right? But this is how it works. This is how a, a small a network looks like. And this, this is, uh, if I write down the theory, it says that the basic unit of computation in neural network is a neuron, or often called as a node, right? And came right in very right. This is called a node, or you can say it's a unit also. So it receives input from some other node from an external sources or external source that I was saying right also, right? It, the X1 and X2 might be an input from another neuron or it might be given to you directly from the external environment, right? Computes the object, each input, each input has an associated weight to it, which is assigned on the basis of its relative importance to other. The node applies a function F to the weighted sum of this input, right? So we'll be having the students data so whatever the marks based upon their marks so we have to decide the grade so we have to adjust whether the student is uh, passed out or uh, failed so we will be adjusting the marks based upon the grade this is a very hard coded problem i think but let me take an example that you're working on a machine learning problem where you are trying to find out the loan defaults right Right in bank, you have multiple people who take the loan. Now the bank wants to know how will this person repay the loan or not, right? Now you already have a historical data with you. The bank will give the data to you. Okay, let's say that this is the data with you. So in that data, you already know that if this is the feature of a person, this is the credit history of the person based on that, that they, they will also give you that. Okay, he paid, he didn't pay, he paid, 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 didn't pay, right? And based on that, you adjust your model, right? So there also you have a X and Y with you you will have your x and y with you at that particular instance also okay so everybody gets this uh, f uh, this function thing right that's how this function is working this function f is called the f fine so the f function that you see this is called the f fine f fine thing and it's doing nothing right you saw that this is it doing a linear uh, thing here just multiplying the weights the corresponding x1 x2 and you might now consider x1 x2 as the uh, importance feature so the more important x1 is the uh, the more higher the value of w1 will be right the more lower the value of w2 is it means it doesn't make much sense to y so everything that we will now talk will be with respect to y so the x2 is ne not making much sense to y so the value of w2 will be very less let's say y is dependent on x1 so this value of w1 will go more higher right and then your bias you already have this is a static thing right because the x naught associated to it is equal to y right let's now go back at what further happens here now you get the y out of here right now this y thing is a little uh you have got the answer and this might be greater than one or less than one also right so there is no measure of this answer it might happen that w1 w2 is very small let's say w1 w2 are very small then the value of y might be almost equal to zero right or let's say that w1 value is very high like very high so the value of y might also get very high right so now this might bring some bias uh, you know this might bring some ambiguity to our model this y might be sometimes you know next to infinite it might be equal to infinite or it might also be equal to zero, right? Depending on the variables. And we don't want that. We want our y to be in some particular range, right? We want our y to be in some bonded weights, right? Then comes next guys whose names are activation functions. Activation functions. Now we got to know that how this y is made, right? How this y is uh, ultimately achieved. Now to adjust the value or squeeze the value of y, we need some other other thing, right? We need we need something that can control the value of y and these are called activation functions now what activation functions does is that they will take the value of y and they will squeeze the value of y in some certain range what they will do they will squeeze the value of y in some certain range so we have multiple you know uh, let's say we have a step function we have a 10 h function uh, Shivam, uh, Sanjay said, can you please come again about this activation function? So not getting you properly. So let's come back what this activation function is. Uh, so you 
understand that the value of y how it is calculated right it is not totally dependent on w1 and w2 if the value of w1 and w2 is very less i mean 0.0000 or let's say 10 to the power minus 23 then the then the y is going to be very less right next to zero or let's say that the value of w1 and w2 is like uh, 10 to the power positive 48 plus 48 so this might be very high the value of y might be very high there might be no standard to control this value of y right mathematically there is no this value can go from negative infinite to positive infinite right and this is not a very good range to to get about a particular output right so so what we do is we introduce something that is called activation functions now what this activation function will do is activation function will make sure that your output that you have got y should be in some particular range what it should be it should be in some particular range now how do you decide that who is going to be in what range and how is is that range uh, called see the activation function if i ask you mathematically the mathematical purpose of uh, introducing an activation function is to squeeze the value of y between some variable called 0 to 1 right majority times so the this is, so the value so the purpose of activation function is to bound the y in some range right and this range might be minus 1 say 1 0 to 1 or sometimes 0 to infinite it might be different different things right I was at this thing that uh, mathematically the value is to be squeezed between 0 to 1. But uh, if I talk to you about uh, uh, statistically why I am doing this is now imagine till here, till this particular range, your model is a linear model. Everybody uh, agrees with me, right? This is a linear model. Nothing non linear have been done till now, right? All the things that we have done till uh, this step in the circle. Everything is linear. There is no non-linear thing, right? Now, linear things are are a little bad at classifying things. If there are more than three classes, right? If I ask you, can you, if let's say there are three classes, uh, one is like crosses, right? One is circles, right? And one is some triangles. Now, can you make a single line and can divide these three data? No, right? If it would have been two classes, you might have, you know, drawn a single line and you might have divided the data into like two classes, right? But if it is a three class data, how will you divide this? You have to ultimately make a triangle kind of a shape or this kind of a shape, right? Then only you can divide the, uh, divide this, this thing, right? So I, I'll show you a photo also. Let's say, let me give you an example. Then I'll show you how this works. Okay. Can any one of you let me hide it here? Now this is this uh, this thing in front of you. Everybody can see your data. There is this red dots and there is a blue triangle in the screen, right? Everybody can see this. Now can you make a linear model that can separate these two things? This can only do in a two dimension, right? But if I say you that okay, see a magic. Anybody wants to try this thing? How will you do? No? Okay. What I'll do is, I'll remove this now. So what I did was, I introduced a third dimension. And now I could easily separate by introducing a hyperplane here. And then I can say, okay, something that is above this hyperplane is red. Something that is below this hyperplane is blue. Makes sense to everyone, right? So this is why we do activation function to make sure that we want to classify things more better to make things more clear. We do a activation function. So mathematically why we are doing activation function because we want to squeeze the value of. Y somewhere if but if I talk statistically what we are doing, we are introducing non linearity in a linear model because linear models are very much not capable of classifying things in when the number of classes increases so now we saw that as soon as we increase the linearity if we increase the dimension in the data if we introduce non-linearity in the data what it is doing it increases the chances of making a linear separable model right 
right so if i say in three three times first mathematically squeezing the y second if i say graphical thing why we are doing this because we want to introduce a new dimension and statistically saying why we are doing this because we want to introduce non linearity inside x now you might be asking what these functions do it's a very uh, good question i have activation functions graphs see this is how a sigmoid looks like a tan h look like a relu looks like and see everybody is bounding so see sigmoid is bounding between 0 to 1 tan h is bounding between minus 1 say 1 relu is bounding from 0 to infinite so it lets go everything that is going above yes we have step function also step function say that you can go so, something can be only have two things either 0 or 1 if something is negative it goes 0 if something is positive it goes 1 it's a step function sigmoid tan h relu so there are multiple things these are doing the same thing that we want to do for a activation function relu you can understand that if something is negative it says it's a zero and if something is positive it lets go whatever the value of this is right i write the variables in here this is what brings in sigmoid is this tan h is this and relu is this right what is the maximum of 0 to 1 that that ever value it will take right this is what activation function is let's say that you have this thing called y1 and y2 right and now the value of y1 and y2 is very large very large right so this y3 will become ultimately also very large and this y4 will become also very large and we know this is not the exact thing we always expect our output to be in the form of 0 to 1 if it is a classification problem and if it is regression problem then it is it will always be in some range from 0 to 1 right you all agree with me right in machine learning also whenever you did a classification problem you one hot encoded the problem so you never said that the output is going to be a a c80 cat or dog dog right you always said that okay if zero comes this is cat one comes then it's a dog right you did the same thing right in machine learning also or if it was a regression problem then you always regress a value from 0 to 1 with a multiplicative factor right so this is what is happening here also the y3 and y4 ka value can never go up beyond a limit to control that limit we have to squeeze the value and see when i'm saying squeezing the value that is in mathematical format but if you see in statistically what we are doing is that we have to introduce non linearity into the data right because linear data are not linear uh, uh, equations are not good in separating non linear data right right this becomes separable you see now it is very much separable just by a simple hyperplane okay so coming back to a feed forward neural network so see this was the input x1 this was input x2 and now what a feed forward neural network expects is that a hidden node should be connected to all the inputs what does it expects it should be connected to all the inputs that are in the previous layer so this is let's say this is called layer input layer wherever your hidden neurons this is called hidden layer and your outputs are here this is called a output layer now when you are building the speed forward neural network your responsibility is just one that whichever neuron you are standing let's say we are standing on this particular neuron let's say this this neuron this neuron now the only thing that this okay this is not a neuron exactly oh sorry let's say we are standing on this neuron now the responsibility is just this that if you go to the previous layer the previous layer is the input layer all the neurons in this layer should be connected to this hidden no hidden node right similarly output 2 also expects the same you go to the previous layer so this is the output layer what is the previous layer hidden layer so all the neurons in the hidden layer should be connected to the output node 2 make sense or if i make it more easily let's say that whichever neuron you are standing just go to the previous layer and all the all the neurons in that previous layer should be connected to this particular neuron 
right what is this layer signifying here uh, correct very good layer. question so what you are doing is you have stacked all your neurons one by one in some format right so all your input neurons so see whatever you made in this above statement here in this above uh, thing here so this x1 and x2 this is x1 x2 this might be x3 x4 x5 x10 right so these x1 and x2s are what inputs right so what you do is you collect all these and you just put it inside a layer here this becomes a hidden layer now you will not only have one neuron you will have multiple neurons right so what is happening is that you uh, so what you have done is rather than having just one neuron what you have done is you have made multi neuron system so this is a feed forward multi neuron model here so what you are seeing in the in the previous photo that has uh, image that i showed you that was just a multi input single neuron but now you have multiple neurons so what you do is you stack these neurons in this layer then you you can have, so this is just an example what you can do is you can have a image like this also multi layer okay so now if i if i if, I, if you see around here so what is happening is these are your inputs x1 x2 x3 x4 right this is your input layer this is your hidden layer 1 where all your affines and activations are happening right this is your layer 2 again all the affines and you know your uh, activations are happening and this is your output layer hidden layer hl2 this is hl1 and this is input layer plus plus some bias b will give some output called y and here you will have be having a very small activation function also residing here right similarly for this n2 also this n2 will is connected to all the inputs right this n2 is connected to all the inputs this n2 is connected now it is connected to this to this to this and this now n2 n2 will also do some affine and then bring some activation small activation function here and it will also give some output called y2 similarly y3 will also be here now this y1 y2 y3 will become input for these neuron let's say we call this neuron as n4 now this n4 is connected to this this and this similarly again affine and let's say it gives the output called o1 now o1 is here similarly o2 is here now this o1 o2 is all will also become uh, input for this uh, let's say we call it uh, o1 right here right <laughs> this is o1 Y4. Let me remove this. Sorry, sir. We were here that there is this some output called Y4, and there is some output called Y5, right? Now, what is happening? Y uh, Y4 and Y5 will become output for this O neuron, and they will give some output O1 and O2 similarly here, and then you will have outputs, right? This is how a multi-layer neural network works. How will we know that how many layers? Correct. This is this is one of the very good questions that you know. First of all, how many layers do you want? This is the layers that you have. L one and L two. Now you might have another question that okay, in in one layer, how many neurons can I fit? So there there are currently four. I can fit five, six, ten also, right? I can fit fit ten neurons also. so who is going to tell me that how many neurons and how many layers this is what exactly what data science you are going to do here i mean everything is built for you this 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 neuron thing and this all thing is every, this is already built for you the only thing that you have to do is that you have to come up with the optimal number of neurons and optimal number of layers for each uh, neural network and now who is going to decide this very good question this is you who is going to decide this and how okay so first answer is that hit and try that everybody will tell you and i am also telling you that the first approach is hit and try let's say that you are doing a very new problem i mean you don't have any idea you are just doing so one thing is that you'll go with the hit and trial model second is that as soon as you become a little bit expert you know now you start learning okay this is how my model is reacting to this particular neural network layer then you see the model capacity okay so let's say that now see 
when this uh, let's say this is called neuron one when this neuron one is connected to x1 x2 x3 there is a weight called w1 w2 on this layer and w3 here right so but when this n2 is connected this is not w1 w2 w3 there is w4 w5 w6 so when this x1 is connected to this n2 here on this line there is another weight that is w4 so imagine how many weights are there for three inputs three neurons there will be nine weights right now there are nine weights now imagine here again that you have three inputs and two output three to six then you have six so nine plus six then again here two to the four so you will have two plus four so nine plus six plus four is 19 so 19 weights are there and then you will have three biases here right so 19 plus 3 is what 22 so for the small neural network you have 22 values that you have to predict right because y1 uh, w1 w2 we have taken uh, as uh, if you want to make a career in data science then IntelliPath has IIT Madras Advanced Data Science and AI Certification Program. This course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts. As what? To, as random, right? And biases are also random. So you have to adjust them in a very optimal way so that you can get the output as Y. So now imagine that you have 22 things that you have, that you have to train here. 21, 22 things that you have to, uh, that you have to predict uh, not predict but you have to optimize right and now let's say that you have a data only for like 10 rows now does this justify that you will have 22 things to adjust in the 10 rows of data so this is called capacity building so you, what you have to do is that you have to check your model if your model is even capable if the data is even capable to adjust these values right let's say that you are just doing a simple uh, addition right if you give you give you two numbers your model has to give some output right now let's say that you have thousand examples for it but now you're building or like say thousand layer and thousand neuron uh, per layer thousand neurons and here then you have thousand layers now does the model require this much of data no the data will be lost in some third third or fourth layer only right and see what i just said in just last two three sentences this will come slowly 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 with the experience in you also so what you'll do, so whenever see whenever a new problem comes to me i i first of all read the research paper through it see because we are not researchers let me be frank with you we are not researchers who are going to uh, make things we are deep learning engineers here right we have to implement the engineer and we have to solve a business problem through it right so what you do is first of all you read some papers out of it right then you get the intuition of how do you build a neural network around it then i do some hidden trial errors okay this is how you build and this some changes and then slowly you understand okay when i change this thing this thing is affected more then you reduce and more then you have some prior knowledge also like that that, that i told you it's capacity uh, that what is the capacity of the model let's say that you have a very large data but you are just building one layer then the data is underfitted right or let's say that you have very less data but you have made a very big neural network for this and this is called overfitting just a quick info guys test your knowledge of computer vision by answering this question a string of eight zeros and ones is called what? A. Megabyte B. Byte C. Kilobyte D. Gigabyte Comment your answer in the comment section below. Subscribe to IntelliPad to know the right answer. Now, let's continue with the session. Right. You have a very over number of neurons for your model to be uh, predictable. Right. So slowly, slowly you will bring, uh, you know, you will uh, have intuitions and this is, I will tell you, you know, uh, with your, uh, uh, when you will be doing your first problem in a neural network, you will understand slowly. See, you might be thinking that, you know, I'm not taking to your practical, right? I am not telling you about any real world example, but this theory is really important. I might directly jump to the code also, but that will make no sense to you after two or three weeks, right? Because code anybody can write. Until unless you don't know, okay, what will happen is the next, uh, after two or three months, when you will be making your own neural network, you will fail that, okay, which activation function to use, then this thing will occur, okay. So see, this is what he is talking about to all the people. This is what he is talking about, let's say that you want to add more layers. So currently there is only two hidden layers. You want to add more, add more, add more, right. If you want to increase per layer, you want to increase the neuron, you might go like this also. Okay, you might like 
I'll reduce it to like let's say six. This I'll reduce it to four. This into and this is one, right? This is how your neural network will look like. These are the two inputs. Now every input is connected to the every neuron in the first hidden layer, right? Then second, then third, and fourth similarly. And this is how the data is flowing inside here. You can see now slowly. When we put every x into each neuron, does every neuron give same y? Very good question. But no. See, Kim, if we if we if we come here, it would have been the same if they would have same w, right? So if x1 is connected to n1 here at this layer, it has w11, right? But when x1 is connected to n2 here, it has something called w12, right? So there are different weights. So it is coming from x1, but it, but because it is connected to different neurons, different input neurons, they will have different weights also. Understandable. So to other people, what came is asking is that okay, that you are doing a fine. I understand that you are doing a fine, but let's say that let go back to a fine equation because the value of x1 and x2 is constant, the output will always be constant, right? But no, because y1 is made up of this this equation. And this equation is also driven by w1 and w2, and the w1 w2 values are different. The value of y will also be different in each case, right? So suppose you are a computer vision engineer, and a client has approached you with a problem statement in which you have to detect the faces from a set of images that they will be providing, and you have taken up this project. And these are the following steps that you have to follow while building up this project. So these are the images that they have provided to you. These are some of the images that have taken from their data set. And uh, here we'll be working on Python with OpenCV. In this project, we will be using the Har Cascade classifier for detecting the faces from multiple images. So, firstly, you have to perform the downloading part for the Har Cascade system. So, here I have written download Har Cascade frontal face default .xml and this raw GitHub code. These are the raw datas for the Har Cascade. You have to just simply save as and you can save it as desktop and uh, you have now you have the Har Cascade classifier. So now next we will be just uh, importing the CV2 and glob. So now we will be practicing it in the Jupyter notebook. So, so firstly you have to import the cv2 library and glob so i want to tell you that glob is the function which returns us the array of those file name which we will write in the next line like we just have to uh, perform face detection on those images which have dot jpg extension so for that i will be writing g image equals to glob dot glob so here I am calling the object glob and with the function glob and here inside the function I will be writing the star dot jpg. So it will take up all the images that have extension dot jpg. So after that we will detect after the getting the glob images. Now we will create cascade classifier so that we can so as it helps us in getting the face detection it contains all the features of the images like nose ears face object these are some of the features of the image so here we'll be writing detect equals to cv2 dot cascade classifier classifier then inside the braces we will be writing which classifier we have downloaded the har cascade frontal face default classifier so we will be mentioning the same name har cascade okay har cascade frontal face default dot xml so now after creating the har cascade frontal face default xml file then what we will do we will now traverse the glob images so that we can detect the faces so for traversing we will be creating a for loop for traverse or you can also write 
T image, T image for traversing the image, T image in G image, the globe image. Okay, so now it will take one image at a time. Now in the for loop, we will read the image, a particular image. So for just reading the image, we will write like I have taken image equals to cv2 dot i am read and what is this reading the t image okay so after reading the particular image from the g image now we will convert the images these are the colored images the image that it has read it is the colored images so for so in this phase detection we will first have to convert the colored image into the grayscale image so it is easier for the classifier to handle the image and detect the faces from it so for converting the image to con from converting the uh, colored image to grayscale image we will write gray image i have written this gray image equals to cv2 dot cvt c o l o r color and in the braces it will have this image that you have to convert it into grayscale this image comma the we will write cv2 dot color and underscore bgr bgr to gr even gray okay so after converting it into grayscale now we will detect the faces from the images so for detecting the faces i will be writing the face equals to detect dot detect i am calling this object here and with the function detect multi scale and it has three parameters so the first one is in which image you want to detect the face so we will be writing this gray image this gray image here and the next parameter is the scale factor so we will be more so we have to see the value of the scale factor as the scale factor is that value which decreases the volume of the whole grayscale image by 5% until the face is detected. So it basically what does it, it decreases the value of the image so that it can find the face from the image. So I am writing 1.25 the smaller the value is the greater will be the accuracy. So I am writing 1.25 and the next parameter is the minimum neighbor. So we don't have to bother this value. Now after that after detecting the face now we will be describing the uh, rectangle shape for the face. So for that create a for loop for now in this braces we will be writing all the dimensions for the rectangle like x comma y comma w comma h length breadth height and width okay so after the parameter now in what in face we are actually detecting the we have detected the face but now we have to define that face with a rectangle shape so for that we will be using the dot rectangle function so here i am writing cv2 dot rectangle okay rectangle now in this we have four parameters the first one is the image that you have to detect the face image this image that we have read it here okay the second parameter is the rgb value rgb value means the colored value so here i am writing the x comma y and then the other parameters for the rectangle we are basically defining the parameters of the rectangle how it will look on the image so we will be writing x plus w comma y plus sorry y plus h okay so after defining the parameters of the rectangle now we will be look at the color of the rectangle so here i am just taking the green color so this is the code for green color okay 0 comma 255 comma 0 okay so now after that we will the last parameter is the thickness of the rectangle so i am giving 2 
so now after defining the rectangle now we will just show the image so for displaying the image cv2 dot m show in the parenthesis we will be writing detect any message you can write like detect images okay and comma which image this image so image okay so after displaying the images now we will be defining the weight key function what does weight key does is we will define some intervals between the images it's just a time period that what will be the intervals between the images so cv2 dot weight key and uh, how many i am taking 200 milliseconds sorry 2000 milliseconds and we will be writing cv2 dot destroy all windows so destroy all windows will closes all the windows based on the weight for key parameter so here i am writing the 2000 milliseconds so it will destroy it for that so here okay so i am running this code so here you can see that all the faces have been detected the problem statement so the problem statement is here your client is a large MNC and they have nine broad verticals across the organization. So one of the problems your client is facing is around identifying the right people for promotion and prepare them in time. So it is only for manager position and below. So currently the process that they are following is first one. They first identify a set of employees based on recommendations and past performance. Then the selected employees go through the separate training and evaluation program for each vertical. These programs are based on the required skill of each vertical. Then at the end of the program, based on various factors such as training performance, KPI completion, employees get promotion. So talking about the KPI completion, so only employees with KPIs completed greater than 60% are considered. Now this is the actual problem statement. Now, let us look at the scenario that is provided by the company. So the final promotions are only announced after the evaluation and this leads to delay in transition to their new roles. Hence the company needs your help in identifying the eligible candidates at a particular checkpoint so that they can expedite the entire promotion cycle and they can speed up the process actually. So the first thing is they have provided multiple attributes around employees past and current performance along with demographics. Then they have provided multiple attributes around employees past and current performance. Now the next and the second point is the task that we have is to predict whether a potential promote at checkpoint in the task set will be promoted or not after the evaluation process. Now this is what we have to do and moving ahead let's understand the data set and the parameters. So let me go to the training and the testing data set. Now this is our training set and this is our test set so now let me go to the training set and this is the employee id so we are not much concerned about the employee id so it will not actually help us in the prediction this is the department section including sales and marketing operations then technology analytics operations sales and technology again technology then research and development then there is finance, procurement and so on. There is also a department called HR and the next one is region. So this is region 7, region 22, region 19 and there are many regions. So region will actually not help us to predict the outcome of the model that we have to build. Then comes education. So education can be the factor for predicting the uh, promotion. So the list of education that is provided over here is masters and above and bachelors. So also here the empty data is there which means that there is no data provided over here. So we will deal with the missing values also and then comes the gender. So the gender is male and female. After that comes the recruitment channel that is sourcing and other. Then comes the number of trainings. So that is one two and we'll scroll down it includes three the number of training that are provided to the individuals or the employee 
Then the next thing is the age. So this is the age of the employee. Then comes the previous year rating. So this can be one of the most important factor in the promotion. So the previous year rating is 5, 3, 1, 3 and so on. And this position or this. So this is 3 star, 4 star and this is empty. So it denotes that the employee is not at all having a rating. So it can is not shown over here. So we'll sort out this thing also for making the model more accurate. Then comes KPI metrics that is key performance indicator. So it denotes and it indicates the metrics for the performance of the employee. So zero over here denotes that the performance is not at all good for giving them promotion and one indicates that the performance is decent enough to give the promotion. Then comes awards one. So this is zero, zero, zero and here it is one. So award one is one over here for a particular employee whose ID is 77981 and now average training score. So this is the training score of an employee while pursuing a training for the company. Here it is 85, 73 starting from 49, 60, 50 and so on. So it can be a major factor for predicting the promotion for the employees. That is how well they perform in the training and what is their score in the training then comes is promoted. So zero means that they are not promoted and one means that they are promoted. So in this data where the promoted thing is one. So this is the average training score and here this shows the KPI metrics that is also one. Then the next one is the length of service that is six years and so on. So these are the parameters and the uh, data set on which we will be working on for making an AI model to resolve the business problem. Now let me go to the training set. So this is the training set and it consists of go to this part. Okay. So this also consists of employee ID, then department, region, education, gender, recruitment, number of trainings, age, previous year rating, then comes length of service, KPI metrics, awards one, and then average training score. So these are the parameters over here. So we have divided the data set into train and test set so that we can train the model using the train set and we can test the model using a separate data set that is HR underscore test. Now the reason for using the test and the train data for the model is that we do not want our model to overfit the data. So in future it may get different sets of data and it may face issues in giving accurate results because the model is overfitting the data set that it is having. That is why we are using a separate data for training the model and a separate test data for testing the model. Now we have understood the data that is train data and the test data. Now let us move on to the steps that we'll see further. So the next step that we'll be going through is pre-processing and feature engineering. So in this we'll pre-process the data with using the different types of pre-processing. That is we will manipulate the data. We will remove uh, the null values and the missing values from the data set. And before that we'll use various and we will import various types of packages that are required for the implementation and we'll see the info of the train and the test data set as well as the description such as the standard deviation, the mean and the average of the values. Then we'll perform feature engineering for the model and for the data set values. Then we'll build the model using various algorithm that are used to build AI based applications and will apply feature scaling so that all the values comes in the common slot and the prediction becomes more and finally we'll evaluate the model that is created using various parameters and metrics of model evaluation and then we'll visualize it using models visualization. 
So further, let's go to Google Colab for the implementation part. Now, this is our Google Colab. So first thing you have to do is just go to this folder option, click on this upload session storage button and upload the training and the testing data set. So I have already uploaded it. So I'll just show you. So I'll scroll down and here is the data that has trained and test data that I'll be using. So whenever you open Google Colab, so the first thing you have to do is you have to load the data set. Otherwise, you cannot work with Google Colab and create algorithms and AI based applications. So also one thing more, if you load the data set now, so it is for this instance on which you are working. If you will close the tab, then the data set will be deleted. So again and again, you have to load the data set. Now I have written the code over here, the entire code. So I'll implement and I'll explain uh, every uh, code, what it is actually built for and how it is working. So first I'll import warnings and use this warnings dot filter warnings ignore. So this is used to ignore the warnings that are displayed by the interface or by the Python library while implementing the program. So I'll run this and now you can see it, it has been successfully executed. Now the next thing is the scientific and data manipulation libraries. So I have imported pandas, I have imported numpy, then import math, gc, os and the sklearn package. So we use pandas basically for data analysis and data manipulation and it provides various features for the analysis of data. Then comes numpy so we can work with multi-dimensional data and matrix arrays using the numpy library. Then comes importing of maths that help us to implement various mathematical operations. After that import GC for the garbage collection and then importing OS so that the packages and libraries are imported so that the application uh, which we are building using the various modules and libraries of Python so it gets added according to the operating system then importing scikit-learn that is sklearn so scikit-learn basically help us to implement classification regression dimensionality uh, reduction and many other machine learning algorithms we can implement using the sklearn or scikit-learn library so i'll run this and now the installation of the scikit-learn is done so i have already done it may take a while for you to get this so I'll run this PIP install scikit-learn to install the scikit-learn library. So it will take a while and it will get loaded. So this, these are the basic steps that you need to implement before data pre-processing. So these libraries and packages are the first thing that you have to load and install or download for working further with the data pre-processing task or creating algorithms. Then comes more libraries. So in sklearn, we have pre-processing, model selection, tree, ensemble, and metrics. So from sklearn library, we import the packages for pre-processing, uh, model selection, tree, ensemble, and metrics. So why we do that? Because we have to use label encoder, one hot encoder. Uh, we want to use min max scalar, normalizer, robust scalar. Then comes max absolute scalar. And then we used model selection thing for using k-fold, stratified k-fold, train test split, then cross validation score. After that comes the tree package for which we have to use decision tree classifier, random forest classifier, and then uh, voting classifier using the ensemble package of sklearn library. Then comes the metrics package of the scikit-learn library using which We'll evaluate or first we'll load F1 score, then confusion matrix and classification reports that help us to implement the functions for F1 score, calculating confusion matrix for accuracy and the classification report. So we'll use this from sklearn.preprocessing, import standard scalar, min max scalar, normalizer, robust scalar and for loading all these modules from the library, we'll use these commands so let me run this so 
it shows that it is successfully executed. So before moving ahead, let me explain you the standard scalar, min, max scalar. So all these, why we are actually using it. So starting with standard scalar, it actually removes the mean and scales each feature or variable to unit variance. And this operation is performed feature wise in an independent way. So standard scalar can be influenced by outliers. So the values lying uh, beyond the common slot of area where the actual values are lying. So it can be influenced by the outliers and it involves the estimation of the empirical mean and the standard deviation of each feature. So it scales it. So it helps the model to predict in a better way. Then comes min max scalar. So min max scalar uh, rescales the data set such that all the feature values are in the same range from 0 to 1. So actually there are too many values and it can have different values from 1 to any of the value. So we need to rescale the value in a common slot such that we can create a plot out of it and gets a better visualization. So min max scalar helps in this way. After that comes the normalizer. So the normalizer rescales the vector for each samples to have unit norm independently of the distribution of the samples. Now then comes the robust scalar. So unlike all the other scalars, the centering and scaling statistics of the scalar are based on percentiles and therefore uh, they are not influenced by a few number of very large marginal outliers. Then consequently, the resulting range of the transformed feature values is larger than for the previous scalars. And uh, one of the most important thing to note is that they are approximately similar. And for both features and for most of the transformed values, uh, they actually lie in a range of minus two to three. Now coming to max ABS scalar. So it differs from other uh, scalars and such that the absolute values that are mapped, they are in the range of zero to one. So they are the absolute values and on the positive and on the positive data, the scalar behaves similar to min max scalar and therefore uh, it can suffer from the presence of large outliers. Then comes the voting classifier. So, so the logic behind the voting classifier is so creating a separate dedicated model and finding the accuracy for each one of them. So we actually create a single model that is trained by the other models and predicts the output based on their combined majority of voting for each output class. So that is the logic behind the voting classifier and we'll use this voting classifier for our project. So I hope the importing of the libraries and packages is clear. Now we'll move ahead and we'll import class and we'll install the cat boost. So I'll click on it. So you have to use this command pip3 install cat boost as we'll be using the boosting algorithms such as xgboost, lightgbm and cat boost for preparing our model. So it will just take a while to load and I have actually uh, I have already loaded this and I have downloaded the packages related to cat boost. That is why it is showing requirement already satisfied. Then I'll import the XGBoost and use an attribute that is XGB for it. Then LightGBM and then CAD Boost. So I'll click on it. Uh, it is successfully executed. So why do we actually use XGBoost, LightGBM and CAD Boost? So XGBoost is a scalable and accurate implementation of gradient boosting machines and it has proven to push the limits of computing power for boosted trees that are used for implementing the algorithms for the sole purpose of checking the model's performance and improving the model's performance and the computational speed. So that is why we use XGBoost. So also XGBoost is used for supervised learning problems where we use the training data to predict a target variable. So that is why XGBoost is used for building the AI models. Then coming to LightGBM, that is a gradient boosting framework that uses tree based algorithms and it is designed to be distributed and efficient with the following advantages that is faster training speed and higher efficiency. Also it has support of parallel and GPU learning capable of handling large scale data. So that is why light 
GBM is used as a classifier. Then coming to CAD boost algorithm. So it is an algorithm for gradient boosting on decision trees. Just a quick info guys. Test your knowledge of computer vision by answering this question. Computers process data into information by working exclusively with which of the following? A. Multimedia B. Words C. Characters D. Numbers Comment your answer in the comment section below. Subscribe to Intellipad to know the right answer. Now, let's continue with the session. So, it is basically used for search, recommendation systems, personal assistant, self-driving cars, weather prediction and many other search tasks. So, one of the major benefit of using CAD Boost is it can handle missing values internally. Also, by default, CAD Boost uses one hot encoding for categorical features with a small amount of different values in most of the modes that we use. And so coming to one hot encoding, we use it for all the categorical features with a number of different values less than or equal to the given parameter value in a specific range. So we'll use all these algorithms for our AI project for building our model and I hope you are clear with the algorithms that we are using. So let me run this and you can see it is being successfully executed. Now I'll run this. That is from XGBoost we are importing X XGBoost classifier. So it is also successfully loaded. Now comes the data visualization libraries. So we will use matplotlib, seaborn and plotly package for the data visualization. So I'll run this. Okay. Now comes the randomness of the data that has been selected. So we'll use np.random.seed. So it is actually used to save the state of a random function so that it can generate same random numbers on multiple execution of the code on the same machine or it can be on different machine. So the seed value is the previous value number generated by the generator. So that is why we'll use this np.random.seed after that we have to set the location path from where we'll use the data set so we have already loaded the data set and you have to do it uh, again and again for the google colab if you are using google colab so now i have already imported os so it is just written over here from google colab import files then train pd.readcsv is used to load the data set i'll run this and let us see Okay, so it is being successfully executed. Now we'll display the uh, data set of train and test. So we use this display function to display the values. So I'll run this and it will display the training values and the testing values. So let me scroll down. So the first one is training value and the second one is the uh, test values the second one are the test values so this shows the index now employee id department region education gender recruitment channel then number of trainings age previous year training length of service kpi metrics that is greater than 80 and awards one average training score and is promoted so as we have already discussed the training data set and the KPI metrics should be greater than 80% to get the promotion. So here it is. Now let us check out the test data set. So again, this is, these are the index employee ID department region education, and it will not have the is promoted column because this is the testing data set that is these are the independent variables using which we have to predict whether the person has to be promoted or not that is the variable is promoted now further let me go to the exploratory data analysis that we have to perform so for this first we have to look into the information of the training set so for this we'll use train.info to display the information of the train data so let me implement this and now we get the training data along with it includes the non-null count and the data type also 
the count of the types of data type that is float 64 is one time for the corresponding column and it is previous year rating and integer is eight times and the object is five times also it shows the memory usage that is over here it is 5.9 plus mb so this shows the information related to train set and then let me display the information related to the test data so here it shows that there are 23,490 entries starting from 0 to 23489 and data columns total there are 13 columns and non-null count along with data type and the count of data type over here and the memory usage is 2.3 plus MB so this is the information regarding the test and the training data then comes displaying the descriptive statistics of train data so just talking about exploratory data analysis so it is a part of the data pre-processing where we actually gather the information related to the data so we check the info we check the description of the data such as the average the maximum and the minimum values along with the mean or the standard deviation the type of data memory usage and the non-null count and many other factors so we look into that in this data pre-processing step or you can say the EDA that is exploratory data analysis so let me run this train dot describe so it shows more information related to the training data set so it shows the count it shows the mean for all of these columns then comes the minimum value maximum value and the interquartile range now let me check the description about the test data so I'll run this that is test dot describe again it shows the count, the mean, the standard deviation, minimum and the maximum value and the IQR that is interquartile range. So this shows us the description of the train and the test data. Now further we will display the number of unique values and the actual values. So we have to first define a function, def for defining the function that is display unique and it will take the argument as data so here we have passed the argument of train data so display unique we have called the function now what does this function do so for column in data dot column that x is the columns present in the data set so we have to print the number of unique values in the column that is the column uh, corresponding to the train data set that we are accessing to then the columns are then using the str function data then column dot n unique it will fetch the unique values from the data set or from the column then the actual unique values in column so again now further to get the actual values so here we use uh, again the the str function and then the sort values function that sorts the data in the ascending order that because the ascending is set true over here so for getting the actual values we have to use this sort underscore values function and this na underscore position takes two strings input last or first to set the position of null values and accessing this unique function gives the unique values from the data set so it shows the number of unique values simply and using the sort values function we can access the actual values in the column so let me execute this and now here we get the output so number of unique values in employee id are 54808 so starting from one and it goes the list index so these are the actual values and then comes the number of values or unique values in department column that are 9 but the actual unique values in the department column are analytics, finance, HR, legal, operation, procurement, R&D, sales and marketing and technology. So the actual values are shown over here. So these are the actual values. So this is how we actually access the actual values using the sort underscore values and we can uh, keep descending also over here but we have 
kept ascending order so these are the actual and the unique values for all of the columns of the train data set so we can check it for test but we'll leave it for now and now we'll move on to displaying how each feature is related to the target variable in a flow so for this we will use a plot using the parallel categories diagram so the parallel categories diagram actually uh, it is also known as parallel sets and it is a diagram or you can say a visualization of multi-dimensional categorical data sets and each variable in the data set is represented by the column of rectangles where each rectangle corresponds to discrete value taken by that variable so here we pass in the columns so the columns uh, department, education, gender, previous year rating, KPI, metrics, then recruitment channel and is promoted and color is based on the is promoted column. Then we use the continuous uh, color scale. So using this sequential dot agrinal. So we plot the figure using multiple colors. So this figure dot show help us to show the figure. Now let me implement this and let us have a glance at the figure that we get. So it will just take a while to load till then you can just wait. Okay, this is the figure that we had. So this figure is very descriptive and it shows you the data. So let me show you how you can actually uh, read this figure and how actually you can understand the various uh, dependent or independent variables from this figure. So there are columns named department, then education, gender, previous year rating, KPI metrics, recruitment channel is promoted. So is promoted is shown over here. So it consists of the value as 0 to 1. So hence its scale is from 0 to 1. And then comes the individual categories of the columns. So in department, there are multiple departments such as sales and marketing. If you want to make a career in data science, then IntelliPath has IIT Madras Advanced Data Science and AI Certification Program. This course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts. Operations. So this section uh, is the operations one. So you can see when I have kept my pointer over here. So it shows the uh, relation actually the data uh, relation from other columns such as education, gender, previous rating, KPI metrics, recruitment channel and is promoted. So the count it shows is 11,348 that is there are 11,348 employees for the operations department. When I kept my mouse pointer for sales and marketing, it shows the count as 16,840. And then comes the count of this sales and marketing and then technology. So the count is, let me click on this. So the count is, you can see over here. So this shows the count as 7138. Then comes analytics that is 5352 R&D which is the least and then procurement, finance, HR and legal. Now coming to education. So when I kept the pointer over here, so it shows the count for the masters and above degree as 14,925. So here the category is written over here. Then when I came to this bachelor's, it shows the count as 36,669. Then coming to below secondary, it is 2409. And then uh, the final one is the below secondary one and this. So this last one is the below secondary one. That is 805. Now coming to gender, then the count is 16,312 and the count for the male uh, employees is 38,496. Now previous year rating starting from 5. So the employee who are having the rating as 5 are 11,741. Then 3 rating of 3 is 
eighteen employees are having a rating of three. Then one, it is six two two three. Then rating of four is of nine eight seven seven employees. After that, the rating of two is four two two five. Now the KPI metrics greater than eighty. So for one, that is the metric KPI metrics is greater than eighty. The count is nineteen thousand two hundred ninety one, and for the employees for whom the KPI metric is less than eighty percent are thirty five thousand five hundred seventeen. Now again the recruitment channel is sourcing other and referred. So for sourcing. It is the count is twenty three thousand two hundred twenty. Then for others, the count is thirty thousand four hundred forty six. Then for the referred one, it is eleven hundred forty two. That is the least. Now I'll come to the is underscore promoted column. So the count it gave it gives is fifty thousand one hundred forty people are not promoted. That is the value zero. And the promoted people's count is forty six hundred sixty eight. So you can see over here the structure of the figure. Now, for the next one, we will display. We will have a heat map. So we will display the correlation between the features through heat map and lighter color, higher correlation, and if close to one. So lighter. Color shows the high correlation. So for this, we use SNS dot heat map, and as we are making the heat map for the train data set, so we'll use this train dot c o r r for correlation, and this annotation or anot is true. So I'll run this, and we'll get the heat map. So here are the employee ID. So these are the Columns: Employee ID, number of training, age, previous year rating, length of service, KPI metrics greater than 80 percent, awards won, and then average training score is promoted. And this scale shows the is promoted thing, starting from zero and one. So the values are only zero and one. Now the x-axis of the figure. So it is not actually x-axis, but it is the other side uh, of this figure. So it has again employee ID, number of trainings, age, and pre previous year rating, length of service, KPI metrics, then awards won, and average training score, and is promoted. So a heat map is a two-dimensional graphical representation of data where the individual values that are contained in a matrix. Are represented as colors, and the Seaborn uh, library we have imported it for this purpose. And the Seaborn Python package allows the creation of annotated heat maps, and which can be tweaked using the Matplotlib tool as per the creator's requirement. So we are creating this for the correlation, finding the correlation. So this color shows us the correlation between all these parameters that we are evaluating. So this is the heat map that shows the people who are promoted, or not the people who are promoted, but the correlation between uh, these columns. Now let me go to the next part, which is finding the duplicate rows from the train data if it is present. So we have to check for duplicate rows to remove them. So so we will create a method that is remove duplicates that will. Have an argument of data, so in this we'll print before moving or before removing duplicates the number of rows, comma data dot shape. We'll give the argument as data dot shape. Then we have to implement the logic or the action that is data dot drop duplicates to drop the duplicates. Keep equal to first in place equal to true. And then again, we have to print after removing duplicate the number of rows. So again, the argument is data dot shape. So actually, this data dot shape returns the uh, data in the form of array. And then we'll return the check duplicates. And now I'll just implement this, run this, and 
now i'll call the remove underscore duplicate and give the data or the argument as train and now i'll click on this further after the successful execution of the code we'll get this before removing duplicates the number of rows are 54808 and after removing the duplicates the number of rows are again 54808 now it will return the check duplicates checked duplicates after that we'll handle the missing values so remember that still we are in the data pre-processing or the manipulation part so we have to deal with the missing values so missing values are present in the previous year rating and education columns in both train and the test data so here i have just written for the difference why is data missing in column previous year rating so data was not entered because those employees were pressure so as i have already told you when when we were discussing and when i explained you about the data set so data was not entered because those employees were pressures that is length of service is one is equal to one and they did not have the previous year rating so the no data would have been there in the data source itself for these employees so logically we are imputing with zero as freshers with one year experience and may not have previous year rating at all so filling the missing values in train and test data so what we'll do is we'll use this train data set and the test data set and in this bracket we'll give the column name that is previous year rating previous year rating and what we'll do is again to access the previous year rating so we are actually accessing the previous year rating and then we'll use this dot fill na with zero so it will fill those values with the zero so the next thing is we'll access the column of fresher for the train data set and then we'll use this previous year rating and apply function and then we'll use this lambda so here we'll put the condition so if x is equal to 0 is equal equal to 0 then the employee will be a fresher otherwise the employee is an experienced professional after that we'll display the fresher column with the value counts and again the previous year rating length of service and this fresher tag that we have used using the condition that is applied over here for marking the tag as a fresher again we'll use this display function to display this previous year rating length of service then fresher for the first 25 values for and for this we'll use this head function now i'll run this and here we get the output so these are the columns and they are replaced by the values as 0 1 fresher so this is the fresher column and this is the fresher tag that we have uh, displayed using the display function and putting the condition over here so the experienced professionals are 50684 and the freshers are 4124 and the data type is integer again so we have used uh, the previous year rating length of service and the fresher column for displaying the data now again we have displayed the data for previous year rating length of service and this tag i should have changed it to experienced so okay so i have put a condition over here so let me go to that one okay so here if x is equal to 0 then it will be a fresher otherwise experienced so that is why it is showing data over here for experienced as well as for fresher and the length of service previous year rating so this is actually about the removal of the missing values and sorting out the uh, missing values that were there in the data set so we actually saw some empty uh, blocks in the data set so we filled in with the values as zero so for that we used fill na and fill with zero so this is done now next what we'll do is we'll display the missing values in the train and test data so to display that we'll use this display 
function and this uh, will give the text as train corresponding to the missing values in train set so we'll use this train dot is null dot sum so is null for counting the uh, for getting the null values and sum function to sum all those and to display it we'll use this display function same for the test so I'll run this so for training set so this is employee ID department region education gender recruitment channel so for all other columns the null values so there are no null values there are zero null values but for education there are 2409 null values present and for the test column the employee ID department region and all other columns are not having any null values the count is or the sum of those null values is zero the count is zero and for the education it is 1034 so as the test data set is less than the training data set so it is showing less so we have counted the null values over here so now after executing this let us handle the null values so for this we'll use f fill b fill so I have written this for a reference so you can read this so talking about f fill so this is forward fill that fills the missing values with previous row value and if previous row value is null then it moves to the next element without filling that is why you we use f fill and b fill both so what does b fill do is so it was it is backward fill that fills the missing values with next row value and if the next row value is null so it moves to the next element without filling so what actually happens is uh, for example for just explaining you if the system goes to fourth and fifth row and the fourth one is empty then it iterates to the fifth row and fills the data of the fifth row into the fourth row so this is actually the backward fill and in forward fill what happens is it fills the missing value with the previous row value for example if fourth row is having a data and fifth row is empty the data is not present then the value present in the fourth row will be added for the fifth row data so we use both forward fill and the backward fill to fill in the data also filling with more than new category called others are most commonly used technique which didn't work here so we are not using that so we can assume that while collecting data relevant members data were collected close to one another so it is not too fluctuating uh, that means so talking about the training now we'll fill in the values for the education column so here we have used this train inside it we have given the argument inside the square brackets as education then we'll use this dot f fill for forward fill and we'll just a quick info guys test your knowledge of computer vision by answering this question a string of eight zeros and ones is called what a megabyte b byte c kilobyte d gigabyte comment your answer in the comment section below Subscribe to IntelliPad to know the right answer. Now, let's continue with the session. We give the argument in this way that is access is equal to zero for all of the train and the test data. And finally, we display the data and we try to uh, actually calculate the sum of all the null values that are present in the training data set and the test data set using the is null and sum function. So, I'll run this and let us see the output so it will just take a while to load so here we get the output for the train and the test data set so employee id department region education gender so you can see over here so we have implemented it on the education column by using the forward fill and backward fill so the count has come down to zero for the education column now after this we'll work on feature engineering 
so based on the age distribution most of the employees are in the range 20 to 40 who will be also waiting for a promotion and so we have created two bins 20 to 29 29 to 39 and remaining one bin for 39 to 49 so we have used test plot so plot a univariate distribution for the observations so i have written this for the reference so that you can refer it in future if you have any doubt and all so you can see the description of this okay so moving ahead we'll use this sns dot test plot and we'll give the train as the data and this age column and after that we'll use this train and inside this square brackets we'll give the age we'll use this pd dot cut and give in the argument as train and the age column so the train data set along with the age column or for the age column and bins will be 20 29 39 49 and labels that would be given to this bins are 20 30 40 same for the test one for age column pd dot cut bins will be 20 29 39 49 and the labels will be given as 20 30 and 40 so let me run this and now we'll get the plot like this so feature engineering is nothing but extracting the feature or the properties from the data set and the expertise and the knowledge that we have so this is the plot that we have after plotting the age column now after this we'll split the train data into predictors and the target that is independent and dependent variables so this is the step that we have to do before creating our model so here we'll split train into x underscore train that is features and y underscore train that is target so in x train we'll select all of the columns that is department region education gender recruitment channel number of trainings age previous year rating length of service kpis metric that is greater than 80 percent awards one and average training score and in this y train will select the is promoted column that is the separate column that we have to predict using the test data set so we will add this in the y train section and then we'll convert the y train into a frame using two underscore frame because it is a single parameter and the output is expected to be in data frame so we'll use this to convert it to a frame now comes the x test so we'll use this x underscore test and inside it we'll give the argument or the number of columns that is department region education gender till average training score so now we have successfully splitted the train and the test data so after running it so it has no error that is it has been successfully executed now as we have splitted our data set into train and test now we'll perform the data encoding using the label encoding and the one hot encoding so what does it actually mean to perform these operations so actually label encoding refers to the converting of the labels into numeric form so so that to convert it into the machine readable form and the machine learning algorithms or the AI algorithms that we are using for building our AI based application can then decide in a better way on how those lab labels must be operated and using one hot encoding allows the representation of categorical data to be more expressive and many or the various machine learning algorithms cannot work with categorical data directly so uh, the categories must be converted into numbers so this is required for both input and output variables that are categorical so we use one hot encoding for that so we'll define a function that is data encoding and given the parameters or uh, the arguments that is encoding strategy encoding data and encoding columns so let me go down and check where I have called this okay encoding data encoding so I'll check where I have called this function so this is data encoding 
have called over here then encoding strategy and then the data then the columns that we have to give now I'll go back over here now what does this function do so if encoding strategy is label encoding then we have to print if label encoding and the encoder we have to put in the label encoder because we are using label encoder and then we will put a for loop over here so for column in the encoding columns we have to print column then encoding data and in this encoding data the column uh, will be inserted and then this function has to be executed so encoder.fit transform and then the argument must be given so tuple encoding data again we'll use the column as the argument after that if this is not true then we put in elif condition where encoding strategy is equal equal to one hot encoding so if this is the scenario then we have to print elif one hot encoding and then encoding data we'll use pd dot get dummies for encoding data so this is this pd is the instance of the pandas library and this get dummies will give us the categorical values the dummy categorical values and after that comes the dtype list that we have to define for float 64 float 32 and 64 and 32 for the data type so this is the data types list then encoding data as type will use and then data types list and then will access the data types so after implementing if elif these two lines of code will be implemented which shows the data type and then return encoding data so using these condition will implement the data encoding technique so here for description i have added this code and many points related to it so let me read it for you so applied one hot encoding it will be applied to object categorical columns only and it's most common to one hot encode these objects columns since they can't be plugged directly into most models then pandas offers a convenient function called get dummies to get one hot encodings so using this get dummies we get a dummy uh, variable or a dummy value uh, for the categorical uh, or for the encoded values so get this using get dummies and many machine learning algorithms cannot operate on labeled data directly then they require all the input variables and output variables to be numeric this means that categorical data must be converted to a numerical form and a one hot encoding can be applied to the integer representation finally this is where the integer encoded variable is removed and a new binary variable is added for each unique integer value so you can go through this description for the reference so I'll run this so it has been successfully executed and you will get the result in the next code when we'll implement it so just for reference or example I have added the data encoding for this color that is a red blue green red blue green and I have defined I have created this df as the data frame and then pd dot data frame i have given the data over here columns as color then i'll print before one hot encoding and call the function as display df and then i'll print after one hot encoding and display pd dot get dummies so for the first one so we get the result as before one hot encoding it is displaying the data frame and in the second one we get the result after one hot encoding so i'll run this in one go so let me explain this one also so encoding columns encoding strategy so i'll go in this code so we have created a function data encoding and the parameters are encoding strategy encoding data encoding columns so over here are encoding columns encoding strategy so encoding strategy is label encoding one hot encoding and the encoding columns are region age department education gender and recruitment channel that we have to encode so while implementing this we have to just give 
in the index so here I have called the data encoding uh, function that we have defined earlier so x train encode x test encode and we have called data encoding and data encoding strategy encoding strategy so index is one and the data is x train and encoding columns so it will take the entire column so all of the columns and then the second one is encoding strategy x test on x test and encoding columns so it will take all the columns then for displaying the encoded train and test features we'll use the display function and we'll display the first uh, few values using the head function so x train encode x test encode so let me run this and the first one gives the color data frame that is red blue green red blue blue so these are encoded in 0 1 2 3 4 5 so we have performed one hot encoding and after performing one hot encoding we get the following results that is color blue color green color red so these three are the colors red blue green and these are the indexes and the encoding that is done is so this is the data frame so we have converted it into a data frame that is why it is showing a data frame over here so color blue color green color red so this is the and these are the encoded values for it now let me go up and let me check so this was the color part and then we define the encoding strategy then we have called a uh, data encoding two times for train and test and it is showing one hot encoding one hot encoding so it has performed one hot encoding so why it has performed because the index that we have given over here is one so here it is zero label encoding is zero having an index of zero and one hot encoding is at the index position one so one hot encoding will be performed so for performing one hot encoding first it will print lf one hot encoding that shows that it is performing this type of encoding and then it has performed the one hot encoding using the pd dot get dummies so it is displayed over here so these are the result for the encoded rows the columns that are over here so you can check it out the encoded values so we have encoded it for region and then it shows various region and the values then for gender recruitment channel and so on after that after the encoding has been performed so our data is encoded and now we have to perform scaling so we have already discussed about the scaling types that is robust scalar standard scalar min max scalar and max abs scalar so i have told you about these type of scalars so we will directly create a function so using this data underscore scaling and we'll give the argument name as scaling strategy scaling data scaling columns and we'll give in the condition as if scaling strategy is robust scalar then the scaling data will be and inside this square brackets we'll give the scaling columns that we need to scale and then we'll use the robust scalar dot fit transform to scale the values using the robust scalar and then the scaling data which we have used and we have passed in the argument and the scaling columns that we need to scale same with the standard scalar so we'll give in the condition as lf so scaling strategy if scaling strategy is equal equal to standard scalar then we have to uh, use this standard scalar dot fit transform and again the scaling data along with the scaling columns or you can say the corresponding scaling columns that we have to uh, put in over here after that again lf scaling strategy is equal equal to min max scalar now same with the min max scalar and max abs scalar so scaling data then scaling columns then again using the fit underscore transform method and given in the parameter uh, as scaling data 
with the corresponding scaling columns that we need to scale. And final else condition consists of uh, the robust scaler. So if any other scaling sent by mistake, it still performs the robust scaler. So we'll use the same line of code that we used for robust scaler, that is scaling data, corresponding columns, and then robust scaler function dot fit underscore transform. And finally, we'll return the scaling data. So I'll run this and let's check. Okay, so it has been successfully executed. Now the next one is where we will call the data scaling function or the method. So this is the data scaling method that we have created over here. So this is the uh, description that I have given for reference. So let me read for you. So robust scaler is better in handling outliers. So standardization of a data set is a common requirement for many machine learning estimators. And typically this is done by removing the mean and the scaling to unit variance. And the outliers can often influence the sample mean variance in a negative way. So in such cases, robust scalar, which uses the median and the interquartile range often give better results. So here we have defined the scaling strategy. So that is robust scalar, standard scalar, min max scalar and max ABS scalar. Now we'll use this X train scale and X test scale as the variable or the instance and we'll store the values after calling this method that is data scaling will pass the argument as scaling strategy that will be zero in the first one and zero in the second one. So zero indicates that it is calling the robust scalar. So we have created the scaling strategy and we can call any one of this. So we have called the robust scalar. Then here we have given the X train encode and then X train encode columns. So what it actually shows is we are scaling the encoded values of train and the test data set that we have encoded uh, in, in the previous steps. Okay, then we'll display this X train scaled value and first few values of it for the train and for the test. So it should be test over here. Now let me run this. And let us see what we get as the output. So this is the number of training previous year, length of service, KPI metrics, award one, every training department. So now we have successfully scaled the values using the robust scaler. So what actually is robust scaler doing over here? So you already know. So it is handling the outliers and it is making the model more accurate and helping us to create such a model to give more precise results. So this is done. Now comes the most important step that is creating baseline ML model for binary classification problem. So we will use some machine learning algorithms and you can also say that AI algorithms. So we have already looked around it earlier that is XGB classifier then cat boost light GBM. So here we will create a dictionary that is key value pairs for ML model name and then ML model functions with hyper parameters. So these are the hyper parameters. So we'll given the name as classifier and at the zeroth index we will give the XG boost. First will be cat boost. Second will be light GBM. So using this XGB classifier, we'll define the hyperparameters that is learning rate, N estimators, max depth, subsample, verbosity, scale, position weight, update base score. So the learning rate over here is 0 0.1. The number of estimators are 494. Maximum depth is 5. Subsample is 0 0.7 that is 70%. Then verbosity is 0. So what actually verbosity is? So verbosity in keyword uh, it arguments and it usually means that showing more wordy information for the task. So actually giving the more description. Then the scale position weight that is 2.5. Updater is grow 
hist make up then base score is 0.2 so we'll see the uh, plot uh, which will be plotted then it will be same for the cat boost classifier learning rate number of estimators subsample max depth then for light gbm the the importance type come in for extra then verbosity is minus 1 so you can see over here the verbosity is minus 1 here it is 1 or 0 sorry so here it is 0 here it is 1 so the more is the verbosity the more wordy or the descriptive is the model uh, or you can see it is more adaptive and it shows the more information so here it is minus 1 so it is low then maximum number of bin is 60 number of leaves 300 boosting type is dart learning rate is 0 0.15 number of estimators are again 494 max depth and other things are same as the cat boost and xg boost now after creating a dictionary after creating baseline ml model for the binary classification we'll print so we have to use this list then classifiers dot keys and classifiers dot values for it so after implementing it let us see what we get as the result so xg boost cat boost light gbm and this is what we get now our model is created and there are so many uh, parameters to evaluate it so base score booster column sample by level and so many others but we need to improve our model as no model is perfect in AI or machine learning so what we'll do is we have to improve the machine learning or the AI model so as we have uh, used this uh, machine learning algorithms so it is same for AI also so I have written over here the ML model so to improve the ML model with voting classifier with model evaluation metric we'll use this f1 and predict target for s promoter so we'll evaluate the f1 score so actually what voting classifier is we have already discussed in the previous section while importing the libraries modules and packages for the voting classifier so we'll use the instance or the variable as voting model second argument will be then list classifiers dot value to fetch the values and for zeroth index is the one for xg boost and the one or the first index is for cat boost then light gbm then we have given over here as soft voting and the weights are given over here 5 5.2 uh, 5 5 and 5.2 so actually in soft voting the output class is the prediction based on the average of the probability given to that class and you can consider an example suppose you are given with some input for the three models and the prediction probability for class 1 and class 2 so if the probabilities are 0 0.1 0 0.2 0 0.3 and for the next one it is 0 0.2 0 0.3 0 0.4 so obviously the average of the second class is greater so the winner is the second one so this is the soft voting that we call in machine learning so it is given over here so then we'll use this voting model that we have created and use this fit method and inside it will give the parameters as x train scale for the scaled values that we have uh, created in the data uh, engineering process and we'll give in the y train for training the model then we'll evaluate the predictions of the voting using the voting model that we have just now created dot predict probability and we'll give the x test scale for checking the performance of the model on the basis of test data set so we'll take the entire test data set so let me run this and it will just take a while to get executed so now get the output so you can see over here so the learning rate and the total time re remaining time 
so you can see it is still executing now again it will take time so let me tell you the next part that we'll implement so next we'll work on the result we'll see the result and try to improve the f1 score so for this we'll okay it has completely executed we see the values so it took a total of 10.4 seconds to predict the outcome or to learn the features of it then the next part that I was talking about is the result and the improving of F1 score so for this we have to round off the probability results and for this we'll simply use an instance as prediction and we'll give in the round function and before it we'll use the integer that converts it to the integer and then we'll have a for loop so for value in predictions of voting that we have just now implemented for the voting model or the voting classifier so predictions of voting will be counted over here and then we'll create a data frame table for uh, this result and we'll store it in the result promoted section so we'll use this pd.data frame and we'll give in the uh, employee id and is promoted and it will have the predictions and the test set of the employee id then this thing you need not to take care of these are again the classifiers and then you, you have to print list classifiers keys over here so this will be same as previously we have used the classifiers over here so this is the same thing now let me implement it and let us see the results so list of classifiers so xgboost catboost and light gbm now next we'll print result promoted so i'll type in print then result and now i'll run this and you can see employee id and s promoted so these are all the ids of the employees who are being promoted so here you can see that the id number 5973 so employee corresponding to this id has been promoted so this is how we implement it and get the result using the round of probability now next we have used the classifiers that is classifier 1 classifier 2 classifier 3 for xg boost then light gbm and cat boost so we are fetching the values and the index as same we have used 0 1 2 and then we have used the array from the numpy library and given the index over here and then finally use the voting classifiers and we have given the estimators as xg boost cat boost and then LGBM for classifier 1, classifier 2 and classifier 3 represented by CLF 1, 2 and 3. Then voting again is soft. Then we will predict the class probabilities for all the classifiers using the predict underscore prob function and giving in the argument as X and using the classifiers for the XGBoost, CatBoost and Light GBM, along with the voting classifier that we have built over here. So all this we are using for predicting the probability. Now to get the class probabilities for the first sample in the dataset, we'll create two classes and then we'll create a 2D array and if you want to make a career in data science, then IntelliPath has IIT Madras Advanced Data Science and AI Certification Program. This course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts. Put a for loop where we'll use the Probus instance that we have used for predicting the probability for the model using various classifiers. So these two has been created 
and now we'll plot what we have created or what model we have created so we'll plot so we'll use n equal to 4 that is number of groups then ind instance for np dot arrange so arranging these groups and these are the group positions and width will be 0 0.35 that is bar width then we'll use figure and ax as the instance for the subplots so we'll use the uh, plotly package so plt dot subplots is the function that we have to use just a quick info guys test your knowledge of computer vision by answering this question computers process data into information by working exclusively with which of the following a multimedia b words c characters D numbers. Comment your answer in the comment section below. Subscribe to Intellipad to know the right answer. Now let's continue with the session. And then bars for classifiers 1, 2, 3 and bars for voting classifiers. So for classifiers 1, 2, 3, we'll use the instance of P1 and P2 and use this ax.bar function where ax is the instance and bar is the function taking the parameter as ind that is the group's position in np dot h stack that that takes the class probabilities that we have created and the index minus one shows that it is taking all the values then the width is 0 0.35 then color h color and same for the second one that is p2 where we will use the second class that we have created and for the bars for voting classifier we will use the p3 p4 instance we will create it and ax.bar where bar is the function that we are using and ax is again the instance and here the parameters are quite different that is ind is same but here we are giving 0 0 0 so instead of h stacks that is np dot h stack we just given the values as triple zero because it is a voting classifier and we cannot use h stack in it for this scenario so the color is quite different and now we'll set the plot annotations using the axv line so it takes the argument as the value 2.8 color equal to k line style equal to dashed and then ax dot set underscore x ticks with ind plus width so it is a mat plot lip function that ticks when the values are true and a minor tick when the values are false then set the x tick labels for xg boost cat boost light gbm voting classifier and the rotation will be 40 and now we'll give the y limit that is 0 to 1 plot title that is class probabilities for sample 1 by different classifiers then then plt dot legend that creates a legend for any uh, plot so for p1 and p2 and the values given over here is promoted no and is promoted yes then location is upper right then plt dot tight layout that helps to automatically adjust the subplot parameters according to the padding then finally we'll use this plt dot show to show the plot now let me run this so this is the final step of building our AI model and optimizing it using various feature engineering processes classifiers and encoders so this is the class probabilities for sample 1 by different classifiers so here the dark green color shows the people who are not promoted and the light green color shows the people who are being promoted and this is the voting classifier and its average probabilities so this is the visualization of the probabilities for 
the employees who are being promoted and who are not promoted but the actual values we already saw using these classifiers over here so there are 23490 records of two columns consisting of employee id as it is unique so it shows the corresponding id and the promotion status of the employees so i'll just go up so here we have created the model and we saw that the model took 10.4 seconds and this is the learning of the model we have created the model using the voting classifiers and XGBoost, CatBoost, LightGBM, Gradient Boosting uh, or Extreme Gradient Boosting instead of that and after that we have the results and we worked on improving it then we get the result of promoted and finally we have visualized using the plot our results so this visualization of the data is just for our understanding but how actually is the code implemented using the algorithms in real time is by integrating it using other softwares so company will not use this code directly so what they will do is they will create the model using the code that we have built and then what they will do is they might have another application that shows the information of the employees and their various parameters such as age and other things that we saw let me go to that section where we have uh, looked around the data so employee id number of training age previous year rating so they might have an application that show the data so there they can add a feature that predicting the promotion and whenever they click on that so this code is added in the back end so before it shows the prediction of the employees or before it shows the list of the employees this code is being implemented and the results are shown on the interface so this is how artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithms helps the company to resolve the issue for their various business problems so here it is the status of the promotion whether the employee has to be promoted or not so it is not about this problem there are many real life business problems that can be resolved using artificial intelligence and machine learning so these algorithms and these methods are added in the pipeline of a static software or an application and it gives the output and the result that is the best prediction according to the analysis using the algorithm along with using the data set that is being provided by the organization and it makes that software or the application as AI based application. So this is how we implement various scenarios using artificial intelligence. So now let's discuss some of the techniques that we can use to solve the first type of challenge that is unbalanced data. So here you will find that most of the cases in a data set most of the transactions will be legitimate transactions and very less transactions will be fraudulent transactions. So if you train your classifier model on this so your classifier will tend to favor the majority class that is your legitimate transactions so which results in large classification error over the fraud cases since it has not learned much because of the less data available to it so the classifiers actually learn better when it is trained on a balanced distribution rather than an unbalanced data so now we'll discuss sampling methods to solve this unbalanced data problem so we always perform the sampling methods on the training set on the not on the test set so we'll always divide our data set into two sets that is our training and test sets so we'll build our model on the training set and before building the model we'll balance the training set so that our model learns on the training set and then we'll use the original test set which is the unbalanced test set to predict whether the, a transaction is fraudulent or legitimate so the first technique is called the random oversampling technique so in this technique we oversample the minority class which is our fraud cases so we copy the cases that are already present in our fraudulent cases 
so we'll just copy the same cases multiple times till we reach a particular threshold or the value of the cases that we want in our data set and the other techniques that we can use is the random under sampling so in this technique we under sample the majority class which is our legitimate cases so we remove some of the cases that are present in our data set which are from the legitimate transactions so we'll remove some of those cases and then we'll downgrade some of those cases till we have a data set that has an equal distribution or an almost equal distribution of both the fraudulent and the legitimate cases or we can do both so either we can up sample or we can down sample so now let's discuss some of the techniques that we can use to solve the first step of challenge that is our unbalanced data so you'll find that most of the data sets have most of the transactions as legitimate and very few transactions as fraudulent so if you train your classifier model on this particular data set so our classifier will tend to favor the majority class that is the legitimate cases so which results in the large classification error over the fraud cases since it has not learned much from the fraudulent data because the late data that was available to it was very few so now let us discuss some of the techniques that we can use to solve the first step of challenge that is our unbalanced data so you'll find that in most of the data sets or legitimate cases they are outnumbered so now let's discuss some of the techniques that we can use to solve the first type of challenge that is our unbalanced data so you'll find that in most of the data sets most of the transactions are legitimate transactions and there are very few transactions which are fraud transactions so if you perform a classification model on top of this data set your classifier will tend to favor the majority class that is our legitimate cases so which means that it will show a huge classification error over the fraud cases so classifiers actually learn better from a balanced distribution so if you train or model on a balanced distribution it is more likely that we have a less classification error for our fraud cases and it will be easily available to us so now let's discuss some of the techniques that we can use to solve the first step of challenge that is our unbalanced data so you'll find that in most of the data sets most of the transactions are actually legitimate transactions and very less transactions are fraud transactions so if you create your machine learning model on this type of data set your classifier will tend to favor the majority class which is your legitimate transactions and which will result in large classification error over the fraud cases so our classifiers or our machine learning models they learn better from a balanced distribution where the balance of the two classes that is legitimate and fraud can be equal so now let's discuss some of the methods that we can use to solve the first step of challenge that is our unbalanced data set so you'll find that most of the data sets they have large number of legitimate cases and very few fraudulent cases since in credit card transactions less than 0.5% of the transactions are fraudulent so our classifier or our machine learning model will tend to favor the majority class that is our legitimate cases so which means that it will show a large classification error over the fraud cases we will not be able to identify which case is fraud or not so our classifiers actually learn better from a balanced distribution instead of an unbalanced data so now let us discuss different sampling methods used to balance an unbalanced data set so the first technique is called the random oversampling so in random oversampling we increase the number of fraud transactions in the data set by creating duplicates of the already present fraud cases and the next technique is called the random undersampling so in random undersampling we decrease the number of legitimate cases to get a balanced distribution and also we can perform both random oversampling and random undersampling by increasing the number of fraud cases and decreasing the number of legitimate cases so now this is how our data set will look like after performing both the oversampling and the undersampling but the problem with oversampling is that it is done by creating duplicates of the fraud cases that are already present in our data set so that means that we will be training our model using a lot of duplicate values which won't explain the variance in the data and the problem with undersampling is that we end up throwing away a lot of useful data and information which is not preferred in general so that brings us to our next sampling technique which is called the synthetic minority oversampling technique aka smot so in this technique we oversample the fraud cases by creating synthetic fraud cases so if you look at this scatter plot at the right hand side the green dots here represent the legitimate cases and the red dots here represent the fraud cases so in smot we find the k nearest neighbor of a fraud case let's say x here and let's take the value of k as 3 so we'll find the three nearest neighbors of x and after choosing the nearest neighbors we'll randomly choose one of the x's nearest neighbors let's say y here and then we add a synthetic sample using the following method so we'll take the x and the y coordinate of both the points and find the x and the y coordinate of a synthetic point which is given as follows 
so the synthetic point will lie on the line that joins both x and y and here the number 0 0.3 it is a random number between 0 and 1 so we can use different numbers between 0 and 1 so that we get different synthetic samples that are present on the line that joins x and y and we can also repeat this step multiple times for each neighbor of x which is a fraudulent case to get a desired value of the fraud cases in our data set and hence we'll get a balanced data set after all so now let's go to R studio to implement credit card fraud detection model using SMOT. So now let's build a fraud detection model in R. So first of all, we'll import the data set that we are going to work on. So I've stored my data set in this particular folder. So once I load this data set using the read.csv function and I'll store the data set in credit underscore card data frame. So if I run this line, your data set will be imported. And after importing the data set, we'll look at how our data set looks like. So after your dataset is imported, you can click on the dataset name in the variable explorer. And once you click on the name, you'll find that our dataset contains 284807 entries, that is rows and around 31 columns. So this dataset is about different transactions made by different credit card users. And the first column here you can see is the time. So this is the timestamp. And then we have columns from V1 to V. 28 so these columns are actually the reduced versions using the dimensionality reduction so the actual data set contains the actual columns which the data set does not contain so these are actually the reduced versions using the pca so that the confidentiality of the users is maintained so these are different features that are extracted from the actual features using the dimensionality reduction so after the 28th column or the 29th column we have the amount column that represents the amount of transaction that was done using this particular credit card and then the last column here you can see is the class column which contains two values that is zero or one so zero here represents that the transaction was a legitimate transaction and one represents that the transaction was a fraud transaction so after that let's look at this structure of the data set and see what are the different types of variables that we have in our data set so if you use the if you use the structure function and write the name of your data set that is credit card so you'll see we have around 31 variables that is columns and most of the variables are numerical columns and the last column here you can see is class which is also an integer column but in actual it is not an integer column it is a categorical column it has two categories that is 0 and 1 and 0 here represents the legitimate transactions and 1 represents the fraud transactions so first of all we will convert our class column to a factor column two levels that is 0 and 1 so that we can work with our data set later on so we will convert this to a factor column using the factor function and then pass the name of the variable that is credit card dollar sign class and then we have two levels that is 0 and 1 0 for legitimate cases and 1 for fraud cases so we'll again store it in the same variable that is credit card dollar sign class so once you run this function if, and if you now look at the structure of the data set so you'll see now our class column is a factor column with two factors that is 0 and 1 0 here represents the legitimate transactions and 1 represents the fraud transactions so now let's look at the summary of the data set to display the summary statistics of different columns so here you can see the last column is a class column so here around 284315 entries are legitimate cases that is 0 and only 492 entries are your fraud cases that is 1 and then we have most of the columns are integer columns with mean of 0 and the first column is our timestamp so now before moving ahead now let's check whether there are any missing values in our data set or not so we'll use the is.na function to check whether there are any missing values in our data set or not and then the sum function will count the number of missing values if there are any so once we run this function we will see that we don't have any missing values in the, in the data set so it is ok for us to continue and work with our data set so now we have to use the class column so first of all let's see how many fraudulent and legitimate transactions are actually there in our data set so we'll use the we'll get the distribution of fraud and legitimate cases or legitimate transaction in the data set we'll use the table function and inside the table function we'll write the variable that we want the distribution for so our variables or the transactions are stored in class variable in our credit card data set so we'll use the table function to get the distribution of different transactions so here, after running this command here you can clearly see that zero represents the legitimate transactions and most of the transactions in this data set are legitimate transactions so there are around 284315 legitimate transactions and only 492 fraud transactions and if you want to get the percentage of home the transactions you can use the prop table function and then inside the prop table function you can write the table function which will get you the distributions and the prop table function will get you uh, the percentages of the distribution 
so here you can see that 99% of the more than 99.82% of the transactions in this data set are legitimate transactions and only 0.001% transactions are fraud transactions so clearly we can see this is an imbalanced data set so now let's also plot a pie chart to get the distributions of our legitimate and fraud cases in our data set so we'll firstly set the labels of our pie chart so the labels are legit and fraud so we'll create a vector that contains two strings that is legit and fraud and we'll store that in labels and after that we'll paste or we'll concatenate the percentages of your fraudulent cases and legitimate cases with the respective labels so if you pass two vectors in the paste function so first we'll use the paste function to concatenate two strings so we'll first vector that we have passed is the labels which contains two values legit and fraud and then we'll pass the round function so this function will actually calculate the percentages of the distributions so we'll calculate the percentages of the prop table that we have just seen above which will display this particular result and we'll multiply it by 100 to get the percentage and then we'll round uh, this percentage to two digits so we'll only get two digits after the point so we'll use the round function which will contain our percentages up to two digits of decimal and then we'll have the labels uh, which contains your two strings that is legit and fraud and we'll paste it together and we'll store the result in labels so if you run this command and i look at the labels right now so now your labels actually look like this we have a 99.83 percent so here we have rounded the values up to two decimals using the round function here and the fraud cases are 0 0.1 percent and legit cases are 99.83 percent so clearly we can see there is an imbalance in our data set so let's plot a pie chart first of all to get the distribution or display the distributions of our legitimate and fraud cases so we use the default pi function from the default r package and we want a pi chart for the different distributions of the or the different categories of the class variable in our credit card data set and we will we'll use the table function to get the different distributions of the categories and our labels will be equal to these labels and then the color of the labels will be according to the orange and the red so the orange will represent the number of legitimate cases and the red represents the number of fraud cases and then this is the title of our pi plot so our title will be pi chart of credit card transactions so let's run this command to get a pi plot so this is our pie chart for our credit card transactions and here you can see most of the color is orange it means we have around 99.83 percent of the legitimate transactions and only 0.17 percent are fraud transactions so now if you make a model on this particular data so you will get most of the accuracy so we'll first of all make a model that is no model so even if you don't have any particular machine learning model and if you predict that every single transaction in this data set is a legitimate transaction so you can see what kind of accuracy we'll get so first of all we'll predict that all the transactions in this data set are legitimate transactions so we'll store our predictions in predictions variable and we'll repeat integer 0 equal to the number of rows that are present in our credit card data set so in our credit card data set we have around 284807 rows so we'll create a vector that will contain zeros 284807 times so after creating a vector we'll convert this vector to a factor variable with two levels that is 0 and 1 here 0 represents the legitimate transactions and 1 represents the fraud transactions so we are predicting without using any model that all the transactions are legitimate transactions so once you run this command we'll factor out or we'll convert this particular vector to a factor with two levels that is our legitimate transactions and fraud transactions 0 and 1 so after that we'll use the confusion matrix to get the accuracy for this particular uh, predictions or that we have done without using any particular model so we'll use the carrot package so if you have not installed this package you can use the install.packages command and write the name of your package to install it and then after the inst after installing the package you can load the package using the library function and once you run this command your package will be loaded and then you can use the confusion matrix function from the carrot package to Get the confusion matrix and the accuracy and if you want to know more about this particular function you can press f1 here so it will take you to the documentation on the right hand side and then you can know more about this particular function so in this function we'll firstly pass the or predictions that we have stored in predictions variable as data and then we have our reference variable which will contains the actual classes that we have predicted so we have predicted the classes of the credit card data set so we'll pass our reference variable or the actual classes that we have predicted so once we run this command we'll get the confusion matrix for this particular model that we have built without, without using any machine learning model so here you can clearly see that we have correctly classified all the samples that were all the transactions that were 
legitimate transactions but we have not classified any of the transactions that were that was a fraudulent transaction so still we get an accuracy of 99.83 percent because we have flagged every transaction as a legitimate transaction and we have not flagged all the fraud transactions as fraud transactions so this will be your true positives and this will be your true negatives which are the correctly classified values so our true positives are total and our true negatives are zero it means we have wrongly classified all the samples that were fraudulent transactions here your zero represents legitimate transactions and one represents your fraud transactions so out of the fraud transactions out of all the fraud transactions we have flagged all the transactions as legitimate transactions which are false positives so here you can clearly see that if you only check the accuracy of the model that we build so we will be wrong most of the times because because here accuracy does not represent anything here our goal is to maximize the number of cases or maximize the true negative so that we can classify most of the fraud transactions as fraud transactions so now let's move ahead and build a model so before moving ahead we will take a small subset of our data set so that it is computationally more faster and later on once you have built a model on the smaller subset that you can make then you can make the model on the whole data set which will take some time so we will take a smaller version of the data set so that we can compute it faster so we will use uh, the dplyr package to get a small fraction of our whole data set that is credit card so I'll load the dplyr package first of all so after loading the dplyr package I'll use the sample fraction function sample fract function to get the fraction of our data set which will be random fraction so it will contain both zeros and ones and I'll pass my credit card data set using uh, the forward pipe operator which will pass my credit card data set to the sample frac function which will extract 0.1 percent that is 10 percent of the samples or 10% of the rows that are present in our data set. So right now our data set contains 284807. So after extracting 10% of the rows it will be 28480 rows. And we will store the result in our credit card data frame again. And we have used the set seed function. So if you run uh, this particular code again. So we will get the same sample again. And if you don't use the set seed function. And you run this code again and again. So your sample will be different every time. So we will run these two lines together. And we will get a sample. That will be 10% of all the rows that are present in our actual data set. So now let's look at the data set. Uh, that is a fraction. That is a subset of our original data set. So we have around 28,481 rows. And all the columns. So this is a 10% of data set. And then we will make a model on this particular data. And after building a model later on. We can build the model on whole data set. So now let's see what is the distribution of classes that we have in this particular data. So right now we have around 28,437 transactions as legitimate transactions and only 44 transactions as illegitimate or fraud transactions. And now let's plot a scatter plot between the two columns that is V1 and V2. So we'll plot a scatter plot between the columns V1 and V2 and we'll see what is the distribution of classes between these two variables. So we'll use the ggplot2 function to plot a scatter plot. So firstly I'll load the ggplot2 library and after loading the ggplot2 library I'll use the ggplot function to plot a scatter plot. So ggplot function is based on grammar of graphics. So it has different layers that we stack upon each other to build a final plot. So our first layer is our data layer where we pass our data frame. So our data frame is our credit card data frame that we have just extracted from the whole data frame. And then we have our second layer as the aesthetics layer. So in the aesthetics layer we have our variables that we want to plot on our scatter plot. So on the x axis we have our variable v1 and on the y axis we have our variable v2. And we want the color of the points of the scatter plot according to the different categories of the classes. Just a quick info guys. Test your knowledge of computer vision by answering this question. A string of 8 zeros and 1s is called what? A. Megabyte B. Byte C. Kilobyte D. Gigabyte Comment your answer in the comment section below. Subscribe to IntelliPad to know the right answer. Now, let's continue with the session. So, we'll have two categories in the classes that is 0 and 1. So, we'll have two colors, two different colors for each particular category. And then to plot a scatter plot, we'll add the third layer using the plus sign here. So, our third layer is our geom layer. So, in the geometry layer, we'll pass our function that we want to plot scatter plot for. So, here we, if you want to plot a scatter plot, we'll pass geom underscore point. So it will plot a scatter plot for us. And then if you want to change the background of your plot. So we can use the theme function. So theme BW that is black and white. So it will make the background of your plot as black and white. And then you can also change the color of the points. So to here this will get you the basic plot that we want. 
so if you zoom in on this plot uh, you can see that or this particular color represents or legitimate cases and or blue color here represents our fraud cases so if you want to change the background of this particular plot so you can use a theme function which will change the background to black and white and if you want to change the color of these points to different colors so we can use the scale color manual function and inside of that function we can declare our values so our values of the colors are dodge blue 2 and red so now this color represents the zero that is legitimate cases and red represents the fraud cases so now let's run the whole command and we'll get the final plot black and white background and these colors as the color of the points so if you zoom in on this particular plot you will find that now this particular color Dodger blue 2 represents our legitimate cases and our red color represents our fraud cases. So here also clearly you can see that we have a comparatively huge number of legitimate cases and only a few fraud cases. So if you train your model on this particular data, our model will not be able to learn a lot because the number of fraud cases are very less. So we have to use different techniques to balance the data set before we actually make or build a model on this particular data. So before balancing the data set, we will first of all create training and test sets. So we only use balancing on the training set to train the model and we don't use balancing on the test set because that will be the original test set that we will predict values for. So first of all we will create training and test sets and then we will balance the training set and train our model and then evaluate the performance of the model using the test set. So now let's build our training and test sets for the fraud detection model. So we will be using the CA2's library. So if you have not installed this library you can use the install.packages and the name of the library to install it. And after installing this library you can use the library function to load the library and after loading the library we can use the sample.split function to split our data set into two sets that is training and test sets. So in the sample.split function if you want to know more about this function you can press F1 here so it will take you to the documentation on the right hand side. So now if you want to split your data set into training and test sets so here we will pass our column that we want to split according to. So since we are going to predict whether a transaction is a fake transaction or a legitimate transaction so that column is a class column that represents zeros and ones so we'll use the class column to split our data set into training and test sets so i'll pass the column my class column from the credit card data set and now i'll mention the split ratio which will represent how many rows i want in the training set and how many rows i want in the test set so if you write split a ratio equals 0.8 so 80% of the rows that are present in your data set will be in the train set and 20% of the rows that are present in your data set will be in the test set. So if you run this particular line and we'll store the result in data sample. So once you run this line and if you look at the data sample now, so it will contain, contain true and false values. So here the true values will be 0.8. So 80% of the values here will be true and 20% of the values here will be false. And these number of values will be equal to the number of rows that we have in our data set. So now we'll use this particular object to split our data set into two sets using the subset function. So we'll use a subset function on our credit card data set and we'll check wherever the sample value is true. We'll store all those rows in train data. So after running this line, our 80% of the rows from the credit card data set will be in the train data and wherever the data sample value is false we'll store all those rows in the test data 20% so of the rows in the credit card data set will be in the test data so now let's run all these lines together so now we have successfully created our train data and test data so now let's click on the train data in the variable explorer to see how many rows are there so we have around 22,785 rows in our training data that is 80% of the rows of the whole data set and then if you look at the test data so we have around 5696 rows in the test data and all the columns so we'll train our model on the train data after balancing this data and then we'll test the performance of the model using confusion matrix of, on the test data so now if you want to check the dimensions of your training and test data you can use the dim function so it will display the dimensions so our training data contains 22,785 rows and our test data contains 5,696 rows and all the columns that is 31 columns so now before making a model we have to balance our data set first so we'll use different techniques so the first technique that we're going to use is called the random oversampling which means that we will increase the number of fraud cases in our data set so we'll oversample the minority class so right now if you look at the distribution of the class variables class variable you can see around 22,750 transactions are legitimate transactions and only 35 transactions are fraud transactions so now if you want to increase the number of fraud transactions so we'll use this particular method so first of all we'll write how many we'll store or number of rows in our data set or number of legitimate transactions in our data set in n legit variable and then we'll 
store the number of fraction or the amount of fraction that we want for our fraud cases so if you want our fraud cases to be 50 percent of the whole data set uh, using the random over sampling so we'll write 0 0.50 and we'll store the result in new fraction legit so now this uh, fraction will be 50 percent so our in our final data set after performing the random over sampling the 50 percent of the rows will be your legitimate transactions and 50 percent of the rows will be fraud transactions now if you want to calculate how many rows should be there in our data set to accumulate both of the legitimate and fraud transactions as 50 percent so we'll divide number of legitimate cases by the fraction and it will tell us how many rows we want in our data set to balance our legitimate and fraud transactions as 50 50 percent so after dividing the number of legitimate cases by the fraction we'll get the number of rows that we want in, in our data set so if you run this function we have stored the number of rows in new and total so if you so if you click on new and total so you'll find that we need around 45550 45500 rows in our data set and out of these rows 50% of the rows or 50% of 50% uh, of the cases will be fraud cases and 50% of the cases will be legitimate cases so now to perform random over sampling we'll use a package called rows so if you have not installed this package you can install the package using install.packages function and then write the name of the package that you want to install and after you have installed the package you can use the library function to load the package so that you can use the functions that are included in this package so in this package we are going to use the oven.sample function which will help us to perform random over sampling so if you want to know more about this function you can press f1 here so it will take you to the documentation of this function so in this documentation you can see the first argument that we want is our formula argument so in the formula argument we have to mention our variables that we want to over sample so here our class variable is the variable that we want to over sample and then we have used the dot which means the rest of the variables are independent variables and this tilde sign is used to separate our independent and dependent variables so our class is our variable that we want to over sample or that we will predict later on and we'll use all of the variables in our data set except the class variable which we can mention using the dot symbol here and after the second argument is our data argument so it will require the data that we want to over sample so our data comes from train data that we have just created above our training set and the third argument here you can see is our method argument so if you go to the documentation you can see that we have three methods that is over under and both so firstly we'll perform the over sampling of the minority samples so we'll use method equals over and then we have our n argument which will be the number of rows in the new data set after the over sampling is performed so that is equal to the number of new and total which is 45500 rows and then we will also use the seed function so that if we run this code again so we will be getting the same sample again or the same number of over sampled rows again and again so let's run this function now to get our over sampling result so after running this function if you want to if you just click at the variable that is has been created so here you can see we have different attributes of this variable that is over sampling result so our data is actually stored in the data attribute so if you want to reach the data attribute you can use the over sampling data and then the data attribute and we'll store the data set in over sample credit so if you store the result in over sample credit and now if you look at the distribution of the classes that we have after random over sampling so you will find that we have 22,750 legitimate cases and 22,750 fraud cases so now the distribution of our fraudulent and legitimate cases are equal using the random over sampling so before moving ahead let's plot this distribution using the same v1 and v2 columns of our over sampling result so now if you look, click, click at the over sampling credit so this is our over sampling credit we have 45500 rows so let's plot a scatter plot between v1 and v2 and see what is the distribution of classes between these two variables so we'll use the ggplot function to plot a scatter plot again so here now our data comes from over sampled credit here and then we have the variables v1 on the x-axis and v2 on the y-axis and the color of the points will be according to the categories of the class column that is 0 and 1 and then we'll use the geom function so if you want to plot a geom so if you want to plot a scatter plot we'll use the geom point function and then the theme of our plot will be black and white using the theme function and the color of the points will be dodger blue and red so if you want to change the color you can use this scale color manual function so once you run this command you will get a scatter plot between v1 and v2 that represents your over sampled data set that we have just created using the rows package so now if you zoom in here you will find that uh, we have the blue color or the dowager blue color as class 0 which is the legitimate cases and the red will be our fraud cases so here you can see still we do not our points do not represent a lot of points compared to the blue points so the reason is that in our random over sampling 
will create duplicate points so most of these points are overlapping on each other because we enroll random oversampling will just create duplicate points that are already present in our data set so if you want to know whether there are points overlapping on each other or not so we'll add some jitter to these points so once we add some jitter to these points so we will see that there will be a lot of points in this on top of each other because we have just created duplicate points using the random oversampling so to add jitter to the points we'll use the position argument of the geom point function so if you set your position argument to position jitter and inside the position jitter function we can mention our width of the jitter that we want so if you write 0.1 here so now if you run this function you'll find that there will be a lot of points that are over plotted or stacked upon each other because we have just created duplicate points using the random oversampling so now here you can see the points when you add some jitter you will find there are a lot of points that are stacked up on top of each other because we have just performed uh, the duplicate values we have just increased the number of duplicate values using the random oversampling so now let's perform our random undersampling so in random oversampling we just train our model on duplicate values which is not a good condition so we'll see what is random undersampling so in random undersampling we'll reduce the number of legitimate cases we'll keep the legitimate cases equal to the number of fraud cases so let's first of all see the distribution of our credit card data set so we have this distribution we have around 22,750 legitimate cases and only 35 fraud cases in our training set so now if you want to set the number of legitimate cases equal to the number of fraud cases so we'll use this method so first of all we'll store the number of fraud cases in n fraud and then we'll calculate the or we'll store the fraction that we want for our fraud cases or our legitimate cases so we want the number of fraud cases equal to 0 50 percent of the whole data so we'll store that is that in n frac fraud and then we want to calculate the number of rows that will be in your data set so that our fraud cases and legitimate cases are equal in number so we'll divide the number of fraud cases by the, the fraction that we want our fraud cases to be in that is 0 0.5 so once we divide it we'll get the total number of rows that we need in our data set to satisfy this fraction and once you run this particular command so if you look at your new total so now we'll data we'll, our data set will contain 70 rows and out of the 70 rows 35 rows will be number of legitimate cases and 35 rows will be number of fraud cases so now let's use the o1.sample to create that particular data so we'll use the same o1.sample and now instead of mentioning the method as over if you want to make a career in data science then IntelliPath has IIT Madras Advanced Data Science and AI Certification Program. This course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts. We'll write method as under and then all of the arguments are same. So you just have to change the method and once you run this particular function or for particular command, so now your under sampling result will be calculated. And now if you want to get to the get to the data set that is stored in under sampling results we'll get the data set attribute or the data attribute of the under sampling result and we'll store that in under sample credit so once you run this line you will have your data set that is under sample credit and if you look at your data set right now so we have around 70 rows and out of the 70 rows 35 rows will have will have legitimate cases and 35 rows are fraud cases so now let's plot a uh, scatter plot between same v1 and v2 to see how our distribution of the points look like and the distribution of the classes look like between these two variables v1 and v2 so if you plot it now so you'll see that uh, now we have equal number of legitimate cases and fraud cases so in random oversampling we decrease the number of legitimate cases to a certain ratio so that we we can we have more or we have an equal distribution of legitimate and fraud cases but the problem here is that we end up losing a lot of data which is not preferred in, in a general case so now we'll perform both the random oversampling and undersampling to see how our data actually looks like so now we'll perform both random oversampling and undersampling so now the number of rows that we want in our dataset will be equal to the number of rows that are present in our training set. So our new dataset will also contain the same number of rows that is 22785. And now we want our fractions of the legitimate and fraud cases equally in our dataset. So out of the 22785 rows, 50% of the rows will be fraud cases and 50% of the rows will be legitimate cases. So we're not going to increase or decrease anything. We're just going to resample our dataset in such a way that 50% of the rows will be fraud cases and 50% of the rows will be legitimate cases using both random oversampling for increasing the number of fraud cases and random undersampling to decreasing the number of legitimate cases. So after storing our fraction in the fraction of fraud new variable, 
we'll use the same own dot sample so now we have used uh, the method as both so here if you want to perform both random over sampling and under sampling you can use the method as both and then the n argument here is the number of rows that we want in our new data set and then the p is your probability of fraction so if the method is both here so the probability will be default by 0 0.5 so 50 percent of the rows uh, will be your legitimate cases and 50% of the rows will be fraud cases and then we have used the seed function so that we get the same sample again and again if you run this code again so now if you run this code and if you get to the data set using the data attribute of the sampling result it will store that data set in sample credit now let's look at the data set so we have around 2785 rows and out of the 22,785 rows you can see around 11,430 rows are legitimate cases and 11,000 three five five rows are fraud cases so if you get the per, if you want to get the percentages of these rows so you'll get around 50 percent of the data are legitimate cases or leg legitimate transactions and 49.8 percent are fraud transactions so now let's plot a scatter plot between v and v1 and v2 so to see how our class distribution looks like so i've already added some data so that we can see the overlapping of the points because we have performed random oversampling and undersampling both so we have reduced some number of legitimate cases and we have increased some number of fraud cases so now they are in equal ratio but the number of fraud cases are overlapping on each other because they are duplicates of each other and, and the number of legitimate cases are scattered on whole of the plot so now let's move ahead and use the third method that we use which is called this mode which is the synthetic minority oversampling technique which will add the synthetic samples in our data set without actually creating duplicates of the fraud cases so to implement smote we will use this library called smote family so if you have not installed this library you can use the install.packages and the name of the library to install it first and then after installing you can use the library function to load the library to use the functions that are contained in this library so after loading the library if you look at the class distribution we have the same class distribution that is 22,750 are legitimate cases in our train data and 35 are the fraud cases in our train data so now we want to increase the number of legitimate cases or we want to add synthetic samples of the fraud cases so that we have a balanced data set that we can use to train our model. So we'll start by first of all setting the number of fraud and legitimate cases and the desired percentage of the legitimate cases that we want in our data set. So our legitimate cases are represented by N0 here. So we have, we have around 22,750 legitimate cases and N1 are the fraud cases. So we have around 35 fraud transactions. And then R0 represents the ratio that we want in our data set after the smote. So we have we want 60% of our rows should be legitimate cases and 40% of the rows will be fraud cases. So we'll add synthetic samples in such a way that after adding the synthetic samples, our data set has 60% of the legitimate cases and 40% of the fraud cases. So now to get the number of times that we have to perform smote to get the desired number of ratio of the legitimate and fraud cases. So we'll use this mode function first of all from this mode family and if you want to know more about this function you can press F1 here and you can see we have different arguments that is X which is our data that we want to apply smote on then we have our target value so the vector of the target class attribute corresponding to our data set X so our X will be our independent variables and our Y will target will be our dependent variable that we are going to predict later on and K is the number of nearest neighbors we want during the sampling and then we have our dupe size so it, it will be the number of times we run our smart or number of times we want to run our smart to add different synthetic samples so if you want to get the number of uh, the dupe size which will actually tell us how many times we have to run smart in order to get the desired percentage of our legitimate and fra fraud cases so we'll use this formula so this formula will help us to get the number of times we have to run smart in order to get a percentage of synthetic cases such that our final data frame contains 60% of the legitimate cases and 40% of the fraud cases. So using this formula which contains both R0, N0 and N1, uh, once you run this here and before running this we have to run these three together and after that if you run this, so if you now look at the number of times we will get, uh, we have to run 432 times. So after running 432 times on this mode we will get to a value of your variables in such a way or value of the points in such a way that 60% uh, of the points will be flagged as legitimate transaction and 40% will be fraud transaction. So we will use this mode function first of all and our x will be our training data. So if you look at your train data right now, so our train data 
first column is our time column so in, we are not going to use this particular column because we are only going to use these features v1 and v2 up to v28 so we'll be removing this particular feature from our data and then we'll also remove the last column which is our target column which is our class column which is uh, 31st 31st column so we'll remove these two columns and our training data will be from amount till v1 so after declaring our training data that is our x now we'll de declare the target so our target is our class variable that we are going to predict either 0 or 1 and the number of neighbors that we want is 5 and then the dupe size is equal to the number of times saved. so once we run this particular code so we'll get our output as mode output and if you right now if you look at this mode output so it will have different attributes and our data is stored in our data attribute here so we'll get the data set which is data frame from this particular attribute so we'll use this attribute data and we'll store the data set which we have created using this mode method so once we run this particular line and if you now click at the credits mode so we'll get the data set that has around 37,905 entries and around 30 columns so we have removed the first column and our last column is our class column so in the class column around 60% of the class values will be 0 that is legitimate cases and 40% of the class values will be 1 which is fraud cases so now let's change the name of all this variable to class with an uppercase c so that we can we are according to the all of the data types that we have in our or all of the data frames that we have used till now so we'll change the first of all the name of our last column that is our 30th column to class with an uppercase c using the call names function so now after changing the name of the class so if you want to now get the percentage of the number of legitimate and fraud cases in our data set so we'll, we can use the prop table function and then we'll pass a table function which will get the distribution of uh, the uh, categories present in the class variable so now you can clearly see that we have around 60 percent of the legitimate cases and 40 percent of the fraud cases represented by one so now let's plot a scatter plot between v1 and v2 and compare the original data set with the data set that we have created using this mode so this will be our original data set where our data comes from the training data that is without smoot and the rest of the code is same as above so this will be our original scatter plot between v1 and v2 for the training data so now let's plot a scatter plot for the v1 and v2 in the credits mode data after we have used the credit or after we have used this mode method on our training data so you have just had to change your credits mode the data that you are passing to a plot function so once you run this function you will see that we have added a lot of synthetic points around 40 percent of the synthetic points using this mode method so now if you look at this particular data you can see the blue points represent class 0 which is the number of fraud legitimate cases and the red points represent number of fraud cases and you can see we have not only added uh, points but we have only we have added synthetic points and not the duplicate points these are all the synthetic points that our mode algorithm has added using this mode method and now after creating this particular data we will train our model on this data and then we will evaluate the performance of the model on the original test data so now after making the data set 60 into 60 and 40 ratio so the 60 percent of the cases now are legitimate cases and 40 percent of the cases are fraud cases so now let's build a decision tree on top of this data so that we can predict whether a transaction is fraudulent or legitimate so we'll be using the r part package to build classification and regression trees so and we'll use the r part dot plot package to plot the regression trees or the classification trees so if you have not installed these two packages you can install using the install dot packages command and install dot packages for r part dot plot so once you have installed these packages you can load it using the library function and once you load this package now we'll use the r part function to make our classification and regression tree so if you press f1 here you will get to the description of this particular or the documentation of this particular function so the first argument here is a formula argument where we have to mention the independent and dependent variables so now we are predicting the class variable so the class is our independent or the dependent variable which we are going to predict and we'll use all of the variables except the class variable as independent variables so these were if you want to write all the variables you can use a dot instead of writing every single name and then we use we use tilde sign to separate our independent and dependent variables 
and then we'll pass our data that we want to train our model on so now our data that we'll train our model on is a credit small data which is our balance data so once we run this we'll create a tree uh, which will predict the number the class of any particular sample based on all other variables so we'll store the tree in card model variable so after building a decision tree on this particular data so now let's plot the decision tree using the r part or plot function so we just have to pass our model that we have built that is our card model and then we have used extra equals zero so once we plot this model we'll get a decision tree so if you don't want any extra information on the leaves we write extra equals zero and type equals five will change the display of this plots uh, the shapes that we have used in this plot and tweak equals 1.2 it enlarges the text to 120 percent so the text will be enlarged by 120 percent so this is our decision tree that our model has built so it will use only one column in our data set that is v14 and it will use this column to classify different samples so the particular columns v14 value is greater than minus 2.6 that sample will be classified or that transaction will be classified as a legitimate transaction and if it less if it is less than minus 2.6 so that transaction will be classified as a fraud transaction so now after building the decision tree let's now predict values on top of the test set to see how many samples are correctly and incorrectly classified so we'll use the predict function to predict the values on top of the test set so we'll use the first method that the first argument that our predict function takes is our model that we have built that is our card model and if you want to know more, more about this function you can press f1 here so it will take you to this particular documentation so we'll use the card model that is our machine learning model model that we have declared above and then the data that it wants to predict on is our test data and then we want to predict classes so it will predict whether a class is zero that is legitimate cases legitimate case or class one that is fraud transaction it will predict on top of the test data and then we'll compare the predictions with the actual values of the test data that we already have with us so that we can see what is the distribution of the correctly and incorrectly classified values so we'll store all the predictions in predicted val variable so once we have predicted val variable if you look at how our predicted value variable looks like so here you can see the first value is 4 if you go to your test data so here you can also see the first row of the test data is the fourth row of our whole data set and if you want to see what our model has predicted so for this particular row the class value is zero and our model has also predicted zero and for this uh, the second row the class value is zero and our model has also predicted zero so if you want to know how many predictions are correct and incorrect according to our model and the actual values so we'll build a confusion matrix to see how many predictions are correct and incorrect so let's build a confusion matrix using the caret package so i'll load the caret package and then i'll use the confusion matrix function where i'll pass the predicted values first and then our actual values that are present in our class variable in our test data so once you run this you'll get the confusion matrix for this particular model so you can see here our true positives are 5625 and our true negatives are 7 so out of 9 samples that we have in our test data 7 samples or the seven fraudulent cases were correctly classified by our, by our model that we have built using the credits mode data that is after using this mode method the data that we have built if we use uh, build on our model on top of that so we'll get our, our, out of nine cases that are present in our test data out of nine cases seven cases which are fraud cases are actually classified so we'll be able to detect seven cases out of nine cases that are present in our test data and here accuracy is insignificant but still if you want to see the accuracy our accuracy is around 98.98 percent so now if you use the model if you build the same model without using more data or on the original train data and let's see what is the classification rate or how many samples are incorrectly and correctly classified so this is our decision tree without using the more data so now our data is actually the train data and i have excluded the first column of my data that is our time column so we were only using the variables v1 to v28 and then the amount column not the time column and the rest of the code is same so this is our formula which can be dependent variable that is class and independent variables the rest of the variables that are present in our data set so we'll use this particular function r part to create a classification and regression tree and we'll store the modeling card model and after that 
uh, will plot the card model so this is our model looks like this is a decision tree that our model will use to classify different samples based on uh, the legitimate cases and the fraud cases so now let's predict on top of the test set and see what is the classification or the misclassification rate so we'll use the same predict method and then we'll call the card will in the predict function we'll mention the first argument as our model that is our card model and then we are predicting on the test data so I, here also i have excluded the first column so if you want to exclude the first column of the test data you can write this so here it will include all the rows and it will not include the first column that is our time column of the test data this is our test data how it looks like so if you want to exclude this particular column because we are not going to predict using this column so you can write minus one here and after that we have to write type equals class so it will predict classes for each sample so it either it will be zero or one so now we have predicted the classes of the test data using our model that was built on the original trained data without using smooth now let's look at the confusion matrix so now if you now look at the confusion matrix you can see that our two negatives is six so out of the nine samples we are only able to classify six samples if you use the data set that we have that is our trained data without using the smooth so now let's compare these two models using the whole data so now instead of predicting on the test data we will predict on whole of the data set and that will show us how many samples will be correctly classified by a model that was built on smooth and by a model that was built on the original data that is unbalanced data so first let's build our model that was built on the credit smooth so this will be our model that we built on the credit smooth now let's predict on the whole credit card data set it will contain all the values so we will exclude the first column and then we will predict the classes and we will store the predictions in predict val and after storing the predictions let's see the confusion matrix so in this confusion confusion matrix out of the 44 samples that we had in our data set 40 fraud cases were correctly classified by using the smooth data or the model that was built on this smooth data because our true negatives is one so these are the samples that was that was just a quick info guys test your knowledge of computer vision by answering this question computers process data into information by working exclusively with which of the following a multimedia b words c characters d numbers comment your answer in the comment section below subscribe to intellipad to know the right answer now let's continue with the session uh, the transactions that were actually fake transactions one and our model has also, also predicted that these transactions are fake so out of 44 40 transactions were actually correctly classified and now let's build the same model using the model that was built on the train data or the original data without the balancing factor or this mode now after creating this data that was that is built on the original data set that is unbalanced and now let's predict on the top of the whole data set and now if you build the confusion matrix uh, so you will see that we have only 35 right now so we have using this mode we can easily detect five more samples then we can detect using the unbalanced data set so that is why using smooth is preferable because it balances balances that balances the data set first and then it predicts so you can easily see we are able to classify more fraud cases using this mode which is 40 instead of using the original data set that we have which is unbalanced and then we need to understand why uh, we require artificial intelligence guys again head to the comment section and let me know your top reasons of why you think uh, you know we require artificial intelligence around us i mean human beings are the most um, uh, you know intelligent species out there as of now uh, i mean sure that's debatable but as of now that's how it stands well so why why do we need artificial intelligence then well let me tell you humans are the most intelligent beings but then there is only so much that we can do for example consider handling a huge amount of data right so in this world we live in basically we live in a world which is a big data problem so we have we have terabytes we have hexabytes we have petabytes worth of data coming in from each and every fortune 500 firm of you know pretty much every single day every single hour of every single day in fact so this a data is growing exponentially and then when the data is growing at this rate you cannot expect a human being to be on the other side all the time to handle it so this exponential growth of data is handled by machines very easily and then when we talk about the variety of data as well let's say you need to go on to uh, you know uh, 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 merge some data split some data basically bifurcate some data uh, there are there are varieties of data there's unstructured data semi-structured data structured data so uh, 
it might not be possible for one human or a team of human beings to basically go on to do this with the amount of data I just told you, right? So when you think about it practically, the variety of sources through which the data comes in is again unlimited almost. So having a machine on the other end of it to take the brutality of uh, the variety of sources, the types of data, the amount of data is going to make uh, life more uh, efficient for the employer as well as the employee. And then we come to processing speed. Yes, again, I'm going to restate the same thing. Human beings might be the most intelligent uh, beings out there, but then uh, we do have uh, machines which can be uh, exponentially faster than humans when it comes to certain basic things, let it be mathematical calculations or anything as such. So this will provide unparalleled performance uh, when we have to uh, compare a human beings work directly to an artificial intelligence, uh, intelligent uh, beings work. Uh, if we have to go on to directly juxtapose them. So this brings us to artificial intelligence developers. Who are these guys and what do they do? Well, you need to know this. Again, AI developers are basically uh, computer science based people. And these people have to do a lot uh, with coding, uh, you know, programming languages such as Python languages such as R and many, many other programming concepts. So why do they need all this programming? Well, this is basically to ensure that, you know, they can design, maintain, test, evaluate all the artificial intelligence solutions that certain organizations need. So let's say again, uh, the AI technology, which has gone into building Siri at Apple might be extremely different, uh, you know, is definitely very different than the technology which went into Tesla's autopilot, right? So these developers need to understand what the problem is, uh, make sure they can formulate the problem and then formulate a solution for that problem as well, right? So designing a solution for an artificial intelligence requirement, and in fact, maintaining that uh, uh, product after it's been designed and evaluating to make sure that it is performing right where it should is again very important aspects of an artificial intelligence developer and i have a quick question for you guys on that note so i'm pretty sure most of you guys use social media right it might be facebook it might be instagram it might be twitter and it might be all the other fancy social media apps out there Coming to Facebook, let's see how AI developers pretty much work out here, right? So AI developers are pretty much responsible again to handle about 350 million photos a day, which has been uploaded to Facebook. And they do a lot with face detection and image recognition as well. So let's say you and your friends decided to go on a vacation. Uh, you know, uh, let's say there were 10 people of you and you clicked about 300 pictures. Now imagine tagging 10 of these people in all the 60 pictures, right? So again, 600 tags you have to do manually. And this is going to take many, many hours if you have to do this. But then Facebook already would understand who the person that, uh, you know, is in the picture, where the picture was clicked and much more. That is what geotagging means and location options too. So this is this is told to you very subtle. It says, hey, uh, was the picture clicked here? Uh, is this person that, I mean, it'll show you the name of the person and it'll show you the location as well. And you might be like, yes. So at that point, of time you might not uh, you know, recognize and realize the power that's working behind it to get you all the details right again and another important thing is automatic uh, friend stations right so let's say you added someone on any of their other applications now facebook owns whatsapp and instagram so let's say uh, you're in touch with someone on uh, on uh, WhatsApp where you've saved their number or something. Facebook will tell you, it'll give you a friend recommendation saying, hey, why don't you add that person on Facebook as well? So imagine all the processing that goes behind uh, this uh, particular thing. I mean, it's so subtle, as I mentioned on the first slide that we don't even know it's there anymore. And then when you talk about Instagram, see, there are 95 million photos which get uploaded to Instagram and handling that is definitely a task, right? And the best thing that inf uh, Instagram is known, for, is known for these days is customized advertisement. So you go to Amazon, on, you're searching for the latest mobile phone or you're searching for a mobile cover, tempered glass, whatever it is. As soon as you come back to uh, Instagram, it's going to show you one advertisement, which is beautifully put together. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, you, you'll feel like clicking on the advertisement, basically. That's how customized these advertisements are. And again, face detection and object recognition as well. So that plays a very important role in Instagram. Location recommendation systems, again, it'll just tell you where the photo was clicked, uh, you know, what time the photo was clicked and much more. Friend recommendation again. So let's say, again, you added someone on Facebook or, or you guys just, uh, uh, let's say let's say there are two people uh, there are two people who use Instagram. You guys have talked on another social media, but then you guys decided to meet for breakfast or dinner or whatever. And as soon as you come back to Instagram, it's gonna give you a friend recommendation saying, why don't you add this person on Instagram? Again, how does this work? Artificial intelligence is at play my dear viewers and then coming to twitter 
Twitter handles uh, pretty much 6,000 tweets per second. Again, there has to be some form of uh, uh, pretty much, you know, a pipeline, a channel for the data to flow through in and out of the uh, Twitter's uh, uh, storage area where pretty much they need to understand, they need to work with this data because it's not all about storing the data when it comes to Twitter, right? Because they perform sentiment analysis of every single tweet. They check if the tweet has a positive sentiment, a neutral sentiment, a negative sentiment and what... Uh, pretty much they can check to the depths of what person in which area liked or disliked this tweet in the in, in the, on the face of the globe basically so this will add power to their organization this will make sure that marketing can be done using twitter and in fact at the end of the day you're bringing bringing more sessions to twitter and they are happy coming to outreach analytics and customized marketing again uh, pretty much it will tell you where who who your audience is when they're watching your tweets when they're reading it and why as well right so coming to data analytics again you can pull out any number of statistics you want with respect to sentiment analysis of any tweet that's present on twitter guys so uh, think about it we never knew a simple tweet can have this much of a complex circumstance in the back end when we talk about data and artificial intelligence right so this brings us to the most important aspect of this video guys which is the skills needed to become an AI developer and let me tell you about three important skills that I think you should have and the first one is all about mathematics and all about algorithms guys because at the end of the day you need to understand how numbers can in fact be used to achieve artificial intelligence there is so much that you might not know and to the intermediate level viewers uh, pretty much you will know how much of importance mathematics and statistics play a role and then coming to algorithms all the machine learning algorithms are again one step closer to making the machines intelligent all concepts such as machine learning deep learning neural networks all these are work under the same umbrella of artificial intelligence all of these terms that i told you all of their goals is to achieve artificial intelligence at the end of the day so having very good mathematical skills and being well versed with the top algorithms which works with again based on statistics is very vital and second of the three most important skills is probability and statistics guys why did i mention statistics again well it is that important you need to understand all the concepts everything from the basics of you know correlation uh, all the way till how data how you can basically churn through data and make sure the data will give you insights that the naked eye might not tell you at all so that is one of the reasons why statistics is extremely important coming to the world of probability again Again, uh, we need to we need to uh, sometimes understand that the values can be continuous, the values can be discrete. We need to find out what a possibility of occurrence of something is, right? So that again, pretty much a machine, uh, an artificial intelligence algorithm of today will not give you 100% accuracy all the time. It will give you an accuracy of 80, 90, 95, 98%. Again, this 98% is 9 on 10 probability. So it says that there are, there are chances that it might fail 2 times out of 100 times. Again, probability right so this is a very important second skill to have coming to the third most important skill is having the knowledge of a programming language guys because again there are languages like python and r which form a very strong requirement when you have to learn about artificial intelligence and to help you become an ai developer and you know you can either go on to learn python you can go on to learn r but then beginners do prefer python because r actually has a steep learning curve which some of the beginners might find difficult but then do not worry you can pick up either python or r and you can be on your way to become an AI developer and then coming to what R is majorly used for well R is actually used to do a lot of data plotting a lot of statistics and uh, uh, it involves a lot of bringing mathematics and programming together is what I want to tell you guys and then uh, in a just again uh, you know most of the companies which basically has open positions for AI developers has these roles always present so you need R and R and or Python you're gonna need statistics you're gonna need to work with algorithms machine learning and uh, so much more and on that note here is a step-by-step -step guide on how you can become an artificial intelligence developer let us begin with step one step one is pretty much again you understanding data structures in detail you might be wondering why you need the data structures right again if you understand how your data is stored how your data is talking to uh, the other entity that is present next to it then you will understand how you can increase the performance of an algorithm by making it uh, you know by making it improve itself 
by drastically changing its understanding of its neighboring data so understanding the right data structure understanding when to use what data structure is extremely important and this is step number one guys i urge you guys to uh, pretty much uh, uh, you know whip out your pen and paper or make notes of these as this will help you a lot uh, in case if you guys are considering to becoming an ai, AI developer coming to step number two again as i mentioned uh, programming so you know python and r are the biggest names when it comes to a programming language to help achieve artificial intelligence and programming knowledge is programming knowledge is vital guys it is necessary there is no work around this and in fact it is so much fun to work with and i've been working on this for a couple of years and i absolutely love it so you know working on python working in r there are uh, libraries for machine learning there is tensorflow there's scikit learn there's pytorch for neural networks there's cntk that's the microsoft's cognitive toolkit and there are much much more there is staffe uh, pretty much guys when if i have to go on to naming the, the the frameworks i can keep on going so when you think about this there are so many things out there that you need to know uh, and this already forms the step uh, step number two so what comes after this well step three is understanding a little bit of mathematics guys you need to understand you need to have some sort of clarity on how numbers can actually be used uh, to drive a data driven uh, uh, entity into making it self sustain because at the end of the day statistics will play an extremely vital role in making sure your machine understand understands what's going on in it and derive some sort of content continuous or differential uh, inferences based on that and then this brings us to step number four step number four is the most important uh, part ladies and gentlemen because here again uh, you will be uh, you'll be finding a problem this is how you you have to go by with step number four find a problem which needs a solution let's say uh, you know it might be a new startup that your friend is starting or you just spotted a common problem across uh, you, your daily life so find that problem and make sure that you can formulate the problem and understand what the actual problem is now find a solution to that problem and after you found a solution to that problem in a general human way try to see if you can get the machine to do it if you can implement artificial intelligence to do it uh, almost as good as you if not better than then your job is done uh, but then you need to understand that at the end of it you you becoming an artificial intelligence developer so uh, telling the world about it is again very important as well so there is this website called a skaggle where pretty much it's, it's an amazing community where people pretty much come together give out their problems give out solutions there are challenges that you can take place in and basically it's like a github uh, for programmers again github is the same thing but when we talk about it, kaggle is a little different and i'm sure you guys will know how when you go on to explore kaggle which is your step number four so coming to step number five Step number five involves you to understand a little bit of cloud cloud computing because again, in today's world, half of the organizations we see around us are already scaled to the clouds. So, you know, everything from Amazon Web Services, we have GCP, which is Google Cloud Platform, we have Microsoft Azure and much more. So taking artificial intelligence and scaling it right up in the sky through the clouds is now booming. And uh, as my dear viewers, I have to tell you that, you know, having a good certification, which will train you on all of these concepts is extremely vital working on aws working on gcp or azure or any of these so having cloud computing knowledge and bringing it together with artificial intelligence are very vital and coming to step number six step number six, six is again an important uh, aspect for an ai developer because not only uh, you'll have to work with one single computer at point of time you'll have to work with multiple entities multiple computers because at the end of the day you're going to use this to exponentially increase your computing power and this is basically done to understand how you can gain some sort of systematic knowledge onto scaling this artificial intelligence uh, entity that you're developing onto a modern infrastructure this is very vital guys so to revisit all the steps uh, here's a recap your step one will begin by understanding data structure step two with a programming language and some libraries step three is mathematics and statistics step four is finding a problem analyzing it and solving it uh, again, the next step involves uh, scaling artificial intelligence to the clouds and the last step is to understand how you can make use of artificial intelligence on multiple machines at the same time, which is basically distributed computing. And 
to uh, to uh, basically strengthen everything that i've said here are some of the sample job descriptions that we can check out so here's a job description for an artificial intelligence developer from the uh, penn state university in the united states of america uh, their requirement is this they say proficiency in python is needed experience with machine learning library tensorflow uh, infinite cafe is needed and pretty much they say uh, you know proficiency in mathematics is needed as we discussed linear algebra multivariate calculus and much more skill is required in javascript or R as we discussed, data structures and ability to communicate technical topics to the people who might be non-technical audiences. And then cloud computing, AWS, as I told you, right? So we discussed all the six, seven points. And again, you can see just in one job description, we can see all those six points reflecting onto us, right? And then in fact, coming to a researcher's jobs, uh, we just checked out the artificial intelligence developer role. Let's check out the artificial intelligence researcher's role. Again, this comes from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It's called Lincoln Laboratory. Uh these guys as well they require uh, you to have experience in machine learning software pytorch tensorflow mixnet uh, skykit learn and much more they they would they would appreciate if you guys had experiences in uh, uh, working with large computer vision data sets experience with big data you know hadoop spark elastic search cassandra uh, you'll be able to work in a multidisciplinary team environment you have to have very good communication skills oral skills and sometimes you might have to travel as well so guys when we think about these two job descriptions of an ai developer and an ai researcher again when you come to think about it we have validated all the points that we pretty much just discussed right and this brings us to the most important part of uh, our live session which is pretty much to tell you what the average salary is so here uh, is the is the average salary guys so pretty much again uh, 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 when, you, when you think about it the average salary of a junior AI developer is somewhere around $80,000 in the USA 7 lakhs per annum in India 45,000 pounds in the UK and then a senior AI developer has up somewhere around $115,000 in the US 15 lakhs per annum in India and 60,000 uh, pounds in the in the UK guys so these are some of uh, the very big numbers that you can see when we talk about ai developers ai researchers and then as i told you this is a very lucrative career that you can uh, pretty much jump on to guys let's talk about this also that machine learning data science versus machine learning versus deep learning versus ai what is deep learning versus machine learning versus uh, data science versus ai so let's talk about first data science right data science is not new right it is it is way older than you think right and it is a very simple thing it says any type of a science any type of a science if it is applied on data that is called as data science any kind of a science that is applied on data is called as data science now what kind of a science can be applied these sciences are applied to generate insights from the data so let's say uh, uh so let's say that if this uh, uh let's say if you're talking about data science right let's say if you are a ceo of this fortune 500 company right and your company is working in 100 countries and you want to know that which country is performing good or bad in terms of revenue what will you do you will let's say calculate all your revenue of the company and aggregate that revenue based on the country wise right and then you will see that okay my uh, middle east is doing good Asia is doing good, uh, Europe is doing average, and US is also doing average, right? So you'll say, okay, we need to buck up our things in Europe and in USA, right? So these kind of strategic decisions, these kinds of insights when you see from the data, right? This is called as data sciences. Now, what techniques can be applied? It can be as simple as a simple plus minus addition and then some group, group also, right? Grouping by other data and it might go a little bit complex towards statistical calculations also right so data sciences is more of let's say trying to predict the sorry trying to generate insights right try to generate insights let's write down try to generate insights from data correct try to generate insights from data that is called as data science it is not new it goes as old as the mathematics is there right this is called as data science then you have machine learning now data science was doing very good right and it was telling us all the insights that okay this country is doing good this is bad but it was not telling us the future right it was not predicting something so then came machine learning 
machine learning said that I can predict the happening of an event of a event of an event based on patterns generated from sorry historical data what does this mean so machine learning i think it is also way older as you think right it has been people have been working on linear regression logistic regression from very long time as we think of right even the most bestest known uh, machine learning algorithm today xgboost is also almost 15 20 years old so nothing new right we are just reinventing on those steps only machine learning is also not new so what is machine learning machine learning says that if you give me the historical data if you give me the revenue data of your company for last 10 years right i will generate some patterns inside that thing right i will generate some patterns inside uh, in, inside that thing using the historical data right and from that pattern i can tell you what is the next thing that can happen right so let's say if a particular trend of a thing is going like this let's say up down up down and then up and then down and then up down up down up and then down so next time when this happens you tell me what is going to happen now is it going to go more up or is it going to go down down right why why did, why did you all why are you all saying down right why why because you saw the pattern right that two times small up then a big up then two times small up then big up so right this is two times small up it has gone up now it's time for going down right so same way machine learning also generates these patterns from the historical data and once these patterns are generated it can then say that okay because the pattern is this this is what is the next thing that will happen to you correct that is called as data science, uh, machine learning now machine learning you know brought a revolution now because people could uh, people could predict now what is going to happen next right people were predicting that okay this much supply is going to be there uh, so like this much demand is going to be there so i should have a supply of this thing right people were predicting things now on their earlier and they were making better decisions but still the problem was that machine learning was able to handle only tabular data Tabular data means all the data which is written in, inside your Excel or CSV, which is in a numerical format inside a sheet, right? It was not working on cognitive data. What is cognitive data now? Cognitive data means any kind of, uh, when you use any kind of a census to generate that data, that is called as cognitive. It means you use your eyes to view videos and images. You use your mouth to generate speech. You use your ears to listen to that speech. If you want to make a career in data science, then IntelliPath has IIT Madras Advanced Data Science and AI Certification Program. This course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts. And you write something that is called as text, right? So there are majorly three uh, cognitive domains, computer vision, natural language processing, and speeches. These three are called as cognitive areas now machine learning could not work very well on these cognitive areas right and it failed so deep learning came and it said that i can predict i can also you know uh, predict predict what is happening right but using but more efficiently let's be saying but more efficiently cognitive data right uh, but more efficiently on cognitive data because it uses same methods as humans which are called as neural networks so a human right when you touch a hot glass of water what happens you suddenly touch that thing and suddenly your brain says no keep it and you keep that thing what is happening actually in your brain you have these small let's say neuro, now your nervous system is made up of this kind of structure please bear with my entrance so this is the kind of a structure which is inside your body and this is called as nucleus uh, these are called as exims and these are called as dendrites these kinds of small small creatures they are connected one after the other one after the other and they are sending these signals from your fingertips to your brain and then your brain sends the signal back from your brain to the fingertips that drop that thing the same kind of a neural network structure is being built inside deep learning 
deep learning is based upon our, upon our neural network terminologies but deep learning can also handle tabular data but it is said that it is good and just let's say uh, i'm reading this paper only see this is still open i'm reading this paper which came just six seven days ago from intel right where it says that for tabular data they discourage using deep learning right just a quick info guys test your knowledge of computer vision by answering this question a string of eight zeros and ones is called what a megabyte b byte c kilobyte d gigabyte comment your answer in the comment section below subscribe to intellipad to know the right answer now let's continue with the session and i always say the same thing to my people that machine learning is more for tabular data and deep learning is more for cognitive data and the last thing that you have is it is called as ai artificial intelligence now what is artificial intelligence any kind of let's say product that you make final product that you make by using let's say a final product that you make that you make by using let's say deep learning or let's say machine learning or data science and sometimes static rules static rules and all those things when you apply all these things to make a product right that product is called as artificially intelligent product right that is called as ai Coming to the first question on these uh, top deep learning uh, interview questions set, the first question is, uh, what are the differences between machine learning and deep learning? Uh, this is a very common question that's asked and it is very important that you know the basic differences that lie between machine learning and deep learning. One very good commonality is that both of these are actually subsets of artificial intelligence and deep learning itself is actually, uh, you know, a part of machine learning. So when we talk about machine learning, we're making sure that we have find a way where we're training machines with a lot of data. We give it some data and we hide some data from it, in fact. And uh, we use the uh, hidden data later, uh, which you also call as the testing data to make sure that the machine learns something uh, you know, and to verify if it has actually learned from its experience. When it comes to deep learning, deep learning, we try to you know find methodologies and ways where we can uh, sort of trick the machine into making it think like a human being, you know, making uh, it use the human brain structure in terms of working, uh, you know, in the concepts of neural networks, uh, the entire concept is named after neurons and the use of uh, neurons as well, just because how, uh, you know, very similar to how it works in the human brain. So, so this forms to be the basic difference between machine learning and deep learning. Moving on to the second question, uh, it says, what is perceptron? You know, perceptron is a very important concept in deep learning because uh, it actually matches what we see in an actual neuron uh, in a human brain. So coming to how it works in deep learning, uh, so uh, a perceptron actually receives inputs from a variety of entities and then later it takes these entities, applies some transformations on it, what we call as functions. Uh, it applies functions on this and then it becomes the output. So input, perceptron, applying function output that is how uh, the order goes uh, so if you have to talk about when a perceptron is mainly used it is actually used uh, when we go on to perform binary classification uh, you know where we to where, where we uh, use an input uh, we try to see if we can classify something based on the output you know there's so many factors when we uh, talk about the functions as well there is uh, weights there is biases and there's a lot of things in the neural network uh, in deep learning that has a lot of impact and uh, in this system itself uh, perceptrons play a very important role uh, to take an input and transform it and work on it to give you a valid uh, you know output in the case of classifiers as well now coming to question number three it states how is deep learning better than machine learning uh, both deep learning and machine learning are very powerful in their own ways uh, you know, to solve most of the complex problem in a very simple way, machine learning has got it covered. But then when you talk about deep learning, deep learning will overpower machine learning, especially when it comes to working with data that has huge number of dimensions. Um, you know, think about an Excel sheet, which has about, uh, let's say, 100 columns with uh, you know, 35,000 entries each, uh, something like that. So when there's, when there's a lot of data in your data set 
and the dimensions are very large deep learning will uh, be exponentially uh, efficient at uh, working with things than compared to machine learning so if your data is large then a deep learning uh, uh, you know deep learning model will work very efficiently to actually solve it handle it and you know it'll make it easier for you to program and work with it at the same time as well so this is how deep learning uh, is uh, having the upper hand over machine learning in a very simple and a concise way now moving on to the fourth question uh, it states what are some of the most used applications of deep learning again this is a very common question that can be uh, asked uh, in, in your deep learning interviews so uh, at least make sure uh, you know you mention at least three or four uh, fields and uh, in fact i have uh, put up around six fields on the screen right now you know everything from sentiment analysis uh, mostly twitter uh, and all of that then we have computer vision to analyze uh, graphics then we have automatic text generation we have object detection we have nlp uh, natural language processing and image recognition you know there are there are there are more fields you can name uh, you know about 10 to 12 off and if you have worked a little bit on deep learning but then it doesn't make uh, you know it doesn't really add a lot of value if you just uh, list 10 to 12 so rather you know just uh, tell five or six and uh, just explain one or two lines about what uh, each of them mean that way uh, the interviewer has an idea that uh, you know you are concrete uh, with respect to all the concepts there as well now with this we can come to question number five uh, that states what is the meaning of overfitting uh, overfitting and underfitting are actually two very common issues that have to be dealt with whenever you're working with data sets and whenever you're working with deep learning Overfitting, as the name suggests, is a scenario where, you know, you have a deep learning algorithm and your deep learning algorithm is looking very hard into your data and it is trying to hunt for meaning. It is trying to find some meaningful correlations in between the data uh, in the data set. Now, uh, in a way, what happens in overfitting is that it will start uh, vigorously hunting for the data and this makes it pick up. Uh, noise what we call as noise uh, rather than any sort of useful data so with this noise you know it hurts the efficiency it hurts the uh, detection capacity of the model uh, so rather than picking up any useful valid information your model will start picking up noise and that is not a good thing so what happens is at the end of the day uh, you know you'll have a very high variance in your data and a very low bias uh, you know this way of course you would already know that your model will be very very uh, uh, you know inaccurate in terms of detection and very inefficient at uh, detecting new things even if it has a good level of accuracy as well so when you think about it overfitting needs to be fixed and, and underfitting is just the reverse of this anyway coming on to the sixth question it states what are activation functions you know activation functions are very important entities in deep learning because these are the actual functions that will take your input uh, and make sure that you have something usable on it so the transformations that happen right it is all because of the activation function so what an activation function is basically is that uh, it has the capability to decide if a neuron actually needs activation or not in that particular uh, array in that particular set of neurons to see if there has to be anything modeled from that particular neuron in the chain in the neural network or uh, you know if it adds a value to the next set of uh, you know neurons as well so this is actually done by calculating the weighted sum of it and then taking the bias as well so at the end of the day you know whenever you're making use of an activation function the model output will be non-linear and uh, if you have to talk about the types of activation functions as well so there's rectified linear unit or relu for short you have softmax sigmoid linear tan h and many many others as well so it adds value that uh, you answer it in a way where you tell what activation functions are how they are calculated uh, what the output will look like and what are the types of activation functions as well with this we come to the seventh question uh, that states what is fourier transforms uh, that is used in deep learning uh, Fourier transform is very very vital to deep learning because it is one of these packages that is used to manage and work with a lot of data uh, when we work with deep learning as you already know in deep learning we will be working with huge data sets so we need methods and uh, you know tools and techniques where we can process these in real time and we can make sure that we can handle it and work with it easily and quickly as well so Fourier transforms is one of these packages that will make sure that uh, uh, you know you have high efficiency whenever you you're working with data and with uh, with Fourier transforms your model is now open to a lot of uh, uh, signals where you can have the data process from multiple entities and to just make sure that you're opening up uh, a dimension when you're working with the data as well so Fourier transforms are a very very vital part of deep learning
Now with this we can come to question number 8 uh, that states what are the steps involved in training a perceptron in deep learning. Uh, you know there are about uh, 5 to 6 steps whenever we have to talk about uh, the perceptron learning or training a perceptron as it's also called as and uh, these are the 5 steps. Uh, firstly the first step is always to initialize all the thresholds and the weights of the network then of course I will be providing the actual inputs. The outputs are calculated based on a lot of things and we have back propagation you know all the algorithms that run in the back end and after which we'll have the uh, steps where uh, we'll be upgrading the weights in every single step. So after the weights are upgraded uh, then we'll again provide another set of inputs we'll be calculating the weights again and this goes on from the starting initial node all the way till the last uh, node of the output neural network and this is how simple it is to actually train a perceptron in deep learning now with this we can move on to the ninth question that states what is the use of the loss function uh, so, you know, whenever we talk about neural networks and deep learning, we need a methodology, we need a number, we need a numeric where we have the ability to see if the model is working towards its goal or not, right? So the loss function is a measure uh, of accuracy here as well because we're trying to see if the neural network actually learned something useful from the data or not. And uh, a loss function is a negative metric where if the loss function's value is less, then it's good for the model. If the loss function value is high, it means that the model is not performing well. So at all times, it is very vital that you mention uh, that the loss function has to be kept to a minimal extent. Now with this, we can come to the 10th question that states, what are some of the deep learning frameworks or tools that you have used in the past? Now, this is a very common question that's asked in the interviews because, you know, they want to find out, the interviewers want to find out about the experience that you have with all of these tools. So just make sure to mention of all the frameworks, tools and techniques that you might have used in your projects or your certification programs or uh, whatever it is that you have used, uh, you know, the methodologies that you have used to learn. Of course, uh, there are many top deep learning frameworks out there. We have an entire video on that on the channel as well. So make sure to check that out after this video. Uh, you know, among the top deep learning frameworks, we have TensorFlow, we have Keras, we have PyTorch, we have Cafe2, uh, we have CNTK, that's uh, Microsoft's Cognitive Toolkit. Then we have MXNet, uh, you know, we have Theanon, we have many, many others, you know. In fact, you can list about, uh, uh, you know, 12 to 15 very good uh, top deep learning frameworks out there. But then just make sure to mention three or four. Uh, but then if you of course used more than that then do make sure you mention that as well but then make sure that you know you are very honest about it and do not uh, you know I would suggest that you do not uh, state a deep learning framework that you might have not used as uh, you know that might uh, and might lead to uh, you being asked questions on that and you know you not not being able to answer as well so make sure to take care about that now with this we can come to the 11th question that states what is the use of the swish function so the switch function is nothing but an activation function as we discussed a while ago. So it's something called as a self-gated activation function and it is developed by the people at Google. So one thing to note about the switch function is that it is extremely popular because, you know, Google uh, has put up a very good claim that it outperforms all of the other activation functions that exist today in terms of efficiency. So, you know, we, we discussed the different types of activation functions as well, right? Tanich, ReLU and all of these. So then Google came about, they devised an algorithm, uh, the activation function algorithm and they put up saying uh, that this will outperform everything else that already exists. So that is one of the reasons why, uh, you know, this particular activation function has seen so much limelight as well. Autoencoders itself are artificial neural networks and this is something which is very important that you know. And of course, they, they do not have any supervision as they have the ability to automatically try and map inputs and to find out outputs and work with it on their own so uh, you know it's a very interesting concept to work with auto encoders and these are very efficient as well but then you know when we talk about auto encoders it is uh, it is very vital that we talk about two important things one is the encoder uh, and one is the decoder these these two are the very important entities that we have to discuss about uh, an encoder will make sure that the input is taken uh, and it is uh, converted into a format which is understood by the neural network you know, into an internal computation state of course and then we have the decoder which does the exact opposite of this. It will take the computational state uh, data and it will make sure to convert it back into the output. So encoders, even though the name only has encoders, there are two operations is going on. One is the encoder operation and uh, the other one is the decoder operation.
Now with this, we can check out the 13th question uh, that states what are the steps that have to be taken, uh, you know, whenever you make use of a gradient descent algorithm. Uh, you know, there are actually five to six steps that have to be discussed whenever we talk about initializing and making use of the gradient descent algorithm. The first step is always, uh, you know, you have to initialize all the biases and weights for the network as well. And after you have initialized all the biases, you have to send the input data throughout the network, which uh, forms to be, of course, the input layer, the first layer of your neural network. And then we'll actually calculate the loss function, right? So you will have uh, an expected value that uh, you're expecting at that point of time. And uh, there will be a value which is predicted by the model as well. So calculating the difference between this will give you the error of how far away the neural network is from the actual goal. Now, after that, you will actually change all the values in the neurons to make sure or to find ways where you can minimize this loss function, this difference that we just found out in step three. And after which, of course, uh, this entire process is an iterative process. You'll be looping it and doing across multiple iterations to find out what biases, what weights and how best you can do uh, to keep the loss function at its minimum. So these are some of the steps uh, you know, that have to be followed whenever you're working with gradient descent algorithm as well. So with this, we can come to the 14th question uh, that states differentiate between a single layer perceptor and a multi-layer perceptor. Uh, we already discussed that, uh, you know, if we're talking about a perceptor, uh, in case if it's a single layer perceptor, it will not have the ability to classify nonlinear data for us, but then a multi-layer perceptor completely can, uh, you know, classify nonlinear data. And a single layer perceptor is a bit limited in one aspect where, you know, the number of parameters that takes it, that it takes in is uh, very less when you compare to a multi-layer perceptor. And this in uh, big uh, deep learning models can have a very, very, uh, uh, you know, disastrous effect as well into, uh, for efficiency, for effective working and whatnot. So uh, again, for the second point, I think multi-layer uh, perceptor wins. And when you talk about the third difference, uh, you know, of course, a single layer perceptor has many things that it can do well. But if we are talking about efficiency when making use of large data, well, uh, again, a multi-layer perceptor, of course, takes the higher end because it is extremely efficient uh, to work with uh, in the case of large data sets. Now, with this, we can come to the next question that states, uh, you know, what is data normalization in deep learning? So data normalization is a very, very important step. It is actually a pre-processing step where we try to make sure, you know, we can uh, move around the data, rearrange the data, and we can make sure to refit and pack this data into one particular range. This is the entire process of normalization. Why we do this is to make sure that, you know, if your data is in one particular range, it means that your network has the ability to learn very effectively and be very efficient as well. So, uh, you know, when you're performing steps like backpropagation, having a data in a very uh, you know, structured range, a specific range will make sure that your network can learn that much faster as well. So these are one or two reasons why, uh, you know, this pre-processing step that we take called as uh, data normalization is very important. Now with this we can come to the 16th question uh, that states what is forward propagation? So backward propagation is the scenario where you know we work from the output layer to the input layer and here in forward propagation it is the exact reverse. We follow in the order of the neural network so uh, you know we go from the input layers to the hidden layers and then uh, the output layer. So, you know, when you're talking about a complex neural network, there'll be more than one hidden layer. So for every hidden layer, uh, the output of the activation function is actually calculated and, uh, you know, this is done until the next layer can actually be processed. The reason they call it uh, forward propagation, as I just mentioned, is to make sure we work from the input and towards the output. And this is the exact opposite of the backward propagation algorithm as well. So to make sure that we use the output of the activation function and to calculate it for the next layers, uh, you know, forward propagation is very very important. Now with this we can check out the 17th question uh, again coming back to the very main important question you know uh, your interview could start with this question itself uh, you know what is back propagation. So back propagation you know instead of talking about what the first thing you have to always discuss is why back propagation is even important right. So it is to make sure that we keep the loss function or the cost function less and to see how the values changes whenever we you know work with uh, a variety of biases a variety of weights whenever we change all of these uh, even a Light change can have a very big impact on your model. To understand how uh, these work, we require the back propagation. It's called back propagation, of course, because it starts from the output layer, works backwards uh, towards the input layer direction. Uh, so, how is back propagation calculated? Well, it is very easily calculated whenever you work, uh, uh, you know, by understanding the gradient that uh, is calculated at every single hidden layer itself. So, it's as easy and straightforward as that. 
Now with this, we can check out the 18th question that states, what are hyperparameters in deep learning? So when you talk about hyperparameters, hyperparameters, even though the term is very complex, they're nothing but variables that are actually used uh, in deep learning uh, to actually determine the structure of a neural network. Uh, so these variables are put into place to make sure that, you know, we have an easy way of understanding so many different factors and parameters in the deep learning model, you know, be it uh, the number of hidden layers that are present or the learning rate of the model and much more. So uh, hyperparameters are very important variables that will give us a lot of insight into how the model uh, or the neural network is functioning as well. So moving on to the next question, uh, it states, how can hyperparameters be trained in neural networks? So training a hyperparameter is very important and understanding how you can convey this to the interviewer is also very important because these are long procedures and your ability to concisely answer it is very important. So, uh, you know, to train a hyperparameter will require four very important components. It's the batch size, the number of epochs, and there's something called as the momentum, and there's a metric called as the learning rate. So what happens in batch size is that we'll take the input, we'll split it into batches. You know, batch size can be varied depending on however uh, it is required based on the efficiency and a lot of other things. These batches can be cut into further sub batches as well, uh, if that is the requirement. So instead of pushing all the input into a concurrent pipeline, we just make sure to dig it up into batches and then vary it across. Now, when you talk about epoch, an epoch is basically a denotion of how many times the training data is run through the neural networks so where it can train. So the number of epochs is the number of iterations at which, uh, you know, the model, uh, the neural network trains as well. So it's an iterative process. The number will depend on, uh, you know, so many different factors. It uh, doesn't mean that uh, if you have a large number of epochs that your model uh, will be very, very accurate with every single iteration, it will go up to a point And then, of course, your model will work, in fact, in the opposite direction. Now. When you talk about uh, momentum, momentum is actually put into place where we have an idea to check out what happens in the next consecutive steps. You know, whenever data is being uh, moved around in a neural network, it is vital to understand what happens next, right? So, uh, you know, there is no point if your model is very efficient, very inefficient where it's passing around data and not uh, you know, driving any momentum from it. So momentum is this particular track where we make sure uh, we understand what's happening next as well. Now coming to the last component, it's a very important component, it's the learning rate. Learning rate is what we are all after when you work with deep learning because this is used as a very important parameter uh, where we're trying to denote what is the time that's required to actually update all the parameters when your model learns and when your neural network is ready to take in certain inputs and give you meaningful outputs as well. So these, you know, four form to be very, very vital, very important components in the world of deep learning uh, whenever we go on to train hyperparameters. Now with this, we can come to the 20th question that states, what is the meaning of a dropout in deep learning? Now dropout might seem like a very common term, but it is actually a technique in the world of deep learning. Dropouts are a very important technique in fact, because uh, these are used to avoid overfitting. You know, overfitting and underfitting are common problems as we discussed a couple of questions ago. So to avoid overfitting, to make sure that your model doesn't hunt for noise, uh, what we actually do is, uh, you know, we purposefully remove a bit of data which might not be uh, useful for the model to learn as well. So if you have a dropout value to be very low, it will have a minimal effect on learning because you're not removing enough data and your model can still uh, go towards overfitting. But then if you remove a lot of uh, uh, data, then what will happen is the model will not have enough data to learn. So uh, it will underlearn and then cause inefficiency as well. So this value, right, this drop off value should be very, very uh, vital because if you have it too low, it will not have an impact. If you have it too high, then your model will not learn uh, effectively anymore. So understanding this uh, is a key concept. Now, coming on to the 21st question, uh, it states, what are tensors? Uh, you know, tensors, you might have heard of these. These are another name of arrays, guys. So tensors are actually multidimensional arrays that are mostly used in deep learning, where we have to represent data across either one dimension or in fact, multiple dimensions as well. So uh, why can't we just call them arrays and not tensors, right? So tensors have the speciality of a name because they have been very famous. They have been very vital whenever we work with data of higher dimensions. 
So one very big advantage when we talk about tensors is that whenever you make use of it in any of the programming languages, right, the syntax is very readable. It's a very high level syntax. So what that does is it gives us a clear picture of tensors, even though if we do not have, uh, you know, very high amount of training in terms of making use of tensors or its terminology, as soon as we look at the programs, we'll have a keen idea about what tensors are and, you know, what they might be doing uh, in the program as well. So this is one very good advantage when it comes to working with these multi dimensional arrays called as tensors. Now we can move on to the 22nd question that states what is the meaning of model capacity in deep learning? Uh, you know, model capacity is again a very important uh, metric that we have to discuss about because model capacity deals with the capacity of the model to actually take in a variety of mapping functions. So how many mapping functions can your model handle? How many can it concurrently work with as well? You know, one thing we drive out of this metric is that higher the model capacity, it literally means that there is a large amount of information that can be, uh, you know, stored and worked with in the network. If the model capacity is low, as the name suggests, it means it cannot handle uh, an effectively a large amount of information at a time as well. So model capacity is something which is very straightforward, but yet it forms to be a very important concept in deep learning. Now with this, we can come to the 23rd question that states, what is the Boltzmann machine? Uh, you know, Boltzmann machine sounds very complex, but it is actually a type of a neural network, a type of a neural network that we call as an RNN or a recurrent neural network, where, uh, you know, we make use of binary decisions, uh, biases, and uh, to do a lot of uh, functioning and working for us as well. So Boltzmann machines are like, as I mentioned, RNNs, uh, they are hooked together to create something that we call as DBNs or deep belief networks. So these deep belief networks are extremely sophisticated. They have, uh, you know, multiple number of hidden layers and they're put into place because because we have complex problems that require, uh, you know, effective solving. So the entire goal of deep learning, in fact, is that we have extremely complicated problems and we need to find ways to make use of the power of computing to simplify that to a good extent for us. And a Boltzmann machine will do uh, exactly that. Now, after understanding this, uh, we need to check out what are the advantages of making use of one of the top deep learning frameworks out there uh, called TensorFlow. So, uh, you know, of course, this could be a very important question in case if you work with TensorFlow because understanding the advantages of it is very vital. So, uh, TensorFlow has many, many advantages and uh, to me, the most important, uh, uh, you know, advantages where it will give you a lot of flexibility and platform independence whenever, you, whenever you're working with it, you know, uh, the platform independence is very vital because we all have multiple operating systems, multiple platforms that we work on. Uh, and of course, so it has the ability to power through and train on both CPU and your graphical processing unit as well. And with new technologies with uh, GPUs, uh, it just makes it very, very efficient to work with Tensor too and then when we talk about auto differentiation and the features it brings with it is again a huge impact when we talk about threads and its ability to handle asynchronous computation this is where tensorflow wins over many other uh, you know deep learning frameworks as well the the second most important uh, advantage to me is that it's open source it has a beautifully large community so you know you don't have to pay for it uh, but then at the end of the day there are so many things that are being added in terms of features technologies fixes and so much more and this entire community of open source is just a beautiful thing. And I'm sure uh, you can relate to this if you work with TensorFlow as well. So with this, we come to the 25th question that states, what is a computational graph in deep learning? So a computational graph, as the name suggests, is a scenario or is it a graph itself where we try to take inputs, arrange them into meaningful entities called as nodes and later uh, create a graph structure out of it. So these are done to simplify certain mathematical calculations as to visualize them better. So uh, in terms of deep learning and in terms of backend functionality, it helps a lot whenever we're working with parallel processing as it provides a huge performance boost uh, over a single threaded performance in terms of making use of actual computational graphs as uh, you know, your, uh, your processing power is now two, three, four, five or 10 times, 10 folds uh, better than how it was before as well. So computational graphs are very, very important uh, units when it comes to working with deep learning. Now, uh, we can come to the 26th question that states, what are CNNs? CNNs and RNNs are very different types of neural networks. A CNN stands for convolution neural network, while an RNN stands for recurrent neural networks. Now, coming to the talk of CNNs, CNNs are mostly used to perform visual analysis or, uh, you know, working with a lot of images and classification as well. Uh, you can have multiple images of many channels as well. So when we talk about images and channels, mostly we talk about colored images and black and white images, uh, you know, 
colored him images will have like three channels red green and blue rgb structure uh, and, and so much more as well right so a cnn has the ability to easily work with classify and uh, you know give you meaningful outputs on all of these images and visual data now if we talk about a little bit more about uh, CNNs, the next question can be saying what are the various layers uh, you know that are present in a convolutional neural network. So when the talk is of this, uh, understand that there are four important layers in a convolutional neural network. One is the convolution layer, uh, we have the ReLU layer uh, or the activation function layer as it's also called. Then we have the pooling layer and the connectedness layer. So uh, you know when we talk about the convolutional layer, this is where we apply things and entities called as filters across the main data to have them as parameters to teach and train the network. So after the convolution step is done, we'll use the activation function to you know squish it and bring it into a range which is workable and understandable by the neural network after the activation function is done then there's something called as uh, pooling pooling is where again we shrink the data to make sure we are not losing any of the existing data and you know you, what happens after convolution is we lose uh, certain uh, data as well so uh, we do stuffing uh, in the lay in the in the pooling layer as well to make sure that you know we maintain we add uh, certain bits uh, dummy bits to make sure that the image the size of the image is actually maintained after every single iteration so with every iteration the image shrinks a little and with padding we make sure that you know we are not letting it shrink out of context as well and then when we're talking about the fourth important layer of the convolutional neural network it's connectedness here we're just making sure that you know all of the activation functions are applied correctly by making use of the bias and generally checking uh, that the entire neural network is connected thoroughly and it's working as expected as well so as the name suggests this is a very important layer to verify the understanding of the neural network so these are the four uh, you know very very important layers that you have to know about in this particular order itself uh, you know whenever you're mentioning the working of it the questions can be like you know what is the working of a cnn or what are the layers that are present as well so this will double up as both of those questions now when you talk about rnn as i just mentioned uh, you know next question can be what is an rnn in deep learning so rnn as i discussed it stands for recurrent neural networks and unlike uh, uh, you know uh, CNNs these work the working here is very different the use of it is very different because RNNs or recurrent neural networks are very very efficient at working with a lot of string data text textual data genome data handwriting data and much more so if you have already worked with any basic uh, use cases where you're performing let's say handwriting prediction or uh, detection of uh, handwritten letters or whatnot then there's a good chance that you've made use of an RNN uh, you know RNN uses the technique called as backpropagation that we've already discussed for all its training requirements and it is very very effective at doing this as well just like how cnn is very effective for working with images it shows similar girth whenever you're working with uh, textual data as well so this is again a very important aspect in deep learning now with this we can come to the 29th question that says what is a vanishing gradient whenever you make use of recurrent neural networks a vanishing gradient, uh, you know, to be honest, can be considered as a scenario because uh, we already saw in the last answer that uh, RNNs make use of backpropagation, right? So there's back if there is backpropagation, then there's the calculation of the gradients at every single step. And whenever we work with backpropagation, whenever we calculate gradients, they tend to get smaller and smaller as the data works backwards from the output layer to the input layer. So since the value becomes extremely smaller towards the end as we approach the input layer, it causes a problem. So, you know, this basically means that your model will learn very slowly and it cannot be efficient. It will underlearn sometimes and it will cause a lot of problems. So this is a scenario of occurrence uh, where your gradient values are becoming very low. And that scenario is what we call as the vanishing gradient. Now, I hope this is clear. So with this, we can move on to the 30th question, which states what is exploding gradient descent in deep learning? Just like vanishing uh, gradient, uh, exploding gradients are another issue uh, which, which work in a very different way because here is a scenario where, uh, you know, we're clumping up all of the gradients means uh, what it does is it'll create a large number of updates for all of the weights in the model whenever it's training. So your model weights are being updated constantly more than required. And, uh, you know, and we already know the working of gradient descent, right? So it's based on the condition to keep all of these updates small to make sure that your upgrades are controlled and only then can you gradient descent have some meaningful impact uh, on your deep learning model. So with this, we have to understand that whenever you control these updates that happen to the weights of the model, right, this will have a huge impact, in fact, direct impact on the efficiency of the model as well. So this is another scenario, uh, you know, what we call as the exploding gradient descent, where we have large number of updates that happen to the weights, which make it very, very uh, inefficient at the end of the day too. 
Now with this we can move on to the 31st question. So the 31st question states, uh, what is the use of LSTM? Uh, you know, LSTM is again a very important type of uh, recurring neural network that we use to perform, uh, you know, a variety of operations whenever we work with textual data and string data, uh, as I just mentioned a couple of slides ago. So it stands for long short term memory. And the working of it is slightly different because it makes use of something called as feedback chains, uh, where, you know, it gives the network the ability to perform like another, you know, general purpose computing entity as well. So when it comes to that, it is very efficient at working, uh, uh, you know, working with a lot of data, especially when, you, when we're talking about, uh, you know, genome data and genomic sciences. LSTMs are uh, very efficient at working with that as well. So again, just being a type of another RNN, it sort of trickles down to having all of the features and the general working of RNNs too. Now with this, we can come to the 32nd question that states, uh, where are autoencoders used? So we checked out autoencoders before, but then there might be a follow-up question to that stating where, where they are actually used, right? So you have to understand that autoencoders again have a lot of usage in the real world. So whenever we talk about it, uh, you can have about 10 to 15 uses that of course that you might know already, but then it is vital that you at least mention three or four, uh, you know, very popular uh, applications of it as well. Uh, so let's say in the real world, uh, if you have a black and white image and you want to have have it colored out to what it actually was in its real life then adding color uh, to black and white images are very important use cases and if you have any other old images where you have to remove noise autoencoders are used here too and then when you talk about dimensionality reduction and feature removal or feature variation as well uh, you know autoencoders uh, seem to be very popular and uh, in fact more than popular they're popular for a reason that is because they're efficient at handling all of these tasks so make sure you mention all of these real life you know, applications which are very popularly used as well. So with this, we can come to the 33rd question that states, uh, what are the type of autoencoders? So, you know, there's actually four types of autoencoders that you have to mention. One is the deep autoencoders. We have convolutional autoencoders. We have sparse autoencoders. And of course, we have the contractive uh, autoencoders as well. So you really don't have to explain when you're asked for the types, but then it might add value. If you can just uh, state one or two sentences about each, but then it is very important that you mention all the four types uh, that exist for autoencoders as well. So moving on, uh, we come to the 34th question that states, what is a restricted Boltzmann machine or an RBM for short? Uh, you know, an RBM is actually a graph if you have to talk about it in general. It's a graphical based model uh, that we make use of in deep learning today. And it, it does a lot of things and can do a lot of things efficiently as well. So when you have to talk about uh, performing operations such as classifications or let's say regression, uh, you know, dimensionality reduction, beat, collaborative filtering, topic modeling, or all of these uh, operations that need to be performed that require require an algorithm to do it, an RPM uh, can do it very effectively in today's world of deep learning where you know it can make use of the computation power of today and work with it effectively as well. So an RPM is again a very, very important, a very, very, again, uh, I know there's a lot of uh, efficient being used in the case of deep learning, but then of course, an RPM is very tricky to work with at the same time, but then the output that it provides uh, is, is worth the effort. Coming to the 35th question, it states, what are some of the limitations of deep learning? You know, we've been talking about advantages for say, what, 34 questions now. So it is very vital that you know uh, what some of the limitations or the disadvantages are. There are not many disadvantages, but then there are, uh, uh, you know, a few disadvantages as well. The first one is, uh, you know, whenever you, whenever you expect a very good, very accurate output, you need large amounts of data and your network has to have the capability to work with large amounts of data effectively as well. So that is one uh, uh, you know, disadvantage to gathering all the data may, might not be the case in all the factors. And then when we talk about how complex it is to implement, uh, for example, an RPM is pretty complex uh, for a beginner to work with and to get it working efficiently as well. So in, in a couple of cases, not just RBMs, you know, RPMs might be easy to you. Uh, but then there are many concepts where uh, it can be a little convolutional, it can be a little confusing, and it can be a bit complex to work with as well. So that is, uh, you know, one of the disadvantages. And, uh, you know, just like any other deep learning concept, your main focus always will be to make sure that your models are very uh, efficient. So you'll be hunting on keeping that loss function down. You'll be hunting on making sure that your goal parameter is being met and it is being met in a way where, uh, you know, your model is very accurate. It is not overfitting a lot. It is not underfitting a lot and it is performing as it should at its best. So hunting for these can take a lot of time and it is, it is not as simple as it's put out as well. So in case if you have had first-hand experiences working with uh, deep learning, you will know what I mean with this. 
Now, we can come to the 26th question that states what are the varieties of gradient descent that are available or what are the variants of gradient descent? Uh, you know, there are actually three very important uh, distinguishes whenever we talk about uh, gradient descent. One is the uh, SGD or the stochastic gradient descent, then we have the BGD or the batch gradient descent, and then we have the mini batch gradient descent. Uh, and whenever the talk is about, uh, you know, uh, stochastic gradient descent, the first important thing is that we only make use of one training example and we calculate gradients based upon that. We update all the uh, all the parameters based upon this single entity, this single example that we have. But then this is not the case when we talk about batch gradient descent because uh, once we calculate a gradient for batch descent, as the name suggests, uh, we'll take the entire data set and calculate the gradient for all of the entities that are present in that data set. And then, of course, we update all the parameters one after the other in every iteration as well. And mini batch is again very similar to batch gradient descent, but then the batches itself are broken down into digestible pieces or small sized chunks uh, or small sized batches as it's also called uh, and then work with it just like how if it was a stochastic gradient descent where we again take a simple training example and we make sure that we calculate gradient, update all the parameters and perform the same operations uh, for different values across a variety of iteration as well. So these are some of the three important gradient descent, you know, stochastic gradient descent, batch gradient descent, and mini batch gradient descent that you have to mention when you ask this question. So with this, we can check out the next question that states, why is mini batch gradient descent so popular? So why is why is mini batch so popular, right? So this is again a question that's asked a lot. In fact, it's a very frequent question uh, if you talk about the previous question or a follow up to that as well. So uh, one reason why it is popular is of course, because it is very efficient when you directly compare it against stochastic gradient descent. And uh, you know, when we talk about avoiding the concept of local minima, uh, mini batch gradient descent will help because we'll be a approximating all of the gradient values for the entire data set and this is done because we use a concept called as generalization rather than hunting for specific values every single time uh, by by doing this concept where we are flight where we're finding the flat minima and working with it so what this does is this will make sure that we can avoid the local minima we can approximate uh, the gradient for the entire descent by the process of generalization and can be done very easily as well so it packs a punch without having much effort into it so that's one advantage of mini batch gradient descent now with this we can check out the 38th question that states what are deep autoencoders right so we checked out regular autoencoders so what are deep autoencoders uh, you know deep autoencoders are actually an extension of the uh, regular autoencoders that we just checked out before so here the difference lies where you know the first layer is actually responsible for what we call as the first order function of uh, the input and if you have a second layer then the second layer will take care of what we call as second order functions third layer will have a third order function fourth layer will have fourth order functions and so on uh, so it goes on like that so when we talk about a deep auto encoder uh, it is basically a combination of making use of uh, two or more symmetrical D dbns that we discussed right so dbn is a deep belief network so here in an auto encoder we we'll combine uh, two or more of these deep belief networks where let's say uh, you know the first five layers is kind of considered as the shallow layers which will uh, take care of the encoding aspect of it and the uh, last five layers or in fact all of the other layers can handle the decoding part as well you know we checked out that uh, encoding and decoding are two very vital aspects of auto encoders and this is where uh, you know deep auto encoders shine and uh, how they are uh, complementary to the regular auto encoder as well. So with this, we can come to the 39th question that states, why is the leaky ReLU function used in deep learning? So ReLU stands for rectified linear unit. So leaky ReLU is also called as LREL in case if you asked about LREL, uh, make sure to understand that it is the same as leaky ReLU. So, uh, you know, we use leaky ReLU in a concept, let's say, where we have the input values and if they, uh, you know, if the input values are all less than zero, right? So what we try to do is we allow the passage of, uh, you know, small sized negative values to the function uh, where we use it to actually manage the function, work with it, and then, uh, you know, to drive the activation based upon that as well. So whatever neurons require activation, if the values are less than zero, uh, you know, uh, leaky ReLU is very popular there, uh, which will allow the usage of small negative values and drive meaning out of that at the end of the day. 
So after understanding Leaky Relu, it becomes very vital that you check out some of the examples of supervised learning algorithms. So, uh, you know, this is a machine learning question, but then we've seen this has been asked a lot in deep learning interviews as well. So what are some of the examples of supervised learning algorithms in deep learning is the question. You know, you have to understand that there are three main supervised learning algorithms in deep learning. One is uh, ANN's artificial neural networks, then you have CNN and RNN, uh, convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks respectively. So you have to mention uh, the three types or the three main supervised learning algorithms usages uh, in the field of deep learning as well. And these will cover all of the uh, all of the subfields that come under them. You know, CNN has a lot under it as well. RNN has a lot of types as we just checked out in the previous set of questions. But then mentioning these three should be more than sufficient. Now. There can be a follow-up question to the stating, okay, what about unsupervised learning algorithms? Can you state examples of that in deep learning? Well, yes, uh, you know, there are three very main important unsupervised learning algorithms in deep learning. We've checked all of these out. Uh, one is the autoencoders, then we have the Boltzmann machine, and of course, we have something called a self-organizing maps as well. So these three form to be very, very important unsupervised learning algorithms that are, that are uh, you know, that find a lot of usage in the real world uh, when we make use of deep learning and its concept too. Coming to the 42nd question, uh, it states, can we initialize the weights of a network to start from zero? Can the weight be zero? Uh, you know, the answer is very tricky. You, you might be, uh, uh, you know, leaning to say no, but then understand that the answer is yes. It is actually possible to start with zero initialization. Uh, but then, of course, it is not recommended to use because setting it up to zero will make sure that your neurons will be giving the same output and the same descent and the same gradients whenever we go on to make use of back, back propagation. So the learning is almost next to zero or next to nothing here. Uh, what, what this means is that your network cannot learn at all uh, if we start with zero because uh, there is there is no asymmetry, right? So each of the neurons have to be unique uh, from each other and they have to do a unique task that is assigned to them. So if everything is set to zero, then when we work with back propagation, there is no way to tell apart from one neuron to the other. So the learning rate is zero, as I just mentioned, and it really doesn't work. But then yes, it is of course possible where you can have zero initialization uh, done to the weights before working with the network as well. So after understanding this, it becomes very vital that you understand something called as uh, same padding and valid, valid padding in CNN. So you remember CNN is used for image classification as well and padding is done as a part of, uh, you know, working with images. So whenever we perform iterations with every iteration, the images are being shrunken in size to, to make sure that they're not shrunken beyond usage. We, uh, we do padding where we apply, uh, uh, you know, we apply more dimension to the existing matrix, right? So uh, there are two types of it. One is valid padding and we have same padding padding. Uh, valid padding is where, uh, you know, it is used where it is, uh, where there is no requirement for padding actually. So the output matrix will have the dimension uh, uh, n minus f plus one multiplied with n minus f plus one, which happens after the convolutional state. And with case of same padding, uh, you know, padding elements are uh, common padding elements, in fact, are added across all of the output matrix as well. So same padding is a situation where we try to match the dimension of the input matrix as well. But then valid padding might not be matched because it can have its dimension on its own which is calculated by the formula uh, given there as well so same padding will try to match all of the elements after padding to make sure that your output matrix will have the same dimension as the input matrix so that is the basic difference uh, you know that lies between valid padding and same padding now, it is very important that uh, you might be asked this question, so make sure to concentrate on this as well. So what are some of the applications of transfer learning uh, in the case of deep learning? You know, transfer learning is a very popular scenario where we take a large model, we train it with a huge data set, huge data set, yes, of course, and then we make sure to use this model, which has learned on very complex data, large amounts of data to work on simpler data set. So what this does is it, its efficiency is boosted to a very high extent because it has actually trained on complex complex data, but it is now working on simple data. So this way it is very efficient, it is very accurate. And in fact, transfer learning is being uh, implemented in our daily lives very well as well. Uh, but then if you have to talk about the complex use cases of it, we have BERT, we have ResNet, we have GPT-2, we have VGG-16, and many other popular examples of where transfer learning are made use of and how efficient and effective they are as well. But then understand the basic uh, working of it. So you train your model on something very complex, but then you actually show uh, simpler data to it at the end of the day where it can work with it effectively and be more efficient to it as simple as that. Now with this we can check out the 45th question that states uh, how is the transformer architecture uh, better than recurrent neural networks in deep learning? 
so uh, you know whenever we make use of something called as sequential programming there are two important things you have to be concerned with one is how much of processing power you making use of at every single point of time and so what is the difficulty that you are facing whenever you have to work with parallel execution right so sequential processing will raise these two red flags and uh, what this does is this actually gave away these two concerns with the primary reasons why we have something called as a transformer architecture now so in in a transformer architecture we have something called as uh, the attention mechanism the attention mechanism will take all of the dependencies that are available and it will uh, map in between each of the sentences whenever things have to be processed as well so so when we talk about concepts such as nlp right natural language processing here since the data is mostly sequential uh, it will it will it will of course bring up the two concerns as mentioned above but then by making use of these attention mechanism by mapping all of the dependencies by making sure your model can recognize uh, these entities faster and map it across to a dictionary faster let's say uh, then uh, transformer architecture is very effective as you can think about it so with this we can check out the 46th question that says what are the steps that are involved in working with an lstm network long short term networks as we discussed in a couple of uh, questions before so uh, you know whenever you're working with lstm there is three important uh steps that you have to think about the first step is concerned with uh, the network actually picking up all of the information where it has to remember certain things it has to identify what it has to not remember and what it has to uh, process as well so that is the first step where your network has the capability to know what it has to remember and what it has to forget and then when we come to step number 2 step number 2 uh, is where we actually we update all of the self state values uh, but then updating all of these will depend directly on the outputs of the step 1 because depending on what uh, information needs to be remembered and not the cell state values are updated based on that the third step in fact also depends on step number 2 because here what we're trying to do is getting the network to calculate and analyze what is the current state and uh, you know which part of the current state should in fact make it to the output and which should not as well so the most important step is step 3 but then without step 1 and step 2 it is very difficult to directly move on to 3 because uh, you know you will need what is vital and what is not then you have to update the cell state values based on that and lastly you have to make sure your network analyzes and calculates which part of the current state should make it to the output and which part should not as well so these are the three steps that are very vital in the working of an lstm network now we can come to the 47th question that states what are the elements in tensor flow that are programmable so what are the programmable elements whenever you're working with tensor flow uh, as a deep learning framework so the answer is very simple it is very straightforward in tensor flow you know all the users have the ability to uh, program three main elements one are the constants one are variables and one are placeholder entities so these three entities are very important that you state out uh, explicitly because these are uh, the entities that you can program explicitly program manually and work with them uh, you know depending on whatever model it is that you're working with as well So after understanding this uh, you know we have to check out one more small concept called as bagging and boosting in deep learning so the question can be what is the meaning of bagging and what is the meaning of boosting in deep learning so what happens in bagging is that you know we actually take a data set we split the data set and we randomly shuffle around move the data into multiple batches or in fact we call it as bags since the term uh, bagging is used and we use it to train the model as well and then boosting boosting is a different scenario where uh, you know we take incorrect data points and we force a model to actually produce a wrong output we we give it a wrong input we make sure it gives the wrong output so this way the model has the capability to understand that okay this is wrong and then it can retrain itself and increase accuracy as well so this is a negative way of teaching the model but then it works very very well if your model can understand what is wrong that means that it knows it what is right so this way uh, making use of bagging where we're splitting the data set or making use of boosting where we are giving it the wrong input and the wrong output derived from it to teach it better both of these are helping very effectively uh, in the case of working with deep learning as well now with this we can come to the 49th question that states what are gans or generative adversarial networks as well so gans are again very very widely used uh, they are uh, used to achieve this concept called as generative modeling in deep learning what it is is that it is an unsupervised task uh, that uh, 
uh, basically is involved in a lot of pattern detection and pattern hunting uh, in the data. So whenever we have an input data, we try to see if we can find out any patterns in it and you know make sense of it uh, and uh, convert it into a meaningful output. So GANs are very very useful for this. So uh, the generative part of it comes from the generator where it is used to generate more than one example at a time. While we have another entity called as the discriminator. A discriminator will classify the examples which get generated by the generator. So the two entities, generator and discriminator, and it would add some value to your candidature if you actually mention these explicitly to the interviewer as well. So GANs are again uh, they are very widely used because whenever you think about it, everything is pattern detection in today's world, right? So GANs have a lot of implementation and a lot of requirement by us as well. Now with this, we come to the last question that states, have you earned any sort of certification to improve your learning and implementation process? Well, the answer to this is uh, very important because as you as you might already know, a certification program can give you a lot of advantages, uh, you know, structured method of learning, a lot of use cases, real time projects, expert guidance, live classes. And, uh, you know, to you, this is fine. But then to the interviewer, what they are trying to understand from your certification program is uh, uh, with a certification program, you are trying to show that you want to exceed in your career, that you want to build something that you want to advance in your career that is the first important point the second important point is that let's say if you're a fresher if you've learned it all on your own without having to learn it in college or something that shows grit that shows aspiration and if you're a person who's moved from another programming language to come into the field of deep learning as well uh, you know that again shows shows very strong aspiration that you are willing to put uh, some time and effort and that you've already put time effort and money uh, into learning all of these as well and at the end of the day, that adds up to a concept where you're proving yourself to the interviewer that you are effective at what you do and you want to do this. So one very important thing uh, that you have to know whenever you're talking about certification programs, right? So yes, you can list all the certification programs that you have had, but then what will add the most value is to tell the interviewer what you learned and how you used your learning to implement something new. See, because not just certification, any IT concept in the world, right? So we're trying to solve a complex problem using a simpler thing. So we're trying to make the complex problem very simple. So how have you taken a complex problem how have you worked on it and how have you simplified it by making use of your certification program is very important to the interviewer and that is what you should talk about explain what you learned from it explain how you learned and what you took away as well and here is a small bonus for you guys apart from this uh, you know what would add a little more value is to make sure that you mention that uh, you know that you're planning to use your learning in this particular way for that particular company that you're applying for right so you would have learned a lot of things uh, if you put it out in a way where you're telling the interviewer that hey I learned all of these and I think I can use it this way to help your company that will impress the interviewer as well so that is one very important way on how certifications will help you rapidly increase your career's dimensionality basically well with that you have reached the end of this top deep learning interview questions i take this opportunity to wish you all the best for all the interviews ahead so you make sure to use this guide to understand how you can approach the questions effectively and how you can answer them precisely and with as much uh, content and quality as possible if you want to make a career in data science then intellipat has iit madras advanced data science and ai certification program this course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts. Now that we have come to the end of the session, if you are having any queries, please put down in the comment section and we will be happy to answer you. Also, please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for more updates from Intellipad.